Audiobook title. My Sister the Villainous Alternate 02-01-18, by Cupcake Ninja. This work belongs to author, Cupcake Ninja. Source, scribblehub.com. Chapter 1. Damien felt his mother's palm press against his bare chest and was assaulted with a flash of hot desire. He saw it in her eyes, the way they burned with a momentary purple fire. This bitch, she's trying to use her weird sex demon powers on her own son. Damien quickly quashed his smoldering desire to fuck her against the carriage door and slapped her hard. The woman didn't show any sign of pain, she just blinked in apparent astonishment. Damien then backhanded her son. His mother narrowed her eyes. Damien smiled at her. Then, without preamble, delivered an uppercut that sent her flying. Muriel flipped while in the air and landed on her feet without a single sign of anything but annoyance. What the hell are you doing? She demanded. I'm trying to seduce you, damn it. Her words enraged and disturbed him. I'm your son, you sick, twisted fuck. He roared back. She frowned, folding her hands across her chest. So? She asked as if genuinely curious. Okay. No, that was far more disturbing than the last thing. So back the fuck off of me. He ground his teeth. Father might let his cock do his thinking when it comes to you. But it takes more than some psychotic slut batting her lashes to make me hard. Muriel's mouth formed a no her heart blazed with indignation at her son's statement. Slut? She sputtered. I'm the most desired woman in all the thousand worlds. She shouted angrily. I've made emperors of entire realms grovel at my feet with but a glance. Damien snorted, don't confuse me with some pathetic losers who can't recognize spoiled goods when they see her. S spoiled. Muriel felt her self-esteem take a never before seen hit. You dare talk about your own mother that way? I don't have such a crazed bitch of a mother, he replied. If I'm not your mother, why are you against mating with me then? She tilted her head. It should be no problem, right? and she's back to trying to get in his pants. Jesus fuck, she's persistent. You don't stick your dick in crazy. Muriel felt hurt by his words. Denying her as his mother was bad enough, but he was also rejecting her as a woman. She'd even used her charm on him. Why wasn't he affected? All men were hers to do with as she pleased, and yet he was entirely unmoved. No, rather, he was affected but refused to submit. It turned her on even more. She'd been right about him. He'd rather die than let himself be manipulated by her. His words were harsh, but the fact she couldn't control him even when using her succubus bloodline powers on him made her want to touch herself. She told herself to save that for another time. Muriel lost all anger. She laughed cheerfully and smiled at him blindingly. You still need to learn how to control your powers now, son. I will slowly whittle you down into accepting me eventually. But first we should really teach you. Fuck off. He interrupted her. I'm not learning a damn thing from you. Her smile vanished. Damien, you're an incubus. She told him slowly, carefully. Do you have any idea what happens to untrained sex demons in the wild? He rolled his eyes. They probably get made into a whore or something, right? Yeah, big whoop. Ooh, a bunch of women are going to fuck my brains out. He mocked. How scary. A scoff. Please. I'm not worried about getting raped. I just hate that finding a woman who actually loves me is going to be a lot harder now that they can't think beyond my cock. Damien shrugged. I'll figure it out. As for you, he sneered. You can go back to your husband and tell him he can fuck off, too. Muriel stared at him as he opened the carriage door. Vera stood awkwardly by his side as he tried to usher her in, but she felt trapped. Muriel had shifted her gaze to the young girl and made her heart freeze. You care for that one quite a bit, don't you? Damien felt something wrong in the air. What? He frowned. She didn't answer. In the next instant, Muriel disappeared. Damien hadn't even seen or heard her move. He only knew that in one moment Vera was by his side and the next his mother was holding the girl by her hair and had the tip of her forefinger pressed against her throat. If you leave me, she dies. There was no threat in her tone. Only fact. Damien turned quiet. He met her gaze steadily, but there was something eerie about the way he looked at Muriel, with a kind of dead calm that could steal the breath from all those watching. Do it, then. He spoke without a single hint of emotion, not hate, anger, or even coldness. But then you'd better kill me, too. 
He didn't make any threat or promise, he didn't need to, Muriel felt it. He's serious, she thought. For the first time in her life, Muriel truly hesitated upon killing someone. It was not out of mercy, nor because she knew her son loved the girl, nothing so boring. Instead, she hesitated because she could feel in her bones that if she were to take this girl's life, he'd make Muriel suffer. The how was vague and unanswered but that only made it worse. Muriel held her son's eyes for several long moments. In the end, she looked away first. She clicked her tongue. TSK. If I knew it was going to be like this, I'd have killed her off ages ago. Mary could have other kids. She threw the girl at him. Well, I've always been soft on my baby boy. She put on a doting expression. It felt like defeat and stung more than if he'd stabbed her. But this, too, was a thrill. Something new and exciting. You go and enjoy yourself, then. I doubt you'd run into much trouble from simple humans anyway. She laughed. Ah, but do be sure not to get any of them pregnant. Humans aren't capable of handling the birth of a higher species like ours. You see, she lied. Will do. He promised, giving fuck or whether she believed him or not. A bullshitter could spot another bullshitter. Damien moved Vera into the carriage. He spoke to her low and gentle, telling her that she'll be okay. The fear in her eyes still hadn't faded. After that, he looked at Mary. Her, too. Muriel frowned. Hey, Mary is my personal attendant, you know? If she chooses to go back to you, that's fine. But you don't deserve her, so she's mine. Muriel this time was thoroughly enraged. Mary was hers. No one had the right to take the woman away from her. To order her around. Only Muriel was allowed this privilege. The fact the woman was currently out of favor with Muriel was secondary. Before everything, she belonged to the Okinos family, and to Muriel specifically. Mary was her property, her possession. Even if it was her own son, it was infuriating that someone wanted to take what belonged to her. But there was that same look in her son's eyes, a kind of madness. It was akin to Muriel's own, but there was something different about it that, like before, felt terrifying and kept her in check. She calculated that keeping Mary wasn't worth it falling out with her son and promptly sent her to him. He caught her easily and carried her in his arms before setting her next to her daughter. Don't blame me if she attacks you again. Damien didn't bother to answer that. Instead, he took the reins of the skittish horse at the front of the carriage and climbed up the seat. He looked down at his mother, the sower of such wanton destruction. He flexed his left hand where a certain ring, exquisite silver with a cloudy gem as if it contained a storm within, resided. It was some artifact he'd never seen before that he retreated into after her reveal of what his mother had done. So far, he hadn't heard a word from her again. But there was a deep loneliness that emanated from the ring like a shroud over the heart. Damien didn't know when, or if, they would ever come out. He turned away from his mother and rode off. If he ever saw her again in his lifetime, it'd be too soon. 17. Chapter 2. Announcement. What do you mean? She isn't here. Damien frowned. Then where is she? He stood in the main office of Hayden Academy. In front of him, seated behind a desk, was a young woman neatly dressed in a blue shirt. She stared at him dreamily, as if in a daze. It was a sight he'd gotten used to over the last month and a half it had taken to get here. Why so long? Because he did to avoid the main roads. And why did he have to avoid the main roads? Because every time he simply entered the vicinity of a woman, it's like they could smell him. They'd be attracted to him like moths to a flame and surround the carriage curiously, eyes hungry with desire, and it was a hassle to drive them all away. Hence. He was forced to take other routes which delayed his journey. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell, the woman answered hesitantly. Damien saw the blush to her cheeks and realized what game she was playing. Vera and her mother, standing a bit further away, then saw him lean in. A few words were exchanged, some back and forth flirting that ended in a short make-out session between the two. Vera felt a blood vessel pop in her head as the woman took Damien by the collar and refused to let him breathe. Was that really necessary? She asked as he came back with several lipstick marks upon his neck, cheek, and, of course, mouth. That's how information collection works. Vera. Equivalent exchange and all that. He hit her with a piercing stare. Why, 
jealous? Vera's ever impassive face showed no sign of fluster. This again? I keep telling you, young master, she sighed tiredly. You must rid yourself of this delusion that I in any way, shape, or form have romantic feelings for you. Damien's hackles were raised as she made her ludicrous claim. Why do you care who I kiss, then? I don't. His eyes flared. Oh yeah? Yes. Fine. He smiled. And then he walked right back to the woman, continuing where he left off until he had her climbing over the desk, knocking over everything in her way. The way she sat there and hugged his waist with her legs, rocking her sex against him, was like a knife to the heart. Vera's eyes turned red at the sight. She felt her chest tighten and looked away, heading back to the carriage. Damien saw that and broke contact with the woman to follow after her. Wait. Don't go. She pleaded. Fuck off. He replied, not even bothering to turn around, he was done here, he's just like his mother. Vera's tone betrayed her bitterness as she reached the door to their vehicle and threw it open. He only does that to hurt me. Mary took a seat next to her daughter and rubbed her temple. This had gone on for weeks already. The man boy, she supposed, given his actual age, but he certainly didn't look it was angry at her but it's not like she could blame her dig. Spoiler. Collapse. To for refusing him. The consequences for admitting aloud her love for Damien would be cataclysmic. I hate him, Vera's voice cracked. She angrily wiped at her tears. Vera had resolved herself to accept her place and give up on him. To be happy for him when he chose someone else. But this? He was taking every opportunity to make her suffer and she couldn't understand why. No, rather, she could. It was because he was vindictive and cruel. Just like her. Vera was sick of it. She felt the carriage wobble as Damien walked in. He told the driver to take them to the nearest tavern before settling his gaze on Vera. She had her eyes closed so she couldn't see it, but she could feel it. Damien folded his arms, clicking his tongue. Stubborn. Seeing her with those squared shoulders, sitting perfectly poised as if she hadn't a care in the world irritated him because he knew damn well it was a lie. Over the course of their journey here, he'd made repeated attempts at getting her to say yes. To what? Marrying him. Of course. Ever since they'd gotten closer during their short time at Bormister, she'd always been his first choice when it came to a wife. But she refused him each time. So he switched tactics. Oh. He understood quite clearly that his attempts to make her jealous were hurting her. But see, the thing is he isn't trying to make her jealous. She thought it was, but he wanted her to hurt. He wanted her to hurt so bad she couldn't stand it. Wanted her to see him with all these women and lament her constant refusals. For what reason? Well, he certainly isn't a sadist or a very petty bloke, usually. He simply wanted her to explode. To hate him, be angry at him, to the point she slips and admits to loving him. So far, she's enduring too much. It was really pissing him off. Was she a masochist? He didn't like seeing her in pain, but he rationalized he'd be glad to spend the rest of his life making it up to her so he tried not to be too bothered by it. It's okay if she hurts a little now so she can be happy later. In the meantime, she'll suffer the consequences of her stubborn nature. Well, if he meets another good candidate who steals him away later, though, it'd be her loss. Damien won't wait around for any woman forever. Not unless they already bagged him. So far, Vera hasn't. It's a real shame. He was prepared to be the most caring and thoughtful of lovers, in a few years when she was of legal age and hopefully gaining some of her mother's vivacious, soul-stirring curves. Speaking of, Mary felt his eyes move towards her like a physical force. She could feel him roaming up and down her body his gaze like a soft caress against the most sensitive parts of her body, her womanhood moistened in spite of her, their travels together had taken a heavy toll, the young master used her as a guinea pig in his efforts to learn control of his newly awakened powers, the result was that she ached to touch him at every possible moment he used it on her, she fought it, but now her body craved him on its own even when he wasn't directing its full force upon her person. She found herself masturbating every night, yearning for his touch. Images of him suckling her breasts and pounding the entrance to her womb haunted her dreams. Being roughly played with, being held down and recklessly seeded. Such thoughts pervaded her mind each time the young master set his eyes on her. These days, she hated herself for it, and maybe resented him a little for making her this way. 
But if she knew anything about the young master, it was that he didn't mean to do this, it was pure experimentation, perhaps he'd be amused by this development, but that was all. She never believed he'd take advantage of her, and that was his saving grace. Say what you will about him, but the young master was, at heart, not a bad person, at the least, not to people he cared about. Anyone else? Well, she didn't know other than the fact he can be very mischievous. He wasn't like Muriel or Elias, she realized. Elias was always very stalwart, righteous, even, but to a fault. Damien, though, was chaotic and whimsical but not cruel. Perhaps that was part of the attraction, if she was honest. Mary loved Elias, but he had been too shy in his younger age to make a move. For whatever reason, Damien, he was bold and unafraid to pursue what he wants. If it had been him instead of Elias, Mary shook the thought from her head. It was dangerous and made her feel pathetic, most of all, guilty. So, where to now? Mary asked, hiding the fact that her nipples felt so sensitive now that just brushing against her clothes sent jolts of excitement through her. Damien grew gloomy. Well, I'm not traveling all the way to the bloody Martial Empire. I had a letter sent, saying I'll pick her up when she returns. It should only take six months or so. Until then, I'm going to Reykjavik like I planned and settling down. He came quietly, softly. You shouldn't have taken notice of his entrance at all amid the boisterous atmosphere of the inn. And yet, every female in the room was alerted to his presence. They looked at him and felt their womanhood quiver with desire. Damien smelled their arousal. It was a sweet, succulent temptation. He knew he could have any of them or all of them. All he had to do was want it and any of these women would happily agree to being fucked right here and now, in full of display of everyone present. If Mary and Vera weren't here, hell, he probably would have done it. Let it not be said Damien would say no to a good orgy. But alas, it was not to be. Well, he didn't really care. He approached the tavern master stationed behind the bar. One room. Damien was promptly kicked in the shin. He grimaced and let out a grunt. He meant to, Vera told the burly tavern owner. Fine. I wasn't planning on sex tonight, but if you're so keen on giving us privacy so we can make you a new sibling. Damien didn't even get to finish before Vera sent another attack his way but he was prepared and moved his leg before her strike could land. Mary ignored their antics and took the keys from the man. Meanwhile, Damien ordered a hot bath to be prepared for which the two at his side were grateful. They hadn't had a good bath in several days. They washed in nearby rivers, but a warm bath and soap was much preferred. Damien, for his part, simply asked for a pint of their strongest tail and took a seat, ordering a meal for him and his companions for when they finished bathing. He chose an empty table near the center and drank in silence. He didn't interact much with anyone but tried his best to stop his aura of masculinity so that the women would stop trying to eye-fuck him. As he sat, a certain conversation entered his ear. It seems they've already sent forces to the gateway. So it's true? What? It'd be ridiculous to think otherwise after what happened in Claire. A third voice joined in. Have an old friend living there. The outskirts said he saw the monster, black as ink like void given form had these tendrils to it that turned everyone it caught insane. A heavy silence pervaded the group for a moment. They say they're already conscripting people. What? Now? The knights and soldiers were barely deployed. I know. Thing is, the enemies already here won't go away just because the demons attacked. Fuck. The alliance has been around for over a decade already. You'd think they'd have dealt with the Gauls already. Well, it's not just Gaul. The Aeel from the Dry Lands have always tried to worm their way into the other kingdom's territories. We're lucky our kingdom is so far away, or they'd be attacking us too. A lot of opportunities to be had in war. One of them grunted. Everyone will be looking to take advantage. Brigands and highwaymen will be commonplace soon, mark my words. Ha! Huh. The nobles will get to us long before they do. There's plenty of barons out there who'll use this as an excuse to bleed us dry. War funds, they'd say. You won't be able to afford to live. Carpenters will be able to. Coffin making is going to become a booming business in the coming months. I'm sure. I knew I should have become a woodworker. It's going to be my time to shine, then. You? Why? I learned how to work wood from my pa years back. 
The man's friends laughed raucously. The only wood you know how to work is the twig between your legs. Not even that. His pony had three kids. This guy is going on six. No cock control at all. They all guffawed. Jesus. Is the man aiming to start a football team? Damien shook his head up at the crazy bastard who couldn't control his nut. He was halfway through his ill when the food was brought out. Vera and her mother came down from their bath a few minutes later. Hear anything interesting? Vera. Damien shrugged. Just the usual stuff that's been making the rounds lately. Mary's brows knit themselves together ever so slightly. If you weren't Damien, who could watch the woman for hours on end without tiring and was already intimately familiar with all her little micro-expressions, you'd surely miss it. Muriel's most recent escapade has become an even bigger issue than I imagined it would be. I didn't expect Lucius to blame the Asmodians. Mary dipped her voice. A, eh, I expected someone would take the blame. Damien took his pint and brought it to his lips. Those guys are too scared of my mother to even chastise her properly and you already said they don't have the power to beat her anyway on such short notice, if at all but they had to answer to all the foreign powers who had their own people caught up in this shit. He followed suit and also lowered his voice, not wanting the other people in the room to overhear. But to blame the demons? Mary spoke doubtfully. They're an easy target to blame. Yes, but that's why I don't understand the decision to lay it on them. This will spark all-out war on a monumental scale. It shouldn't have been them. Anyone else would have. The other options are worse, at least for Liam specifically. At least this way they can do damage control. Mary was silent for a while. Then, I traveled with Lucius and your father when they were younger. I didn't expect the boy to have grown into someone so, calculating. Damien scoffed. That's what you don't get. People change. They're stubborn bastards about it, but sometimes they're forced to. Lucius, being who he is, had to as well. He's the king. He had to make a choice that was best for his people. I don't blame him. I just resent that they've let someone as dangerous as Mother roam around freely for years without even trying to prepare to lock her down. Mary could say nothing. He was right. There was ample time to find a way to attempt trapping Muriel in the years she had been, for the most part, docile. But Elias loved her and thought he can keep her in check through that but having a loving husband and family wasn't enough to stop a woman like her. She could kill her closest friends and family at the drop of a hat if she was truly pushed that far. Only her children were an exception. Everyone else was secondary. And Lucius. He may have been persuaded by Elias to trust in him. Elias was always the man's weakness. The king had, in his younger days, looked up to Elias and had an almost unshakable faith in his ability to work miracles. But for Muriel, miracles fell short. With Lucius' father off-world, only he and Elias together might have managed to actually find a way to suppress Muriel, and they had not even tried to look. Well, if she had never fucked up so badly and hurt my friend, I'd probably be with her now helping to kill the guy. Damien chuckled, though he is going to be Dolly's father-in-law which also makes him family, so I'd probably have settled with beating him. Maybe at least let a dog fornicate with him a little to teach him a lesson. And there it is. Damien's own brand of madness. Mary could only offer a hollow chuckle at his words. Every member of this family was seemingly either insane or very, very odd. Damien sometimes seemed both. Really, it was even scarier than Muriel's. Anyway, Damien stood and brought his voice to normal levels. I'm going to wash up. Too. He called for a nearby serving girl and asked for another hot bath to be prepared in his room. He then sent Vera a wicked smile. Care to join pedophile? Vera spoke with obvious disgust. He rolled his eyes. Please. I only meant that you could at least come and wash the back of your beloved young master. Vera made a show of looking around. But I don't see young master Jacob anywhere in sight. A look of annoyance flashed across his face. Fine. I prefer your mother anyway. I know, she replied. A touch quieter. Damien ignored her, turning his attention to the woman at his side and offering his hand. Shall we? Mary felt incredibly awkward. She hated how her body screamed at her to accept, but her rational mind knew she couldn't. Shouldn't. Mary cursed his newly awakened bloodline. I think not. The refusal didn't come easily, but come it did. A pity, he sighed. I guess that means I'll be bathing alone. I'll go. 
a new voice abruptly entered the fray in the form of a flaxen-haired beauty from one table over. She rose from her seat eagerly, as did several other women whose voices clamored for his attention. Damien glanced at Vera, who stared up at him soulfully, but in the end, she was silent. He clicked his tongue yet again, as he often did these days, and slid an arm around the first woman's slender waist. Vera sat there, turning away from them. Meanwhile, Damien took the woman and moved across the floor. Along his way he took another, all three disappearing upstairs. 12. Chapter 3 So, how is he? A tall, fair-haired man appeared at his side. He was General Armand, a powerful man with a frightening talent who'd soared through the ranks of the Martial Empire and reached his current status by the young age of 30. As the younger half-brother of Sir Marcus Kane, that was almost as to be expected. He stood at equal height to Rebecca, and as the two came within arms reach their respective auras charged the air with electricity, it was a physical manifestation of their power colliding against one another, fighting for dominance, and they had to restrain themselves lest their rampant energies surge and cause an accident. He's more talented than you. Rebecca's cool, ice-like tone was neither loud nor quiet. Her evaluation, however, caused Armand some surprise. He looked over at where General Morgan's eyes were glued. To the other side of them lay a vast open field a dozen feet below. It was pure chaos down there. This was not an orderly training session. It was a free-for-all as every new recruit, who numbered at least a thousand, all battled against one another without rule. The battle raging before them was messy, bloody. Like real combat, everyone was being pushed, shoved even made a shield of. Everyone was an enemy and only the top 500 would pass on to the next stage of training. Each stage would test some aspect of their physical abilities. This one was a combination of combat skill, endurance and ruthlessness. Before this, they had been put into teams and given several months of training that forced them to build upon their sense of camaraderie. They had to trust in and rely upon each other as they were pushed to their physical and mental limits and each member had to succeed or none of them did. Now, that trust was broken. No teams, no allies. Only those you had to step on to rise above. Some, those who were wiser, kept their teams and worked together even though they didn't have to. Everyone else listened to the words of General Morgan and regarded those closest to them as obstacles. It didn't matter what they decided to do. Only those capable would be able to pass. The means with which they did so was up to them. Whether they clawed their way up on their own or faced this challenge as a team with a backbone of iron. Either way the Empire will gain recruits of quality. Currently, there were a few who stood out from the rest. One was a dark-haired boy with sharp eyes who rallied his cohorts into a tight formation and held their ground against an onslaught of foes. The Martial Empire didn't use wooden blades. Those who fell this day may never rise again. Even so, against this grim reality that had left many in his team fearful, the boy merely grit his teeth and held firm. And as he did so his aura, still just a babe, invaded the hearts of those at his side and hardened their hearts. Soon enough, his team had become what Rebecca and Armand saw now. His is a very unique aura, Armand commented. It's especially suited for war. He had to admit it, the boy is more talented. Armand still carried the scars of his time down in that field, but the boy had only gained a few nicks here and there. It was wildly impressive. He didn't dodge for he knew his allies behind him may have to endure whatever he ran away from. Instead, he defended then countered. Each and every time, it was a sight to behold. What of that other one, the girl? Rebecca turned quiet for a moment. Then, without a word, she pointed. Armand followed it and what he saw was. He frowned. I don't understand. Why aren't they attacking? From the other side of the battlefield, there was a small zone of calm. With a blonde-haired girl at its center. There was a wide circle where none dared enter, it was strange, he'd never seen its like. Rebecca's eyes shone, they're too scared to attack. Armand was baffled. Scared. These recruits come from the finest schools throughout the world. Others from the recommendation of retired soldiers, or hail from families involved with the military for generations. At least some should. There were. They're dead now, Rebecca replied. She let out a sudden grin. She cut them down like cabbages. It didn't matter who they were, as long as they were in her path, 
they died. Even her previous teammates were no different. Interested, he asked. She and the boy came together if I remember right. Which of the two do you think is better? The woman cut him a glance. You can't compare a man to a beast. That, alone, was enough to leave Armin shocked. He focused on the girl once more. She was lithe and beautiful, with a kind of unmatchable grace and style that didn't quite fit her age. Armin grew curious. He let a string of his aura fly towards the girl. He was startled as the girl looked up, fury in her eyes and stared at him. A sting of pain bloomed in his heart as his thread of aura was violently torn apart. He sucked in a cold breath. What the fuck is she? There was no possible way some new recruit should be able to damage his aura, even just the barest thread of it. Even though some may know how to manipulate aura to some extent, there was a qualitative difference that shouldn't be capable of being bridged. His aura had been refined thousands of times, hundreds of thousands. The fact this girl had so easily destroyed it, dread gripped his heart. General Morgan simply smiled. It was not a kind one. Rather, it was predatory and excited. She'll replace you. Five years. That's all you have. Currently, there were six generals within the Empire. Each one of them was powerful beyond words, the best of any land. Armand was, of course, one of the youngest alongside Rebecca, but someone like him who had experienced countless battles and had been known as a genius of the era, was told that he was going to be replaced with someone half his age. He fought the urge to lash out in anger and forced himself to calm down. Bold words. Rebecca didn't bother to reply. Did you know she has a brother? Armand furrowed his brow at the unexpected question. No. Why, does the name Claybrook mean nothing to you? Claybrook. He, tasted the name momentarily confused, then cursed. She's from that family? Rebecca nodded. Now do you know who he is? If it's her brother, it'd be that Damien. He's also exceptional. He spoke hesitantly. From what he knew, that was indeed the case. But it was only compared to outside the Martial Empire. He didn't know much about this Damien, to be honest. But Armand was never one to get involved in affairs outside the Empire anyway. Was there something about the boy he was unaware of? Because looking at the sister, he doubted he could be as outstanding. At the least, he hadn't been invited here like his. The Emperor tried to take him as a disciple a year or so back. Armand swallowed hard. He's the Emperor's disciple? What? When was this? Why didn't he know the Emperor took a disciple? He was on a verge of total mental breakdown at the news. One has to know. The Emperor was ancient. He'd taken two maybe three disciples in all his time on this earth, and without fail, each one went on to shake the heavens, they were entirely incomparable to people like him and Rebecca, not even Marcus, Armin's half-brother, known as the strongest swordsman in the world, would win against the weakest of them. Rebecca shook her head. He refused. If I recall, his exact words were, sounds like too much work, no thanks. Armand opened and closed his mouth several times speechless. Finally, he took a breath. Then, is the boy fucking insane? He hissed, appalled that there was anyone who'd be so utterly stupid. This is the emperor they're talking about. A man who had stood at the apex of the world for centuries. Who in their right mind would, would. He couldn't even finish the thought. It was just inconceivable. Rebecca let out a chuckle. Not many knew about the Emperor's invitation specifically because the boy refused. I only know because I was the one who had sent the letter. I was to pick him up personally once he accepted. Armand felt a headache coming on. Just hearing about this whole thing was wearing on his psyche. Really, who in their right mind would? Again, he couldn't finish the thought. If the sister is this amazing. I can only imagine how much of a freak the brother is. He shook his head in wonder, looking down at the girl. I'm not too sure he'd be much more than she is now. Apparently, he's very lazy. Even your brother has a hard time. My brother? Sir Kane is his mentor. He accepted that bastard, but not. Armand bit his tongue in his rage. Shit. He spat out some blood. What's wrong with that guy? Rebecca shrugged. Those who can catch eye of the Emperor would never be normal. By the way. His sister is quite obsessed with him. Dot okay? Why would I need to know that? He looked at his colleague weirdly, but she didn't seem to notice. In any case, it has nothing to do with us. For now. What do you mean, for now? Her cold, glacial eyes cut through him. Well, 
In a couple of years you may want to seek out his protection, huh? Then he remembered it. How he attained his position here in the first place. Oh, he clicked his tongue. Was she mocking him? As if he'd ever run from a battle. Down below, Dahlia sat patiently. Her focus was not on the pandemonium around her. No. Instead it was on the two looking at them all from above. She zeroed in on the tall man to General Morgan's side. Before, she felt her body being scanned. Every nook, every crevice, seemed to have been spied upon by the man. Only her brother had the right to look at her in such a way. The fact she was exposed to another like this set her heart ablaze. She felt now familiar madness settle deep within her bones made a silent promise to the man. I'm going to gouge out your eyes and replace them with your balls. 12. Chapter 4 Should I make a Discord server for this so you guys can receive updates? Yes. No. Total vote is 20. Cast vote. View results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Should I make a Discord server for this so you guys can receive updates? As Dolly was busy plotting a neutering, Damien found himself on the floor. He opened his eyes and wiped at them, his vision slowly coming into focus and finding Vera standing over him with a look of clear disgust. It seemed that he had fallen from the bed. Or maybe she'd shoved him off. Yeah, probably that. He rose from the floor with a yawn, the sheet slipping down from his waist. He felt a breeze. Looking down, he noticed, belatedly, that he was nude. Vera didn't even seem to care. She simply threw his clothes at him. They were warm. Had she ironed them? Will the harlots be joining us for breakfast? Or are you done with them? Harlots. Damien looked towards the bed and saw the two women from the other day passed out. Usually, there'd be a pleasing glow to the skin of a woman who'd been so finely pleasured as they'd been last night. But while they certainly had expressions of satisfaction, they were actually pale instead. Damien, however, was full of vitality. He clenched his hand feeling a well of power circulating his whole being, his eyes flashed. Damien struck out with a fist and a faint boom could be heard. He was strong. He'd noticed this a long time ago, but the more women he slept with, the more powerful he'd become. Forcing Vera into admitting her feelings for him wasn't the only reason he'd started acting upon his more slutty desires. He must have fucked over three dozen women from Claire to here. To be perfectly honest. He never did gain full control of this. His mother was right. He should have proper training. But he got along well enough that he could reign in his aura of masculinity long enough while out in public that it didn't cause too many problems. Thanks to Mary, he'd learned a lot. Her body reacted to him in the most delicious of way, so sensitive and all but begging to be brought to orgasm. He'd tried various methods on her, and it looked like there were pheromones of sorts that he naturally exuded. It seemed to vary between women but all of them, without fail, became aroused as soon as it hit them. They all talked about how good he smelled, which is why he thought of it as pheromones. Instead of some purely magical compulsion there was no explanation for. Damien, however, could not control these pheromones. Which is why. Hurry up. They're already starting to crowd the place. Damien looked out the window. Sure enough. There was all kinds of young women making their way here. Shit. This is really getting annoying. He muttered. The longer he stayed in an area, the wider these pheromones spread. And, sure enough, they'd attract. The horde. Like a horde of zombies, but all they want to eat is his semen. He's living in a damn smut novel. That's the conclusion he'd come to. What a tome game. This is clearly just straight smut. Probably written by some neckbeard in cell in need of a wash or something. Or a thirty-something year old woman with too many cats. Though, if that was the case, where is his mate? <laughs> Isn't that a staple when it comes to supernatural romances written by lonely middle-aged women? Maybe she hasn't gotten to that part of the series yet. Fuck my life. I'm going to end up as the jaded womanizer character who has to wait seven books before it's my turn to get a serious love interest. As Damien had such irreverent thoughts, Mary popped her head in. Are you quite ready yet? He nodded. Let's hit the road. The words barely left his mouth before the woman teleported them to the carriage outside. He grinned. I love you can do that. I hate that I have to. Mary replied. You've no idea how nauseous it makes me. Is it that bad? He asked as he opened the door for them. Yes. 
I remember when I first learned to do it. The first dozen or so years, I always vomited. Even now, it's giving me a headache. She rubbed her temples with a sigh, closing her eyes and resting her head against the window. Vera kept quiet, remembering all the times she used the ability just to throw all the love letters addressed to Damien into a volcano. Ah, she had a throbbing head almost constantly. Well, she got used to it. Sorry. Would you like me to? I'd rather not have to deal with the urge to mate with you, young master. Mary replied sourly, as if she didn't already deal with that enough as is. His offer was to rub her head for her because his touch could soothe pains in women. He'd learned how to do that much, at least. Took him a good long time, but his experiments on her did make some small progress. However, once that pain was gone she then have to put up with other kinds of aches. Damien sent Vera off to summon the driver. Then, what about that thing you were telling me about last time? Ah, yes, I've heard it's going to be at auction soon at this month's black market somewhere in Valen. That's not too far, we should be able to make it with time to spare. Mary looked out the window. If your mother hadn't restricted our abilities, we'd not have to spend so long on traveling. After Damien took Mary from her, she had restricted much of Mary's and Vera's freedom. That meant their most convenient ability was now limited. They could not only teleport only a hundred feet or two away at most and only a few times before they were locked down. It was her petty way of telling her son that he may have taken Mary, but he couldn't use her as he pleased. Damien didn't really mind. He liked taking the scenic route. Plus, his mother was an idiot. If the woman hadn't clipped Mary's wings, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to spend so much time with her. Should he aim for a mother-daughter sandwich, Baz might feel some type of way about it, but they were already like siblings anyway, and the boy could use a good father. Who better than Damien, his good brother, he'd probably be overjoyed. Damien could imagine it now. Just so you know, even if you use the mask, it will only hide your glamour. Your scent will still persist. Apparently, Damien apart from being naturally handsome, had a glamour that made people want to like him. A kind of magnetic pull. A charm. Yeah, but when has it ever done me good anyway? Most noble brats still hated me. That's entirely due to your personality and treatment of them. Envy also played a part, but if you had been nicer, it wouldn't have gotten so bad. Take your time at Bormister, for example. You played a good boy and everyone loved you, right? He folded his arms. I hated that, though. Sure, I liked having a good reputation and not having to deal with bratty noble kids, but being overly nice just isn't me. You've always been nice in the meanest and the most direct sense, Mary muttered. Tough love, would you call it? Anyway, most people find that kind of thing abrasive. I'm fine with that. He shrugged carelessly. If you aren't willing to play nice, then there won't be a point in even getting the thing. People are naturally inclined to like you, young master, can't you just do it? Remind me of the other options. You get molested. Well, once or twice isn't bad but that's bound to be very annoying. Like now. All right. I can be a good Samaritan. But if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all out. He let out a devilish grin. Be prepared for the coming of Saint Damien. Mary felt an even bigger headache coming on at that. Why did she feel he'd be known as the Demon Saint instead? As they set off, Vera couldn't help but grumble. Another night in the woods. I'm sick of it. The woods were so quiet that night. It was unsettling. Every movement he made echoed seemingly forever. It was dark and a bit warmer than usual but there were no birds chirping. Harris couldn't help but recall his first encounter with that thing, setting foot in the woods. Seeing that figure, how it clawed at itself, and then the murmuring, as if on cue, it came again. All around him from deep in the undergrowth. Over here, come here, so sorry. It came closer and closer. Call him a fool if you will. But Harris merely shut his eyes and tried to hush his whimpers. He should have run, should have moved, done something different, anything maybe piled leaves atop himself in disguise, but he didn't, and then he felt it, something close to his skin at his scalp, something sniffing at him, something that had just gotten done murmuring, he wanted to cry and scream, but there was nothing he could do now besides lay there and hope for the best all lash out in defense, which may make this thing to fight back, he felt a breath of air blow past him as it sniffed more and more. And then there was a warm and wet sensation as whatever this was began to drool on him. 
It was salivating at his scent, then, millimeters from his neck, the murmurings came again. Sorry, so hungry, have to. Harris felt his body freeze, he dared not open his eyes, too afraid of what he'd see. A hot tongue licked at his cheek, Harris knew in his heart that he was dead, but as soon as the thought gripped his heart he felt the creature being pulled back roughly, the crunching of leaves and a disturbing, inhuman wail an indication of its surprise and struggle. So this is the fucker that's been making all that goddamn noise, an ugly son of a bitch, aren't you? Harris' eyes flew open unbidden. He saw the monster first. A disturbing creature with pale skin stretched thin over elongated limbs that couldn't be described as human. Its head was just a deer-shaped skull with razor-sharp teeth and wicked antlers which were gripped firmly by a tall, imposing figure of a man. Harris noticed him second. He was dressed in casual clothing, just a simple shirt and trousers, but he was gigantic. Every part of him corded in muscle. He stood there looking the creature not with fear, but disdain. The fuck are you supposed to be, huh? Shit, who made you a thing? Someone been watching too many Wendigo videos. Damien yawned. Had these things been in the games? The Love Orgy series had been created during the whole Wendigo skinwalker boom, so a few cryptids being incorporated wasn't strange, but he'd never seen one until now. You fucker. All your goddamn murmuring has been driving me crazy. Can't even Wendigo right? If you're going to eat the bastard, just do it without all this whining about being sorry. Now you woke me up and I'm just not in the mood for mercy. Damien was tired, grouchy, and very annoyed at having to hear this thing's incessant murmuring. He looked down at the scared man huddled inside a sleeping bag near the fire. He was an aging, balding man with a portly belly denoting a life of luxury. You okay? He asked, holding the abomination firmly in his grasp. It whined and made ungodly noises. Damien felt his left eye twitch. Look here, you dick, shut the fuck up or I'm going to put a tree branch up your ass. Wendigos, law-wise, don't even have deer heads. They're like giant golems, really. So the fact that the deafs didn't even bother to do any real research when they made these things already irritated him. Now he has to deal these dumb creepy pasta versions. Well, either way, they'd still be mimicking voices and shit. Ah, whatever. He's too tired to care. Look, man, if you don't care then get up and follow me. If there's any more of these bastards out here, I'll just let them eat you. Long as they stay quiet. Otherwise, he raised his voice in vague warning to whatever other creature may be lurking in these dark, dank woods. Damien didn't know whether the scared shitless man even understood him, but he didn't care. He just snapped the creature's neck, chucked its corpse away and walked off back to his camp. For his part, Harris scrambled after the man. 10. Chapter 5. Listen, asshole. I don't give a damn if you're an ancient Wendigo spirit of pure hunger and hate. If you disturb my sleep, you're getting a branch in your ass. Again. Now be a good watchdog. Damien kicked away the giant being of malice like it were a mutt off the street and returned to his tent. Wedge and Julf and the accursed squealed in pain as it was abused. Never in its long, ancient, life had it been treated so. It had always been the one doling out the pain and fear, never the other way around. Can you please not antagonize the insatiably hungry malevolent spirit? Vera grumbled next to him. She was sleeping with her back towards Damien just a foot away atop a comfy, thick bedroll with a warm blanket over her. Damien's eyes blazed over how cute that she looked. He bent over her and kissed her cheek, which caused her hair to stick up. S-H-H. It's okay he cooed. My pretty girl, he whispered and planted another kiss at her shoulder, his right hand roaming down her arms, then legs. Hubby's here. Vera turned round and gave a baleful glare. The hell do you think you're doing? She narrowed her eyes at him. Don't touch me with those filthy lips. Damien was unashamed. What? I'm just comforting my pretty girl. It's annoying. She replied. Why didn't you just buy the extra tent? Damien smiled patiently. Can't be helped. My funds were frozen. What else could I do? I need to save so I can buy that artifact. You're so full of shit, Vera replied. You're doing this on purpose. I am, he admitted easily. You crave my affection, V. Just admit it. The girl turned away again. Keep dreaming. Damien clenched his jaw as a sudden burst of rage overcame him. 
He squashed it like a bug and kept up his attack. I do, you're in all of them, tending to our children and kissing me with passion at every opportunity. At his other side, Mary spoke up. Can you two please not flirt? I have to sleep, too. Damien grinned and looked at the woman lying there, looking like a meal with her thin sleepwear and bodacious curves obvious even under the blanket. Jealous? I can flirt with you, too, if you'd like. Mary stayed silent. He, as her daughter said, did this on purpose. Mary knew that, but even if she didn't quite like it, he was her young master. How could she really speak out against him? If he wanted to sleep with this mother and daughter, he could. Thankfully, he wasn't the type to use his powers and status to force them. Vera, who was too young for his tastes, was of course out of the question. He was saying these words of tease merely to prepare her to accept him in the future. He wouldn't touch her till she came of age and her body matured. Mary? Damien found using his power against her to the extent of sex the games of lesser men. He was too prideful to simply let his sex demon abilities be how he seduced a woman. He'd rather take his time in conquering Mary. She understood that every time his gaze fell upon her figure, his eyes roaring with desire. Yet he could control himself, for the millionth time. Mary sighed in relief at this knowledge. He was, as she thought for yet another million times by now, unlike his mother. Muriel was impatient. What she wanted, she had to have then and now. Damien could wait. Perhaps if Mary withstood his advances long enough, he'd subside. He wasn't one to obsess over a female. It's just, well, if was the key word there. Mary, at this point, didn't quite know what she wanted. His non-stop barrage of sweet nothings these few months did more to weaken her defenses than his powers did. Damien meant every word he said to her when it came to romance. But her heart belonged to Elias, his father. Or at least, it should. But his actions ever since he met Muriel disappointed and hurt her so many times. Damien, at least, was his own man. Not another string wound around his mother's finger. Damien, unlike Elias, wanted her. He also wanted Vera. It was greed, sure, but who wasn't? And if she was honest, it made her feel good. It's just that, like Vera, Mary knew this was a dangerous path. She still loved Elias and was not as lost in Damien's charms as Vera was. But to say she didn't like his affection deep down would be a lie. Go to sleep, young master, was all she said. Damien moved back to his own corner of the tent, chuckling. Mary was slowly wearing down. He could tell. Her body wanted him, and her heart also longed for something real. But there were various obstacles that prevented her from letting herself accept him. The fact Vera loved him and his mother being chief among them. Not to mention that she already loved his father. But that bastard picked his psychotic bitch of a mom over Mary, so Damien believed as long as he persisted she'd eventually come around. He was a man with a large heart. He could love them both. Harims he didn't care much for but a mother-daughter pair like these two, who so deserved being loved, he could spare them for them both. Damien went to sleep without further comment, he did hear some scratching on their tent sometime later, and some patter of inhuman footsteps, but his new guard dog took care of that. Seriously, why Wendigos? Next thing you know he'll find the Jersey Devil and a skinwalker trying to eat them. Well, whatever, he'll add them to his collection if that happens. You're looking for the black market of Valen, Harris tapped his chin. Well, you can't get in without connections. Luckily, fate has placed us together. Harris, a very wealthy and well-known merchant in his own right, had met a series of bad luck. He did a large delivery of goods to be made to the city of Cahoused within the perilous dry lands. He wished to establish a base there and increase his range of influence. However, along the way, he'd met a group of hostile leal bandits. They, each one stronger than five men combined, easily made quick work of his hired guards and robbed him blind. Thankfully, they were an honorable people and allowed him enough rations and a camel to make make it out of the dry, arid landscape. The camel died as soon as he reached the edge of the border between the dry lands and the rest of the continent. From then, he had scrounged for any kind of food he needed. He was given a bow and some arrows, which he had no experience with, but he quickly learned a little about the craft as desperation and instinct took over. 
he was able to survive off berries and some small game. Just barely, he'd walked many miles, his feet blistered, and he had to rely on vague knowledge of herbology to attempt to comfort the pain. He, a man used to privilege, nearly gave up, but he was a true merchant through and through and prevailed with the belief he could weather whatever storm life may throw at him. Last night, that belief firmly crumbled, until his savior swooped in and rebuilt his faith, in himself, obviously. Harris understood that luck is also part of one's ability, and Harris had always been a rather lucky man. The fact that luck held out in his hour of most dire need reaffirmed that Harris, indeed, a man blessed by the heavens. And this other problem his savior had, it doubled Harris' beliefs. Now not only repay his savior right off the bat, but he could also even use this to build a connection to the man. Someone with the raw strength to force even that monstrous creature into submission was worth getting close to. Harris didn't know much about that creature, but it was very strong. He knew this because the man, Damien, had wanted to check its capabilities and the thing had uprooted an entire tree with its raw strength of arm. To subdue something like that. It was truly a godly strength, no other way to describe it. Harris absolutely needed to get in such a person's good graces. Luckily, Harris, as blessed by Lady Luck as he is, had the perfect opportunity to do so. I have connections in Valen. I can easily get you an invitation. Damien grinned and clapped him on the back. Well then, my portly new friend, it seems this is the start of a beautiful relationship. How could Damien not know this guy's intentions? Merchants didn't do a damn thing without profit in mind. Damien didn't dislike that sort of thing. It was half a day later. S sir. Damien heard the voice of their carriage driver call out to him. Yeah? It appears to be, be bandits, sir. Oh? Damien stepped out of the carriage with interest. As expected, the road was blocked by several rough-looking men wearing blood-stained armor and swords. A bit behind them were the remains of another small group. He couldn't see the bodies, but he knew there probably wasn't anyone left alive. He ignored that and smiled jovially at the rogues. Well met, fellow travelers. He spoke friendly. What seems to be the problem? Do you need any help, perhaps? At Damien's words, there were several laughs and not a few jeers at his expense. Even still, his smile didn't diminish in the slightest. There was a bald-headed man in the middle who stood in front of the others. He had his hand resting on the pommel of his sword. The man casually spat on the dirt road. How many of you in that carriage of yours? Damien blinked. Just a few. Why? Everyone out. Now. The man's eyes turned cold. Damien pretended to pause. Sir, there's no need for that, surely? Damien took out a gold piece from his pocket and flicked it to the other party. How about we settle it with that and end this peacefully? The man caught the coin without trouble. I said tell them to get the fuck out. He barked harshly. Damien wasn't at all scared. Very well. And he called to his companions. The two women walked out calmly. But Harris was slightly more anxious. There were a lot of ruffians, after all. As soon as the leading man caught sight of Mary and Vera his eyes instantly burned with lust. Leave your women and the rest of you can go. Damien's smile widened. Ah, I see. So it's going to be like that. Is it? He laughed. All right, I understand. With that, he walked back towards the carriage. Yeah, run along now. The leader taunted. Fuck. These two bitches are exquisite. Hey, boss, can I play with the young one first? Dumbass. Obviously you can't. The boss likes them small and tight. Wait your turn. The kid will still be there tomorrow. Idiots. You don't know what's good. Look at her mother. Shit. I wanna stick my cock between those tits. The bald man didn't care about his men's comments. He was too busy earing Vera. As he imagined her pain tears. His cock turned hard as rocks. He was already salivating at the thought of sticking his member down her throat. Her mouth was so small he'd have to tear out her teeth so it didn't scrape. Meanwhile, Damien, who everyone had already forgotten about as they stared at the two girls, returned with Harris bow. Before anyone had even noticed his presence, he's already notched an arrow and sent it flying. It flew with remarkable precision straight towards the bald man's crotch. A heart-chilling scream echoed throughout the forest. Damien shook his head at the man dropped to his knees in utter agony. Oh, shut up. It's not like I killed you. 
He looked towards the other bandits who were now hurrying towards him with brandished weapons. I am curious how many severed cocks down your throat you can survive, though, Dot. Harris sat in silence. He stared out the window in a daze, traumatized by the event that had taken place before his eyes. His balls shriveled at the memory. Nine, dear gods, nine. And then the others went up the other end. Like, like stuffing a turkey. Harris looked at the man opposite him with hollow eyes. The scene of Damien's gloved hand inserting one severed cock after another into that man's rear end. It was something Harris knew would haunt him till the end of days. You didn't even have the decency to kill him. Even now, the man was being dragged by a rope by the back of their carriage. He didn't move, didn't even utter a single cry or sob. But Harris felt in his heart the man was alive. Harris swallowed. The creature from before, who had hidden in the forest all this time, had come to beg its master for the remains of the other men. It had eaten them whole. Its belly bulged as nearly a dozen men were feasted upon. They had still been alive. Even then, it wanted more one stun. I'm planning to sell that one. So no, fate ass. Haven't you had enough? Shit, you're like a dog. You leak till you burst. Sell him? At the market? Harris was visibly disturbed. My gods, just kill him already. Harris croaked. No man should have had to endure such, such, horror. Damon merely snorted. Tell that to the men and women those bastards had killed, raped, and sold before we got to them. Harris could find no argument for that. Even so, even so, he had never been exposed to such atrocities. What kind of devil was this man, to have even laughed as the man begged for mercy through the bloodied severed cocks of his subordinates? He's insane. Utterly insane. For the first time in his life, Harris didn't care about profits. It didn't matter even if the man turned out to be the emperor of the Martial Empire's very own son. Harris wanted nothing to do with him at all. Once they got to Valen, Harris would give the man what he wants and wipe his hands clean of the maniac. 10. Chapter 6 A couple of days later, Damien stood in the middle of a large building owned by Harris. The chubby new friend eagerly presented him with a silvery card that had no other words but invitation scrawled upon it. Damien accepted it with a grin. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Harris sweated. No need for that. Happy to help. He cleared his throat. I have business to attend to, so sorry if I leave early. With that, he all but ran away. Damien blinked. The hell? Why'd the guy seem so, scared? Damien didn't get it. He then remembered he'd brutally neutered an entire group of men in front of the guy. Huh. I probably should have expected this. Oh well. Damien turned to Mary. Shall we? Let's not dawdle. She replied curtly. She then turned on her heel and led the way. The black market was not far away and they'd already acquired lodgings. All that was left was the market itself. Valen was not a very large city. It was, as was the norm. A city housed behind a rather great wall that encircled the whole area. There were many buildings all cramped together and the hustle and bustle of life was seen at every corner. It was a hot day and you could smell the foul scent of human sweat, piss and shit faintly as they travelled. It was inevitable. Even cities back on Earth stank like a fucking latrine pit. Anyone who had ever been to New York can testify. In any case, it wasn't as bad here. You get used to it, like a cat litter in your house. The black market wasn't very secret but it was invite only. The place they ended up at was a more secluded part of the city guarded by a dozen men dressed in chain mail. They exuded powerful auras. They were night level at the very least. In a world like this, the power system was a bit vague. However, it was also rather simple. Knights were highly trained soldiers, the elites. They were, even the weakest of them, capable of fighting five men on their own. Their strength was great, at least thrice that of regular folk, and had the stamina of a donkey. In short, they were people who went beyond the limitations of man. Damien was similar to them in a way. He had a natural, inborn, strength. Added to that, he had practiced a type of body strengthening magic, more of a technique, really. But he so rarely practiced it, because lazy. And he even more rarely used this magic. His natural strength was usually enough. But he got the sense that may not work against the men guarding this black market. Of course. He wasn't scared in the slightest by their oppressive auras, and the guards, too, 
noticed his strength. Damien had grown much in the past months. His laziest punch was, in itself, a kind of technique learned by him naturally. He blended his inborn strength with the strengthening technique he'd acquired from books to let form a strike capable of even causing a boom in the air. It was a strike capable of taking any normal human and pulverizing their insides. He vaguely felt that he could refine this technique. At the very instant of his attack, his mano exploded forth. That's when the boom echoed out. He could feel something each time it happened, not simply power but an indistinct comprehension. Damon didn't think too much on it. He'd grow at his own pace. It's not like you can force enlightenment. As he passed through the men, they stared at him vigilantly. More than this youth's hidden power, they felt something different. A kind of primordial fear. It made their jaws tighten, but they hardened themselves. Many strange existences had gone to the black market of Valen in their time. They didn't make a fuss. Damien flashed them the invitation and they nodded without further reaction. A quick scan with their aura allowed them to ascertain the invitation's authenticity. It carried the energy pattern of this black market's host. After all, it's rather crowded. Vera commented. There's more people than I expected. We should be careful. We don't know what kind of people with extraordinary identities may be mixed into the crowd. Mary stayed silent. What kind of existence was nobler than the man who stood next to them? Very may have her experiences which Mary passed down to her, but she was still naive. The dragons reigned supreme. Even if there were those who were equally as influential, none had the same noble lineage. Especially not when the dragon involved was Nokinos, who were a myth three or four generations away from a little god. Even if it was the Phoenix Emperor himself, if he knew Damien's identity even he would be forced to show some respect. Such was the prestige of those born of the god of power, Okinos. Not that there would be any here who would recognize the Okinos bloodline. Well, Damien would take care of any trouble. He was a capable man if nothing else. I'll behave as long as everyone else does, was all Damien spoke of the matter. That wasn't always true, but it was true enough. Ah, fuck it. Who cares? I came to rob anyway. He chuckled. His mother froze all his assets. What else could he do? Damien walked confidently through the crowded streets. All around him were cloaked figures peering down at some item or another being sold by the various merchants. This tome was authored by the deposed head of an evil cult, scripted in an ancient runic language. In reality, it was penned by a toddler. It surely holds many untold mysteries both dark and archaic. Another figure was being shown a set of keys. Each of these keys has a 10% chance of opening a lock you find. Once the key has opened something, it won't fit any other lock. Somewhat useless, that, there was one that caught his ear in particular. This feline is an incredibly rare species bred from the Nine Clouds Purple Tiger. It's able to devour all types of poisons and other toxic substances indigestible to man. Damien just so happened to look over and stop dead in his tracks. Kitty stopping so abruptly Vera slammed into him. Damien stared at the small ball of fuzz trapped in the cage held aloft by its cellar. The kitten was a beautiful grey with purple eyes, its hair long and luxurious. Meow. Damien, as of yet, had never run into a cat in this world. He'd run into bigger felines, but no kitties. He fell in love the second he caught sight of the thing. At a breakneck speed, he rushed over. Take my money. Vera nearly felt a vein burst in her head. What happened to? I'm here to rob. She muttered hotly. Meanwhile, the two men who were in the middle of a conversation were left stunned. Pardon? The seller, an ugly man with a scar and milky left eye, asked. I want it. Damien stared fiercely at the caged cutie. Desire rampant in his eyes. Me out Hilda? It looked up at him curiously, pressing its face against the bars of its prison. Damien's heart melted. Vera came up from behind him. How much for the feline? She asked with a tired sigh, reluctantly taking out a bag of gold from the inner pocket of her cloak. Damien had been an impulsive buyer all his life, so, the seller saw an opportunity. One hundred gold. Meanwhile, the man he was just talking to frowned. Hey, that's triple what you. A fist burst out from the seller's robes and sent the man flying. He slammed into the vendors at the other end of the street with a caved in chest, coughing blood. As I was saying the seller offered a toothy grin, 
but the men whose stalls had been destroyed by the previous exchange cut him off, furious. You motherfucking. Several angry men seethed with rage. Get your ass over here, you bastard. Ha! Huh? The seller sneered. The fuck you talking to? You pissant. I'm doing business. Fuck off. His words incited the offended parties even more. You think queer dogs to be kicked whenever you feel like. Is that it? A tall, dark-skinned man walked over while brandishing a mean-looking dagger. Several other vendors who had their stools affected did the same. What? So eager to die? Fine. I'll be happy to oblige. As the men began to fight amongst themselves, Damien grabbed the kitten's cage. I'm going to name you Rex. While the guards of the marketplace rushed to stop the fight that had broken out, Damien and his hand quietly walked away. Huh? The seller's face turned ugly. Hey, you didn't pay for. Shut up. A burly guard clapped him behind the ear, escorting him away. But my wares. I said shut up, and the seller got backhanded. You think you can cause trouble here and get away with it? If you didn't want your things stolen, you shouldn't have made this ruckus. By now there was a swarm of people crowding the street as the vendors involved in the dispute were all taken away by the guard. They all had their wares stolen and the guards gave not one fuck to their minds. If one got involved in fights like this and started causing trouble, they had no one to blame but themselves for their things getting stolen while they were busy fighting. That was awfully fortunate, Mary commented. You didn't have to pay a single silver. Lady Luck was my lover from a past life. Damien joked, of course I'm fortunate, the other two just trolled their eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. A pretty woman with short hair smiled, the woman stood atop a well-lit stage, looking up at several dozen men and women with masked faces, the building they'd entered was great and showed off immense wealth with its marble pillars lined with veins of gold and its high, opulent ceiling from which hung magnificent chandeliers of glass and diamond. They'd been brought to a dark auditorium where they sat down in wait until the woman before them appeared. Her ample curves hugged by a red dress that shone beautifully under the lights of the stage. The Blue Heavens Auction House thanks you for your patience. Without further ado, we will begin. She smiled as a tall cage was wheeled on stage draped in a thin sheet. Our first item today is this. She motioned for the assistants on stage to pull away the sheet. Beneath it was revealed a sight that caused Mary and Vera to furrow their brows ever so slightly in disgust. This elf was captured deep within the Krakoan mountain range, far from its home. As you can see, her deep purple skin and snow-white hair couple with the trademark blue eyes of the high elves are a rarity, a sure sign of her mixed blood, and, of course, a trait that increases her value today. We'll start at 1,000 gold p. Damien's voice echoed loudly in the otherwise quiet room. The fuck? No. To hell with this. I didn't come here to participate in any slave trade. He yelled, his sword at the ready. Listen here, girl. Either you release that woman right now or I'm killing every last one of you degenerate scum. He warned dangerously. All at once, the atmosphere tensed. Vera cursed. Do you really have to do this now? There were guards everywhere, okay? Damien peered down at her. Hey, no one told them to be filthy slave traders, alright? Who cares if they are? Sit down. Vera hissed. This isn't why we came here. Yeah, exactly. He clicked his tongue. I can forgive the selling of illegal substances, but sex slaves? No, they have to die. What about? Mary, a favor. Damien interrupted. I know. She sighed. Don't worry. I'll find it. She then promptly teleported away in search of their sought after item. Though her abilities were restricted, she could at least do this much. Can you go a single day without causing a scene? Vera asked, flabbergasted, as several angry looking guards ran towards them. That depends entirely upon everyone else, he replied. The world is fucked up. Damien is fucked up, too. But their brand of fucked isn't always compatible. 10. Chapter 7 While a small group of guards walked menacingly towards the man waving his sword around, a quiet discussion was happening within the auction house. That man must be insane. How is there someone so crazy as to make such demands and threats here? A man wearing a tiger mask spoke with traces of disdain clear in his voice. He doesn't even bother to wear a hood or anything. A second man, younger than the first, 
spoke up. Maybe in his late teens or early twenties, he wore a hera mask. Does he not care about his identity being discovered? Perhaps it is so. Even if his status is great, others here may not necessarily lose out. Openly offending people here whom you don't know the power of is simply foolhardy. In fact, that's why everyone here either wore a hood or mask. In the case of a dispute, one couldn't easily identify you and cause trouble later. It doesn't appear as if he's wearing a disguise, either. I don't see any signs of makeup or dye. A feminine voice commented. She was seated, so one couldn't tell how tall she was, but her legs were long and milky. She wore a vibrant green Chong Sam with a serpentine figure patterned in gold. Though, it was hard to see in the dimly lit room. She was Hannah, the first daughter of Duke Carstairs. But he looks. She started. Her eyes glowed. Do you know him? The man who had first spoken asked, delectable. She finished. Women. Tiger mask spat. Heron mask took a closer look at the man causing trouble from across the room. He does appear faintly familiar, though. Where have I? He, too, trailed off. Then all of a sudden, it came to him. The moment he caught a flash of those luminous violet eyes piercing through the dark, he remembered. That's the young Lord Damien. He hissed low. What? The others at his side all let out exclamations of disbelief. Surely you jest, the boy is barely in his fifteenth year. How can he look that old? A third man suddenly broke in. It was the second prince of Grey Castle, Lucas Grey Castle, who was currently wearing a puma mask. He had dirty blonde hair and carried a sharp appearance with his deep blue military issued uniform. He didn't wear the various medals he'd acquired throughout his career, short though it was as he didn't wish for people to identify him that way. In truth, it would have been better to not even wear his uniform at all, but at this point he felt naked without it. It was understandable that he didn't trust the words of Heramask. The person they saw now did not look anything like the youth they'd seen in portraits. The more high-ranking nobles and other prominent individuals would often have their appearance updated yearly via portrait. Copies of those portraits would then be distributed among the rest of the noble community so they'd be able to recognize each other easier. This wasn't done for all nobles, not even all the high-ranking ones, but Damien was famous or infamous, really. While not everyone would know him by face, this group of people were the sons and daughters of dukes and kings, and Damien, his own reputation aside, was the son of a very prominent figure. Of course they'd have seen up-to-date portraits of him. No, those eyes are unmistakable. I'm definitely right. Heron Mask was firm. Shit. What is this then? Tiger Mask cursed. A growth spurt? Exactly what's that kid been eating? This isn't good. Heron Mask ignored his companion. That crazy bastard is serious. He'll cause a bloodbath if we don't step in. At that, a heavy silence pervaded the group. It was only Tiger Mask who was from a foreign nation far from the central continent, who scoffed. Please, isn't he just the Clay Brooks problem child? Let the guards handle. You don't know a damn thing. Heron Mask snapped. He was Alec Herondale, the fourth son of Duke Herondale. He felt his chest burn. He wasn't one to raise his voice, but he had to stop this fool from speaking. For once, Micah, stay silent. Lucas' voice was calm and quieter than it had been a moment ago. Hannah, if you'd please, I'm on it. The woman stood and sauntered off. Where's she going? Micah frowned. Lucas watched on as the guards, who had been in the middle of a heated exchange with Damien, finally turned physical. Up to now, they'd attempted to cow the boy into submission by veiled threats alone, but Lucas knew. That wasn't going to work on Damien. To make sure that Violet Devil over there doesn't murder us all. Micah sneered at that, but he said nothing more. Lucas and Alec dismissed his reaction. He didn't know just how unreasonable Damien Claybrook was. Or how powerful. It wasn't often seen. In fact, you'd probably never know it just looking at him because he so rarely actually showed his skills. But Lucas and Alec had witnessed firsthand the terror of a mad genius. This was the boy who'd held his own against three mid-tier knights at but twelve years of age. It was a little-known incident, and it's not as if the boy wasn't wildly outclassed in truth, but neither Lucas nor Alec, even now, would have never been so crazy as to take on three mid-tiers alone and unarmed. The fact Damien did so, 
and even held his own to a remarkable extent, was horrifying to watch. It was because the longer they fought, the stronger he grew. The boy was learning in real time, improving with each exchange. Given his lazy nature and the fact that his natural strength was normally enough to simply overpower his opponents, who were often just spoiled noble brats, it was probably one of the only fights he'd ever actually taken seriously. But that knowledge only added to their feeling of anxiety right now. A monster like that shouldn't be poked. They had no idea how much, if at all, he'd grown in skill since that incident. However, even if he hadn't improved at all, it didn't mean anything. Someone like him who could grow explosively through a single battle was always dangerous. Damien didn't even wait for the men to unsheath their weapons. They came to him trying to intimidate him, saying, Sir, you're going to have to hand that weapon over or be removed from the premises, while staring at him like they dared Damien to act. Well, he obliged. A short exchange in which he described in vivid detail how he'd finger fuck their mothers atop the prone bodies of their fathers, ensued. From there, it all went downhill. Here, V, take care of Rex for me, he carefully handed the kitty who had been sleeping comfortably underneath Damien's coat, to Vera. Then he addressed the men again. What are waiting for? An invitation. Fight me already. The man in the lead snarled a profanity, having been thoroughly enraged by Damien's previous words about their mothers, and put his hand to the hilt of his sword intending to draw blood. But Damien simply placed his hand over the man's own, stopping him. Then, with his other hand, he delivered a straight jab to the guard's face. The man staggered back, hurting but not beaten. Damien smiled, then sent out a kick that blew the man, and those behind him, away. It was dark and crowded, with rows of chairs everywhere that were bolted to the floors. It wasn't ideal for a group of people in a fight. Damien only had to worry about himself. They had to give each other some space and make sure not to accidentally hurt their allies or the people attending the auction. He was sure it was going to be an easy battle and was ready to see just how much stronger he'd gotten over the past few months. Get up. He grinned wildly, putting his sword at the leading guard's neck. I'm not done with you ye sir. Um, sir? Um. Damien looked towards the stage as the pretty auction lady tried to get his attention. Please, calm yourself. She gave a disarming smile. It appears that someone has paid for the elf on your behalf. The hell? This is an auction, he said. The implication was, can you really just sell something to a person without even starting the bid yet? This isn't a convenience store. There's no set price here. People came here to compete for these items. Now a rare, high-value elf was being sold just like that. The lady understood him without needing another word. They paid 15 times the starting bid. It's more than what we were expecting to get, even for an elf like this one. Furthermore, the one who paid was someone the auction house couldn't offend. Obviously, though, she couldn't mention that. Damien looked at her blankly. So, what? She's mine now. He jerked a chin towards the cage on stage holding the captured elf. Inside, the naked beauty was staring up at him, looking mysterious and ethereal. That's right. Sir, so please, calm yourself and let us return to our, his eyes flashed. An instant later, something flew past the auction lady's ear, and then, a lock of hair gently flew down towards the ground, behind the woman, embedded deep onto the stage's wooden floor, was Damien's sword. The whole building was now in an uproar, no one even saw when it happened, but suddenly her words got cut off. This was simply an unconscious move on her part. She, also, had not registered what had happened, but a split second before she saw his eyes brighten, she felt a head-numbing chill. And then, this. Damien stared at her. I said, I don't like filthy slave traders. If he let them go, there'd be more people sold here in the future. Maybe they were not the ones who captured this elf, sure, but they were willing to make a profit selling her. In his mind, that was just as bad. You seem to have misunderstood me. So let me make myself clear. I'm going to burn this fucking place to the ground. Whether you're in it or not when I do so depends entirely upon your answer to my next question. The woman gulped. Meanwhile, fuck, Lucas muttered. I knew he was unreasonable. But this is ridiculous. 10. Chapter 8. As one, he and Alec rose from their seats, 
The man in the tiger mask, Micah, threw them a glance. Where are you going? The auction has barely begun. Did you not just see him bring down all those guards with a single kick? Lucas looked at him like the man was a fool. In fact, he probably is. Alec grunted. Unless those stationed at the market's entrance come here, there's no stopping him. And the guards outside will probably get here too late to even be of help. Lucas nodded in agreement. We're leaving before that maniac makes good on his word. They had no desire to be involved in this at all. It wasn't that they believed they, themselves, were in danger. However, getting mixed into this, with their identities, would be unwise. With wallooning on the horizon. None of them can afford to go into battle with the son of one of the most powerful men on the planet. Marquis Claybrook may only be a noble from a mid-sized kingdom, but his feats in the past were not forgotten. Tiger Mask laughed. You seriously think one bastard is going to take down a Blue Heavens auction house? He caught them by surprise. Look, they're getting up already. Micah jerked a chin towards the guards, but after a moment, he frowned. What's wrong with them? It was true that they were writing themselves, but there was something strange in how they acted. First of all, they were wary. That kick just now had caused all of them to collapse. As mid-tier knights, they were all stronger and more hardy than the average man thrice over. They should not have been thrown to the floor so easily. The man who Damien actually made contact with wasn't even damaged too heavily. Despite his insides feeling as if they'd been rearranged, most of the impact actually went through him and hit his allies behind. An attack like that was a highly advanced move only those high-tier knights who'd studied at the Martial Empire should be able to employ. This man in front of them obviously was no knight. He did not have the distinctive aura of one. And yet, his strength and skill rivaled any they'd seen. No, it was above that. How? They couldn't understand. Perhaps some races and beings who were born with godly strength would be able to do this to them, but they would not necessarily be able to pull off a technique like what this man had employed seemingly effortlessly. They knew, through that one move, that none of them could take him on one-on-one, -on -one. and with a crowded, cramped space like this, they couldn't even fight him in a group effectively. Damien didn't even give them any attention. They were, after all, no threat to him. Not a single one gave him the sense of danger those two knights from the market's entrance had. They were guards. It was their job to stop people from making trouble. He wasn't going to just kill them outright. He'd give them a chance to ponder whether their jobs or their lives were more important, at least. Exactly how many slaves have you sold here before? He asked the auction lady. H, huh? She stammered nervously. I asked. How many slaves have you sold? The auction lady's heart froze. Everything had degraded so fast. It hasn't even been ten minutes since she got here and something like this suddenly happens. That, well, she fell her mouth dry but pressed on weakly. Sir, they, they were mere slaves. How could I possibly remember how many there were? Vera sighed to herself. The dumb woman couldn't just keep her mouth shut. Could she? Damien nodded. That's a good answer. Why would you know or even care? No one gives a damn about slaves. He glanced at the caged woman down below. But you know, no one ever thinks about how easy it is to become slaves themselves. The auction house, which had only a few dozen on-edge clients currently seated, went quiet. Tense. That was a true statement. They supposed. But, well, I don't really expect that kind of thoughtfulness and empathy from people, regardless of era and I'm not so nice as to advocate for the rights of slaves all across the world. He laughed. But when I meet people who think it's fine to just put chains on people and call them their property, well, it makes me want to do the same to them. His eyes turned sharp all at once. The hearts of everyone inside the auction house dropped. Before now, they still felt safe. They thought the situation would be handled easily and cleanly, but there was now a dreadful cold at the pits of their stomachs that made them doubt. Say, everyone, Damien smiled, looking at the nearby men and women who'd now begun to quietly rise from their seats. How would you feel if I made all of you slaves? <laughs> no, not this, either. Where did they put it? Mary was rifling through various wooden boxes at the storage area nestled below the auction house. There were a great many boxes and there were some guards, 
but she dealt with those quite easily and now was simply having trouble finding her target item. It should be closer to the front, where it would be loaded onto a platform and raised to the back of the stage up above, but there were simply too many items that were to be sold today. Why couldn't he have waited until they showed it? I knew we shouldn't have brought him along. It wasn't the first time Damien saw something he didn't like and acted immediately, but usually he could restrain himself a bit until later. Is it because he's on his own now? Damien respected his family's name. He did, like when the Crown Prince Alex and Princess Charlotte had visited the Claybrook estate all those days ago. Show the demeanor of a child of nobility. He'd been sociable and kind back then, taking it upon himself to entertain the two. So why was he so impulsive these days? Rather, impatient, Mary could only surmise that it was because he was no longer living under his parents' roof and no longer respected them. Probably because of that, he didn't feel he had any reason to show restraint and caution at all. He naturally wasn't the kind of person to care about such things, Mary believed. He only did so for the sake of the Claybrook name. He would normally act with his status in mind, but after learning about his mother's cruel nature, and his father's apparent carelessness regarding it, Mary thought that he didn't bother with curbing his impulses anymore. There was no sense of obligation to maintain the family honor. He's going to be getting into so much more trouble from now on. See? That's why Mary did think it would really be best if Muriel allowed him to just marry who he wanted and live his life peacefully. Mary imagined Damien meeting his relatives, or those from the other transcendent races. He'd probably try to murder them within the first five minutes. If her face allowed such a thing, she'd have smiled a bit at the thought. It took another ten minutes of searching before she found something that caught her interest, something made of a soft, silk-like material that was thin to the point you could even see right through it. One may even think it would tear at the slightest touch. What made it special were the thousand hair-like veins running through it that made the thing feel alive. A cicada mask? How rare? She pondered a bit. Should she? Something told her that yes, she should. And hence Mary put it away thinking that perhaps they may find a use for it. It was a top-tier artifact used for disguising one's appearance, after all. This was not, in fact, the mask she actually was searching for. The cicada mask changed one's physical appearance, but the one she wanted, the Hawthorne mask, was one that masked one's innate magical abilities. Specifically, those relating to glamours like the young masters. Truth be told, appearance and glamour were actually closely related, but also distinct from each other. No matter how attractive a man was, there were limits to the effect it would have on others. With a glamour, no matter how ugly one was, they would be inclined to like you. It was a type of magnetism in everything about the person. Their voice, their mannerisms, their eyes. A good-looking appearance did help, but even without that, a person bearing a glamour would appear as if they glowed to other people and they would naturally want to be liked by that person. The young master held both an otherworldly attractiveness and a powerful inborn glamour. As she explained to him before, the only reason he is so disliked among other male nobles whom he interacted with in the past is that he had been quite vile to them. Now that his incubus bloodline had awakened, however, that glamour was accompanied by other traits that made females wet as soon as they came within sniffing distance of him. You'd think that with Hawthorne being in its name, which was a plant often described as smelling very unpleasant and almost akin to a rotting corpse, it would help to mask his sense. But, no, sadly, that wasn't the case. It was actually named after its creator, Ambrosius Hawthorne. Well, no matter. They could work on that particular trait of the young masters in time. But his glamour was the real problem for now, she supposed. It was more powerful now, so every woman would take notice of him as soon as he walked into a room. They wouldn't be able to help it. If they could at least manage that, so many other problems would be taken care of, so long as he didn't linger and let women catch his scent. So, where is the damned Hawthorne mask? It's supposed to be here, but she couldn't find it at all. It was really rather irritating, as Mary was about to kick a nearby crate in a rare show of frustration, something tickled her nose. Fire, pure, utter, chaos. Do you understand now? Alex snapped, running down one of the auction house's long, winding hallways that led towards the secret back exit. 
The flames had spread fast. How many of you people had come to auctions just like this, seeing them sell others like they were just chunks of meat? They could hear his voice in their heads even now. I mean I can forgive those who just mind their own business, I suppose, but don't think I didn't take note of which hands shot up as soon as they heard her price. That cold, demented laugh. That's the last thing they heard before they ran as hard as they could, but not before several heads had already started to roll. So? Micah spat out hatefully. Don't we have our own guards? Why are we running? For fuck's sake, Lucas thought irritably. Do you really want to cause an international incident now? As soon we touch him, we make an enemy of his father. Do you not understand that these black markets are illegal? None of us are supposed to be here. You fucking idiot. Think. Alex snarled at the older man. Everyone concealed their identities for those two reasons. First, no one wanted their identity to be found out if they encountered trouble with others here. Second, it was an illegal market. Sure. It was allowed to be held in these various cities because the black market hosts would pay off the city lords, but anyone discovered going in or out could be caught later and arrested. That's why there were city guards stationed outside the black market's perimeter. Everyone who dared come had to be very careful going out, else whatever they had on them would become the property of either the guards or the city lord himself, Lucas and the rest of them. They were high-ranking nobles and knew of secret exits and entrances not commonly known to others. That's why they chose to run. If they allowed their guards to step in, things would get so much worse. Their guards were all very well-known figures with particular fighting styles and abilities. As soon as they came out, people would be able to figure out who Lucas and the rest of them are. Damien. He didn't look like his most recent portraits and Alec only recognized him due to those distinctive violet eyes, but his father would surely hear of whatever incident he got involved in and in the worst case they may antagonize him. Hell, for all they knew Damien was sent here for the same reason they were. In all, it just wasn't a good idea to confront the boy. No one here wanted their identity exposed. Micah may be a hot-headed idiot, but once Alex snapped at him even he realized the reason for their retreat. Let Damien run wild. They'd use this chaos as a chance to enter the storage room below the stage, get the item they were sent to acquire, and leave through the secret exit their fathers had told them about. Wait, Micah suddenly opened his mouth once more. Where's that cast hairs woman? As one. Both Lucas and Alec let out a curse. Hannah. Meanwhile, the woman in question was currently being forced onto her knees with the rest of those who'd been attending the auction. Well, those that Damien had kept from running away. There were some who he allowed to leave, and those he ordered to stay but didn't listen. Those ones died. Hannah had just gotten back after having spent an ungodly amount of money for an elf slave she didn't want and would not even own herself. Thinking it was a job well done and worth the money, however, she returned to the auction room none the wiser. Imagine her surprise when she found the raging fire quickly spreading throughout the building. One by one, Damien took apart the iron bars to the elf woman's cage and used them to bind the hands of those kneeling. He manipulated the cold metal as easily as one would a ball of dough. It didn't take long until he reached her. His cool, handsome face bore down on her. He forced her chin up and removed her fox mask. And what about you, huh? How do you feel about being made a lowly slave? He asked. Perhaps you'll make a good fuck doll. He mocked. Damien stared at the beauty, finding her faintly familiar but not able to place it. He paused, though. Wait, weren't there only supposed to be thirteen left over from those I killed? Why is there another? Hannah was about to bite back with a venomous remark and summon her guard but she stopped. A sweet, heavenly scent tickled her nose. She breathed it in, her ample chest rising up and down. She felt her womanhood moisten. Damien saw her previously sharp gaze turn soft and limpid. Yes, please. 10. Chapter 9 Mary blinked in surprise as the roof caved in. She'd smelled fire from up above, making her nervous, and then heard the distinctive sound of slaughter. She hadn't thought much of it as she expected this. Instead of worrying, she just focused on her search. What she didn't expect, however, was for the platform used to bring merchandise to the auction's stage to be blown open. There was now a gaping hole from which a stream of light rushed in. Damien's voice could be heard. All right, 
hurry the fuck up, he yelled. Then a host of men, and a couple of women, were thrown down, they were, everyone, restrained by what looked to be, iron bars, wrapped around their bodies so that only their legs were free, meanwhile Damien he asked, you sure? Hannah nodded, her hand toying with one of the buttons of his shirt, her body cosied up to him, I'm sure, she replied easily. Our fathers told us of these exits themselves before they sent us, it's definitely down there. Hannah felt a thrill as Damien graced her with a kiss. Good girl, keep it up. He then pulled away, leaving her feeling empty. Instead, he moved closer to a young green-haired girl and took a small kitten from her arms before climbing down the hole he'd made on the stage. Hannah walked over to the hole and watched as Damien raised his arms. The girl, Vera, jumped down and he caught her like it was nothing. You can let me down now, she spoke sourly. Not on your life, he replied, putting her on his shoulder. The kitten took up his other. The entire exchange caused a fit of burning jealousy in Hannah's heart, but it vanished as his kiss lingered on her lips. He tasted, divine, for the first time in her life. Hannah salivated over a man. How can there be anyone so perfect? He'd always been very hands judging from the portraits she'd seen in the past, but those were still the looks of a youth. Now, however, he had the body of a man. Was he not human? Some races, she'd heard, matured faster. Whatever, it didn't matter. All she cared about what how good it felt leaning against him, how breathing in that thick, masculine scent made her womanhood cry. Hannah would do anything for more to lick and suck at every inch of him. Since the moment he'd stood in front of her, it was all she could think of. It's what made her reveal herself to him. She told him both who she was and of the various secret exits her father had told her of. She did not tell him the exact reason she had come, or with who, but he didn't need to know and he wouldn't suspect anything strange either. She, a rather logical and calculative person by nature, merely told enough to prove her usefulness to him. And then, maybe, maybe he'd keep his word, a fuck doll, he'd said, the thought excited her, it shouldn't, she, the noble daughter of Duke Carstairs, being talked down to with such vulgarity, it was preposterous, and yet, he made her crave more, Damien didn't know what was going through her head, but he could guess from her expression, I suppose I can play with her for a while, he thought, his gaze moved to the right where Vera had hopped off his shoulder, do you see this, V? I'm about to be stolen away. He hid a smile. If she didn't get jealous over random women, perhaps she was over a duke's daughter. As his eyes adjusted to the dark, Damien noticed Mary walking towards them. You find it? She shook her head. It's proving elusive. She turned to the moaning men and women who'd been thrown down. You took prisoners? Slaves. His mouth was set at a hard line. I'm going to give them a taste of their own medicine. Besides, we could use some laborers to work the fields once we settle down. Mary tilted her head a bit at that. Well, he was probably right about that. But look at these people. They all wore extravagant clothes and expensive jewelry. They hadn't worked today in their lives, she'd bet. You think they'd be of use in that area? They'll get used to it. He shrugged, causing Rex, who slept on his shoulder, to mule in discontent. Anyway. Forget it. Should have known I wasn't that lucky. Mary began, if you had waited until it was brought out. I'm very short on patience these days, pet. He teased, patting her head. Mary swatted at his arm. I used to change your diapers and you have the nerve to treat me like this, she grumbled. I'm not Vera. I'll stop if you give me a kiss. He tapped his chin. The woman looked at him balefully. This is abuse of power. I never commanded you to. Now did I? No but you know very well I can't readily beat you for the impertinence, either. I give you permission to at least badmouth me, then. You're asking me to commit sacrilege. As a servant of the Okinos family, it was unthinkable to do something such as that. He raised a brow at that. Vera badmouths me all the time, though. Mary didn't respond. She couldn't argue against it. Also, aren't you quite vicious with father? He remembered she had flayed the man with her tongue not just once or twice. Mary coughed and cleared her throat, refusing to answer that one, two. Maybe acting mean towards their loved ones runs in your family. <laughs> Vera snorted. Please, it's simply that your father is not an Okinos. As for me, 
I, she turns silent, what is her excuse, as for you, what, Damien pressed on with a grin, no comment, you're pouting, how cute, he poked her cheek, it was soft and squishy, begging to be messed with, without warning, Vera bit him, hard, shit, Damien cursed and pulled back, as he did so, he noticed a small streak of blood, Vera licked her lips, her small tongue darting in and out, Mary, for her part, stared at his injured finger, that bright, inviting red, two sets of stomachs began to rumble, Damien stared at them in amazement, are you two vampires or something, Mary had the decency to blush and look away, Vera, however, leaned forward a bit, Damien wagged his finger at her, you want, gulping, the girl swallowed back a rush of saliva and tore her eyes away, why would I, Hannah saw this entire thing and couldn't help her curiosity, is it tasty, a cough broke them from their thoughts, with ah, uh, that's right, Damien recalled, the fire, we should go, saying so, Mary sighed, it's regretful, but we'll have to leave the Hawthorne mask behind, Damien didn't seem to mind over much, I shouldn't be relying on outside help anyway, we're going to keep being bothered this way, though, a, eh? I'll just keep to myself until I can control my abilities, we'll buy a nice plot of land somewhere quiet, that's what we'll have to do, Mary agreed, of course, had you practiced even the slightest bit of patience, fuck patience, I've never claimed to be a virtuous man, he folded her arms, let's just go before these guys get off easy by dying from the smoke, Damien jerked a thumb to the coughing group of scum behind him, and how, pray tell, do you plan to smuggle us all out of here, we're fine, but those prisoners, slaves, of yours will stick out like the only dwarf in a group of elves, Damien chuckled and waved at Hannah, who sashayed over without further prompting, though she, also, coughed a bit on the way, that, dearest Mary, is where she comes in, Damien lightly smacked the woman's plump rear, saying, well go on, lead the way, follow me, Hannah, feeling the smoke getting to her, didn't beat around the bush, it was starting to get very hot, the woman led them further back into the storage room, it was a very large area with several sections connected by a few short halls, gradually the smell of smoke and heat lessened, along the way, Damien noticed Mary and Vera both looking back at the flames that had jumped from the stage to the ground below, by the time they got around to leaving a new fire had spread to the storage area and it almost looked like the two walked just a bit faster, Mary, especially, appeared a touch, disturbed, there was something about her gaze as she glanced over her shoulder at those bright, raging flames that made Damien wonder, after a while, she's still staring, Vera whispered at his side, peering back, Damien caught sight of the elf woman whom he'd freed, she hadn't spoken a word to him at all or even really changed her expression, it wasn't indifferent, like V and Mary's, nor was it cold or arrogant, it was more, enigmatic and calm, it faintly unnerved him, those eyes of hers burned an almost ghostly blue, with her sclera painted an unnatural and otherworldly black, she gave off a very haunting kind of beauty that only added to his unease around her, it wasn't fear, but a sense that something about her was just off somehow, who knows what she's been through, let her be, he told the girl, all of a sudden, Rex raised his head and studied the elf, it then growled low, his fine grey hair rising, before letting forth a hiss, the elf smiled, Damien knit his brows, well that's creepy, he thought, hush, you, he stroked the animal's fur to calm him, it took a moment, but eventually, he laid back down, not, however, before hitting him with a particularly unreadable leer, he thought that mayhaps it denoted caution, they turned their attention back to Hannah's back, which turned a corner, as she scanned the nearby objects in search of something, after a certain amount of time, Damien saw something at her neck flash for just a fraction of a second, Hannah slowed, hoving near an unassuming rack, why did we stop, a few of the prisoners whispered, I'm, window shopping, Hannah answered absently, now, several choked out in disbelief, from one of the lower shelves, she took out a small object that shone with a flash of green before it was spirited away into the woman's purse, Damien wouldn't have normally cared about a bit of thievery, but in that moment he felt the silvery ring at his finger vibrate, shocked, he touched it, 
This was the first time it had ever made any kind of reaction in all the time he'd worn it. He quickly sent his thoughts into it. B, but nothing. The ring, which housed his ghostly lover, was silent. Having retreated into the thing shortly after his mother's torture, B the one-time poltergeist that had haunted a friend's home until he'd literally fucked her back into sanity had never responded to anything up to now. Seeing her finally seemingly react to whatever it was Hannah had put into her bag, he had to speak up. What's that? The woman felt his hot breath at her ear, sending delicious shivers all throughout her body. Fighting the urge to beg the man to fuck her against the rack that very instant, she replied, nothing important. She spoke with a hint of a rasp, clearing her throat. Just a, he brought his lips closer, brushing against the nape of her neck. Dear gods. Her body turned rigid. Vera squinted suspiciously. Their backs were towards the rest of them. But there was something ambiguous about their closeness and positions that she found she didn't like one bit. What are those two? She started, but her mother shushed her. Meanwhile, Damien was busy with his interrogation. Tell me. He ordered softly. Hannah couldn't help it. She caved. It's what our fathers sent us here for. Us? She leaned back with a quiet moan her body melting against him. She struggled one last time, her shapely mouth opening and closing several times in a valiant show of will that was obliterated the moment Damien's hand slid under her garments and cupped her sex. S. Second Prince Greycastle and fourth young master Herondale, she gasped, cheeks flushed. And another, Micah. I did don't know his identity. His fingers toyed with her, slowly, torturously. And what is this thing they wanted you to bring back? He ignored the eyes looking over at them curiously and circled the woman's clitoris with a thumb. I don't know. Hannah cried. Don't lie. He growled. You have to know something. I. She breathed hotly. I really. She broke off, her body shuddering. Say it. Unbeknownst to either of them, Damien's eyes started glowing with a mesmerizing purple light. It's a knee. GG. Hannah forced the words out as her insides convulsed around his fingers. The orgasm coming fast and hard. Her voice echoed out, causing all those nearby to suddenly understand what was happening just a few feet away. Damien didn't care about any of that. An egg? He grimaced slightly. Why would the ring react to something like that? Hannah's legs turned to jelly and she collapsed against him. Her mind blanked momentarily. Then she realized what she'd just let out and hid her face behind her hands. She couldn't bear the humiliation, feeling the awkward looks like hot pokers to the flesh. Even more than that, she couldn't believe she'd just slipped the information her father strictly forbade her from even uttering. How could she have? She'd never been so dot dot so weak before. And yet, Damien poured at her, reaching into her purse and pulling out the prized object. It was a small, crystalline thing that fit comfortably in the palm, smooth, and a touch warm, with a shadowy figure within whose shape he couldn't identify. Hannah didn't even notice the loss. As soon as he held it in his hand, the ring hummed softly and then turned silent once more. This thing is an egg? To what, though? He put it away, intending to ask Mary about it later. He then wiped his wet fingers with a handkerchief and helped Hannah to her feet, saying, the smoke is here again. He prodded. She looked away. I, I can't stand. He chuckled. Of course. And lifted her into his arms. Just like that, with her head buried in his chest to avoid the eyes of the others, she gave him directions until they reached a wall with a sigil inscribed upon it. Reaching up her hand, she pressed. The wall rumbled, then rose to reveal another, even more monolithic room. As soon as the wall opened, a host of cries could be heard. Vera paused. Is that? Yeah. Shit. Damien was looking at a goddamn zoo. Creatures of all kinds, caged and howling, bashing against their prison cells. Sensing the impending danger. The fire isn't far behind. Mary reminded. Don't you feel it getting hotter again? We don't have the time, she warned. Damien didn't listen. He put the woman in his arms down and drew his sword. Hannah. Yes? She answered unhesitatingly. Is the exit close? It is. She was quiet a moment. Are you thinking of? Burning alive is a pretty fucked up way to die. Mary was silent. The hell? Vera spoke with an edge to her voice. What happened to? 
I'm going to burn this fucking place to the ground. Whether you're in it or not when I do so depends entirely upon your answer to my next question question mark. You seemed pretty okay with burnings then. Damien cut a glance to the auction lady, who had a pale face as she heard those words once again, and shrugged. She and the rest of these people are slave traders. Burning them would simply be a way of cleansing their dark, sinful souls. He explained, then revealed the real difference and I like animals way more than most people. Except insects. Fuck those guys. You. The girl shook her head in exasperation, then flinched as she heard the crackle. The fire was getting closer. We don't have time to argue. She grabbed his arm. Come on. She pulled at him urgently. He refused to budge. Take them. He focused back on Hannah. I'll catch up soon. Young master. Vera shouted. Damien didn't even pretend to pay attention. Moving towards the first cage. Some of these beasts are dangerous. Hannah spoke quickly. They could escape the market and hurt someone innocent. Maybe. He struck out, his sword making fast work of the metal bars holding giant bear like creature with a swollen belly. I'm willing to accept the resulting guilt that might bring. But he can't worry about every poor soul that could suffer from his action. He was no bleeding heart. He could only do what he wanted what he felt right. Whether that led to people getting injured or dying, losing someone. Well, he'd just have to nut up and live with it. They could hurt one of us. The woman pressed, backing up as the massive bear thing ran past her and his newfound slave towards the back. A quick meal over survival? Doubt it. He was already on the third cage. Now go. Hannah cursed and moved swiftly, no longer bothering to try and persuade him. Young master, the fire. Mary's voice tightened. You two can get out at any time. Don't wait up for me. The fifth cage. A wolf this time. Black with patches of white. There's dozens of cells. Vera protested sharply. So let me concentrate. He shot back. Mary watched the distant flames encroach ever closer upon them. Her chest tightened painfully. She stood there, motionless. Then, without a word, she vanished. Damien nodded in approval only frowning when he saw Vera still at his side. You go, too, he said curtly. The tenth cage, twelfth. I'm really gonna cut it close, aren't I? Ah well, a bit of burnt skin isn't anything to fuss over. It'll heal, probably. By the time Damien was on the twenty-first cell, nearly halfway down and approaching the secret exit, he heard arguing. You bitch, where the fuck were you? An angry male voice growled. Looking over, he saw three men all wearing masks, surrounding Hannah. One of them, a tall fellow in a tiger mask, was shouting, Did you let these goddamn beasts out? He demanded, Are you out of your ever-loving mind? He shook his head. Women. He spat. So sympathetic. He sounded absolutely disgusted. Doesn't matter, a man wearing a puma mask interrupted. You've got the egg? It's in my bag, but... Good. Puma mask cut her off. Let's get out of here. He marched over and dragged her. Wait, I. She resisted. Her eyes searching until they found Damien coming down the hall. F. She raised her voice at him, reaching out as the other men walked towards an empty cell nearby. As one, the men looked over. Son of a bitch. Why is this bastard here? A younger sounded man in a heron mask exclaimed. Lucas peered down suspiciously at Hannah. He'd of course heard the woman's cry a moment earlier. Did she bring him? He pondered. Why? Meanwhile Damien gave that same disarming smile that they'd seen upon him back at the auction room. But while his face showed kindness, his words were anything but. You'd best put some respect on that sentence, kid. As the air between them grew tense, Vera broke in with a. Young master, please. Damien snapped out of his annoyance with the heron masked brat and turned his attention back to the cages as the flame behind them continued to grow. The howls from the animals had become almost deafening. His gaze lingered on the opposite group. Hannah struggled against Puma Mask's grip, her eyes begging pitifully as she looked at Damien. He debated. On one hand, she was a good piece to use against Vera and make her jealous. On the other, he knew these people had to be her companions, the second Prince Greycastle and fourth young master Herondale whom she spoke of a while ago. They wouldn't hurt her. Also, though she obviously didn't seem to want to go with them he knew it was just because she wanted to stay with Damien and keep receiving his touch. But it's not like he actually cared about her. So yeah, 
he resumed freeing the animals. Ah, whatever, just get your asses out of here. I'm busy, and turned his head away. Hannah felt something in her break at that. Lord, she called out softly, almost desperate. It was as if he hadn't even heard her. Lord, her voice cracked. Nothing. Damien, her companion stared at her with confusion. What's wrong with her? Micah was the first to ask. I, I'm not sure. Lucas shook his head. Did that devil do something? A wave of heat pelted his face. Forget it, he barked out commandingly. We'll figure it out later. We have to leave, and continued to pull her towards the exit. No, Hannah snarled, the words sounding like it had been ripped from her throat. Let me go. I need him. The woman turned and clawed at Luca's face, leaving several trails of blood that stung painfully. Fuck, he roared angrily. Alec glared hatefully at Damien. That bastard. He snapped. This isn't like her. He did something to her. He had to of the young man hissed, mirroring Luca's previous thoughts. Micah tore off his mask. Screw this, he said, grabbing Hannah's chin and forcing her to look up at him. Sleep. The woman froze for an instant, then nearly fell to the ground, unconscious, had Lucas not caught her. Though after what she'd done, he almost didn't want to. You shouldn't have he began. Don't speak of what I should or shouldn't do. Grey Castle. Micah simmered quietly, his eyes suddenly bleeding. He returned the mask to his face. It was the only one amongst them which had no holes to see through. Now let's go. Without further commentary, they were gone. Damien was on the thirtieth cell. At his shoulder, Rex saw the approaching fire and meowed, hopping down and making his escape. He didn't notice. Only nineteen left. Young master. Vera the only one to remain with him through the sweltering heat, cried out desperately in a way that was entirely outside her usual character, I said go, he snapped, the pommel of his sword biting into his flesh it was so hot, he moved to the next cell, a red-coated doe with tiny golden horns and its small fawn thrashed violently against the searing metal bars even though it burned mean-looking marks onto their hide, we can't stay here, he knew that, but, they bleated at his appearance, staring into his soul with wide, fearful eyes, the sweat on his brow started to boil and evaporate, all right, he thought, these two, fuck me, I can at least save just these two m, Vera grabbed his arm, and they were gone, 10, chapter 10, or, it came like a punch to the gut, the realization of what had been done, the searing heat, the stink of burning flesh, all gone. He dropped his sword and rounded on Vera. The girl flinched, expecting the worst, but the words of anger never came. Instead, he just stood there looking down at her with a face she couldn't read. Thank you, was all he said. His hands hurt, the stinging pain of freshly melted skin. He turned towards the sky and caught sight of a black pillar. Without a word, he followed it. The silence was deafening as the two walked. It was worse than anything. Worse than if he'd yelled at or hit her. That, at least, she would understand. Could endure. Finally, she couldn't take it anymore. You aren't angry? Her voice was a tiny, strained whisper. He replied without any emotion in particular. If anything, he sounded too calm. You did it for my sake. I don't have a reason to be angry with you, for saving me, at least. And then his tone changed turning cold and hard, but don't ever do that again, she winced, I had to, you were going to, I'm not fucking talking about that, all of a sudden his voice cracked like a whip, I mean staying with me, risking yourself, there was such maddened fury in his tone that Vera, in spite of herself, felt like she'd been struck, her hands and scalp turned numb, scared of his spontaneous outburst, the next time I tell you to go, he continued, the force behind him not abating in the slightest. You go. He stopped just then, locking onto her with those same familiar violet eyes she's always admired. Right now, they were bathed in red. What? Did you think I'd appreciate your little show of loyalty? That I'd be grateful? No. Don't think for a second I'd ever be fine with you suffering for my sake. She didn't know where she found the strength to speak back to him. But she did. Even if the words came out like a pitiful cry, I wasn't going to just leave you. Her voice was heartbreakingly soft. I can't. He had no sympathy at all for that. Learn how. He replied with a chilling intensity that turned her mute. With that said, he continued forward. 
He clenched his jaw painfully the entire way. There was a kind of resentment in him at that moment that he didn't know what to do with. She should have run away the moment the heat hit their faces. Vera. But she didn't. Because she loves him. For the first time, that knowledge only pissed him off. It was his choice to remain behind and he accepted the consequence of that decision without regret. He knew there would be pain. Maybe a lot. But he was okay with that. What he isn't okay with is Vera being in pain along with him. Never should a person have to suffer for love. At least, not like this. Heartache was inevitable, but physical pain? No. That was too much. Damien is willing to suffer for the things he believes in. His ideals are his own. No one has to understand or support them, but he does. He has to. What he isn't willing to do, however, is allow a person who loves him to suffer along with him. But that, too, would be their choice, right? Yes. So? He didn't care. He didn't like what he didn't like. That included the stupid, self-sacrificing bullshit people did for those they loved. Maybe others would be okay with it, but not him. In fact, he considered anyone who is okay with that kind of nonsense to be scum of the highest order. Claiming to love someone, but being fine when that person is out there recklessly getting hurt for your sake. That, to Damien, isn't love, it's selfishness. By the time they reached the burning building, there were guards everywhere. A few mages, in distinctive white and blue robes, were using magic to pour water over the flames. Meanwhile, the guards had already found Damien's slaves and were working to get them out of the bars wrapped around them. Shit. He cussed. The elf woman was nowhere to be seen. But to Vera, all those didn't matter. She followed him almost listlessly. His words playing over and over in her head. Learn how. They weren't fair. Not fair at all. He can't ask me to do that. He can't. What was she supposed to do? Let him burn? When she could prevent it. It was cruel, telling her to run away by herself. R. Rex. Damien suddenly exclaimed happily. As expected, the grey-coated kitten he'd recently stolen ran through the crowd of people surrounding the building and swiftly made its way towards Damien. Roar. It licked its pink nose and stared up at him, rubbing its head on his leg with a purr. Come here, you. He smiled and picked it up gently, tickling the underside of his chin lovingly. At least you had the sense to run away. Huh. Unlike certain other people. Damien glanced briefly at Vera. I won't apologize for not leaving you. She coolly stated, having recovered from her previous bout of weakness. At least on the surface. Oh. I'm not asking for one. I'm just saying you're a fool staying. The other half of that sentence went unsaid, but not unnoticed. I'm an elite maid of the Okinos family. It's my job to be at your side at all times. Vera spoke with not a single inflection, as was usual with her. Damien didn't deign to comment further. No one's worth risking your life over. He thought moodily. He found himself offering a self-deprecating smirk at that. Shit. Here I am angry at her for something I'd do myself for less. Damien didn't have to get involved in the elf slave's affairs, for example. Wasn't that also a risk to his life? Perhaps. And that woman is nothing to him. Even so, he'd interfered. Vera did what she did for love. It was a far better reason than he ever had for the things he'd done in the past. Well, humans are hypocritical by nature anyway. He still wouldn't allow her to make such stupid choices in the future. If it were anyone else, he wouldn't give a damn. But he cared about Vera so he wouldn't condone her risking herself for anyone. Especially not him. He isn't worth that much. It's about time you two showed up, a familiar voice sounded out. Mary. She walked with a hood over her head, but the brown cloak did nothing to hide her heart-stopping figure. The woman attracted the gaze of every man present without even trying. I'm starting to wonder whether she has some succubus in her, too, Damien thought wryly. The woman was simply too seductive not to be. We should leave quickly, she lowered her voice as she closed the distance. They've already started describing your appearance. Come nightfall, they'll have a drawing of you posted on every corner of Valen. Who cares? Damien shrugged. I was planning to disguise myself anyway. Mary let out a frustrated sigh. Then why didn't you do so before we came here? A cheek twitched. You just set fire to a branch of the Blue Heavens auction house and lost the many valuable items. There's no way they won't figure out your identity, even if you do look much older than how you did a year ago. And? 
He blinked innocently, causing Mary to be taken aback, and she repeated mindlessly, you can't seriously be so cavalier. This is going to be a very big headache for my father. He cut off. Yes, I know. I don't care. I wasn't planning to remain a Claybrook anyhow. Why do you think I came here like this? If it causes those two even the slightest bit more trouble, it's worth it. Damien is a man whom the words magnanimous and patty can be used for and both be equally true. It really just depended on the day sometimes. Whatever happened to that elf woman? He asked. I didn't see her nearby. No one else seems to have reported seeing her, either, Mary informed. She's stark naked and busty. How the hell can no one notice her? He shook his head in wonder. Ah, forget it. She's probably fine if she hasn't been caught yet. He can't be expected to take care of everyone. Had he the time, maybe he'd go look for her to make sure his work didn't go to waste. But something about that elf. She's strange. Very strange. Somehow, he thought she was okay on her own. Here, you guys ready the carriage. Meet me at the east gate. He once more handed Rex to Vera and started walking off. Where are you going now? Mary called out. He jerked a thumb towards the ongoing questioning performed by the guards. If I can't put those scum to good work, I can at least send them to hell where they belong. There are dozens of armed guards. Are you Mary stopped herself as she finally took note of his burned hands and charred clothing. A flash of white hot guilt gnawed at her. Memories of his childhood came flooding in. It wouldn't be a stretch to say she, Mary, was the one who actually raised him into the man he is today. His own mother certainly lacked the patience to care for a child. And yet as soon as she caught sight of those flames, she'd abandoned him. Not just him, but Vera, her own daughter, as well. What? insane? He finished with a wild grin. Of course I am. Don't you know? It's my most charming quality. With that, he tore off his tunic, which was in burnt tatters anyway, and proceeded towards the guards. Mary moved to him almost unconsciously. She felt a need to apologize, to stop him from such recklessness, but Vera held her back. No matter what we say, it'll never get through to him. Mary didn't know why but somehow she felt the truth of that statement quite sad. 12. Chapter 11 Damien's fingers curled around the heart of an older gentleman with balding hair. The crowd around him abruptly turned quietly horrified. One down, twelve to go. The knights were quick to react. From the moment he'd killed the first bastard, one of the knights had already slashed at his neck. He silently gauged the other's strength. Mid-tier, three stars. A hardened veteran. Damien raised his sword deflecting the man's blade, he didn't even need to turn his head, he caught the man's movements in his peripheral vision and simply moved accordingly. Slower than I expected, he thought, he'd long grown accustomed to those physically more capable than him, he almost exclusively trained against people so far above him, like his father and Killian, that he'd been forced to become decent even if he was a lazy cunt most of the time, even so, he damn near got his head lopped off. The impact just from redirecting that sword nearly drove his weapon out of his hands. The group he faced in the auction house were one star or two stars at most. Adequate, but not enough to take him on. A group of three stars, though. They were going to be a bit tougher, but that didn't stop him. He dropped the heart of his first victim and rolled away from a second knight's attack to his right. Now in a kneeling position. He reached down and pulled out two small blades strapped to his leg and let them fly. They cut through the air like grey flashes of lightning and stabbed into the heads of another pair of would-be slavers. The whole thing, from start to finish, only took two breaths of time. But by its end the crowd erupted into a panic. Men and women jostled against one another in their bid to run away from the chaotic scene. Including his targets. And just where the fuck do you think you're going? Damien felt the hairs on the back of his neck rise and an instant later three more knights joined the fray, their oncoming swords bearing down on him in perfect unison. His heart pounded like a drum in his chest, his eyes glowing a ghastly violet. He felt a trickle of power thrashing about inside him. It grew quickly. An explosion of pure vitality. He gathered it all into his right hand and punched out. It was a way in which she hadn't seen it being used before, but Mary recognized its essence. 
The power of lust. Sex demons were a unique race, feeding on the hot, sexual emotions of living beings and turning that into their source of strength. They dominated using the base desires of others. Right now, Damien naturally employed his bloodline's most basic inbred ability, pleasure empowerment. The women lucky enough to share his bed these past months now proved their use. Having been fed on, their sexual energies were being used to enhance Damien's physique, to the point where his fist strike, with his full power behind it, caused a sharp blast of concussive force to barrel towards the three armed men. Almost immediately blood began to pour out of their seven orifices. Mary watched impassively as Damien used their pain and surprise to kill another three fleeing slavers. That wasn't pure force, she pondered. It was almost like one of the Thunderbird race's palm techniques. While you could achieve the same result if one was strong enough, It'd only be hitting without the need to hit, meaning the force of your strike will reach even if your fist doesn't. The difference here, though, is that the force went through. The men in front were not knocked back, but they were injured, and the men behind them were the ones who were forced to step backward. Damien's strike didn't stop at the surface. Instead all that power struck past the flesh of those in front and directly rattled their insides, then the remaining force was felt by the men behind. Muriel's overwhelming power would have torn them apart, limbs and all. This is definitely more refined. When did he learn something like that? It surprised her because attacks like these were actually quite rare. High tier knights used pure strength to launch similar attacks, but this was different. It surpassed all defense. In theory, it was nothing new. But in practice, it was considerably more difficult to reproduce. As expected, dragons are in a different league of talent. Those of other races could only watch on in envy when even Damien, who was very lazy, was able to so naturally use a move that would take children of races specializing in such attacks years to perfect. It's enough to drive one mad. It's a shame he was born away from the higher races. He'd have grown so much faster, thinking as much. She watched as he continued to dodge life-threatening attacks with the narrowest of margins. He knew the danger these men presented and didn't bother to fight head-on. As he was new to the power, he couldn't use the attack he'd unleashed moments ago and so didn't try. Attempting to do so would just leave him feeling drained. Mary inwardly applauded his good judgment. Meanwhile, Vera stood in worry. She silently chastised his mother for being so lazy. Had she taught him of his heritage he'd make quick work of men like these even if he were five years younger. Dragon essence was simply that powerful. Relying only on his incubus bloodline was not enough assurance. What if he got hurt? Ah, the thought was maddening. These were pretty capable knights, okay? On one hand, she knew he'd never die to people like them. On the other, she didn't like the idea of him in pain. It didn't matter if he could tolerate it. She had to close her eyes. She tapped her foot, trying to think of something else. She heard him exclaim fuck and her eyes flew open once more he'd gotten sliced across the side be careful idiot she snarled at him not helping he shouted back smashing his elbow into the head of that pretty auction lady he then immediately twisted away from the silvery blade poised to chop away at his arm vera was thoroughly incensed bastards had his mother not sealed their abilities she'd have wrapped these men in vines and made their insides into outsides seriously why does he have to take risks like this? Stupid, careless, heartless idiot. Mary looked down at her daughter with some amusement. All this trouble just because you had to be a hero. Vera's voice, nearly lost in the wind, miraculously reached his ears as they sped away. It was the second time he'd heard about this from her. And she was perfectly justified. But he just scoffed indignantly. Hero? I just found it and I saw... Let's not pretend I'm some righteous soul. Blame them for being filthy slavers, he rebutted. He disliked her wording, nothing more. He's a troublesome guy, sure, but certainly not a bleeding heart. Hero? HMPH. Who are you to judge? Vera grumbled. You were going to sell those bandits as slaves, too. They fucked around and found out, Damien replied remorselessly. If they hadn't talked about having their way with you too, I'd have just killed them. He shrugged. Who told them to be scum? So it's okay if you own and sell slaves, but not others? Vera's tone held a bite, seeming very cross with his hypocrisy. 
Given that they were currently being chased by a small company of knights through the streets, that was to be expected, of course, he answered very matter-of-factly, I can trust myself, I'd be a responsible slave owner, everyone else, I've no guarantees, best not leave them any chances to be cruel, inhumane bastards, he spoke as if this was the most reasonable thing in the world, see, Vera, he began explaining, some people just deserve to be enslaved, and conversely, every slave rather than me deserves to be purged by fire. Vera was utterly baffled by his logic. What kind of nonsensical take is that? She all but shrieked. Doesn't your ass ever get jealous of all the bullshit that comes out of your mouth? Pretty sure he's heard her say that line before. Can you just let him focus on running? Her mother asked, annoyed. He's all bloody. Vera complained. It's icky and gross. You've covered him in thirteen layers of medicinal herbs. He's fine. You're fine. Stop fussing. While most of their abilities were off the table, they were still able to conjure some plants that helped stop bleeding and promote faster healing. Very spluttered. I am not fussing. She ground out sullenly. This is just my duty as. The glare from her mother turned her rushed excuse to silence. Instead, she looked down and saw patches of herbs slowly falling off. Another layer or two would be better, she grumbled, patting down the stubborn leaves. Damien panicked. Please, don't he begged. I already look like an evergreen. You're injured. Vera snapped. It's your fault for rushing in. Who taught you to be so reckless? Instead of covering me in leaves, can't you just give me a kiss to make it feel better? The girl hit him on his fool head. Presumptuous, she sneered as if I'd ever do something like that for a bug like you, she shouted above the wind in their ears, why, do you think it would help, she asked, then mentally kicked herself for saying something so dumb, obviously it wouldn't help, suffice it to say, Vera wasn't thinking rationally, otherwise, she'd never let slip her concern so openly, well, when did she ever think rationally when it came to Damien, fuck, Damien cursed, Every time you open your mouth I love you more and more. Keep it up. Vera stiffened and pursed lips, her ears turning several shades redder. Hasn't it been too quiet lately? May suddenly asked. They were running around the city with a whole contingent of knights chasing after them just moments ago. Yet now it was quiet. Damien looked behind him. Yeah, he answered slowly. They're gone. What happened? She wondered aloud. Did the city guard stop them? She hypothesized. Damien pondered. Yeah probably, after all, the ones chasing us were only the knights hired by the black market. I didn't see any guards mixed in. It does make sense. But also not. Mary knit her brows, as the host, Valen won't normally stick their nose into the black market's business so it's not a surprise the guard did nothing. But they also shouldn't stop those in the employ of the black market. He rubbed his chin. Then a thought occurred to him. Ah. Hey he let out a self-satisfied smile, I think I know what's going on, then. What? Mary inquired, but just as she asked, she realized it too. With her experience, it wasn't hard to guess. Especially not with the vile grin Damien was letting air out at the moment. She sighed. Please, don't. She mimicked his earlier words. Why, Mary, whatever do you mean? Damien's handsome face held the distinctive aura of a hooligan up to no good. Young master, she spoke in a warning tone she knew would be thoroughly ignored. As expected, his only response was an evil chuckle. What? The city lord of Valen, Count Evard, roared. The entire audience room seemed to tremble, his voice cracking like a whip to all those present. A black market dares burrow its way into my city. His face turned black with rage. Inwardly, he was dripping with regret. Black markets were usually home to many illegal dealings. Although many cities hosted them, they were not, of course, officially affiliated. They merely turned a blind eye in return for a cut of all profits. Valen was one such example. Evard had in fact enjoyed several decades of amicable relations with those running the black market. A fair amount of the money he received went into bolstering the city's wealth and security. In addition to fattening his own pockets, unfortunately for Evard, with the auction house of the Blue Heavens burning down it was impossible to act ignorant. In light of that, there was only one course of action to take. Demolish that den of criminals at once. 
he decisively went turncoat. I want all those participating in this outrage rotting in a cell by nightfall, he ordered loudly, slamming a clenched fist upon the armrest of his throne. As he heard the full story from one of his retainers, Evard had to force himself from slumping down in his seat and sighing, fuck, he cursed silently, feeling far older and more annoyed than he had in years. Apparently, the son of Marquis Claybrook, the violet fucker, had been involved. He'd somehow gained an invitation which son of a whore would give one to that bastard. He wanted to hang their head over his fireplace, presumably to browse the wares offered within the market. He then proceeded to make trouble over the auction house dabbling in slavery. Cocksucking motherfucker. Couldn't you just have left well enough alone? Evard quietly simmered. You little bastard, the rumors were right about you. Simply infuriating. Now because that brat had wanted to play at a hero for a change, Evard was forced into a precarious position. Officially he had nothing to do with the black market. Even though hosting it had bought him much wealth, he needed to deny knowledge of its existence in his city. This would undoubtedly make him a laughingstock among the nobles of other regions. How could he be so incompetent as to not know something so atrocious was happening in his backyard? They'd mock, he'd have to bear that humiliation. All because some self-righteous brat needed to interfere, and this would no doubt cut off the peace between him and the underlords, the figures who led the black markets across the continent. But it was still better than being accused of treason if it got out he tried to sweep this under the rug, and so it was with a pained heart he made a proclamation for his exemplary actions in the name of justice. I wish to congratulate the young Lord Claybrook with a banquet held in his honor. With that, a public announcement would be issued inviting the boy to stay at the city lord's estate for the time being. Bitter appeal though it was, Evard couldn't stop there, and furthermore, the words seemed like they had to be dragged out of him. I will award him a medal of outstanding service. Let it be known. He sounded defeated even to his own ears. Well, he consoled himself, at least that bastard won't actually show, he must be long gone by now. Even if he wasn't, who in their right mind would take the invitation? He killed a dozen men and women over slaves. Lord Brian even had his heart ripped out, he had family in Valen. If the little devil did come, Evard would like to see just how he'd explain himself to the man's wife and children. 5. Chapter 12 a few days later, night. The city lord's mansion was in full swing with lanterns bathing the whole area in a festive glow. Even the vast grounds surrounding the opulent estate were open to the public, now filled with a boisterous crowd of people who ate and drank with great merriment. There were singers and storytellers, jugglers and dancers, various stalls and vendors sets shop and several games were being played ranging from cards to pig chasing. Damien even saw a chicken kicking competition in place, which he promptly and violently broke up. Within the building itself the air was more austere but no less merry, packed inside were the various men and women of influence of Valen. The noble, the wealthy, all were in attendance dressed in typical fashion. The women wore flamboyant dresses while the men adorned suits of a more somber affair with a touch of jewelry here or there. As they ascended the stairs towards the mansion's entrance, none blocked their path. One part was confidence, the other was the attire. Damien has dressed up in a long, deep grey overcoat with gold buttons and purple velvet lining. Beneath that was a red vest and black dress shirt with matching legwear. A brown leather belt with a silver rose buckle hung at his waist, showing off a newly acquired long sword. Meanwhile, Vera was wrapped in a dark blue dress that hugged her petite frame. Her skin had been dusted in powder glitter, making her already gorgeous appearance even more ethereal and dazzling. She was like a fairy from tales of old, glowing with a cold youthful beauty. As for her mother, Mary, she was truly transcendent. From top to bottom, her hair was loosely tied back into a bun and held in place by two wooden hairpins decorated with red and gold flowers. Two ribbons of emerald green framed the sides of her face, so alluring and lovely that only the barest of makeup was used. A mere touch of red rouge at her cheeks and full, sensuous lips. She wore a magnificent violet satin dress that cut off it and exposed her soft white shoulders 
leading to an exquisite and perfectly S-shaped clavicle that all ended and attracted attention to a pair of voluptuous breasts enough to drive all men wild with desire. Further down a slit opened at her side that laid bare an endlessly long and supple leg while at her waist hung a string of glittering pearl and diamond. Completing the ensemble was a white fur stole resembling a fox tail that hung down her back and held up by the crook of her elbow. Needless to say, none of the three looks pat of the common rabble. Whether it be their auras, attire, or looks, they all screamed of high nobility. As such, the guards naturally didn't block their entrance. At they reached the door, Damien merely flashed a small golden badge with the Claybrook family crest and the steward announced his arrival with great aplomb. All at once, the various discussions at Blay turned quiet and all eyes turned their way. Interest and lust mingled together in equal as they landed upon either Mary or Damien. Even Vera, for those Damien made a mental note. In no time at all, they heard a voice break the silence and a fit middle-aged man with a mane of graying orange hair approached him. What a pleasure it is to finally meet you, Lord Claybrook. I've heard such good. Evard broke off abruptly. When he heard the announcement, his first thought was, why the ever-loving fuck is he here? Boo now upon seeing the boy in question his thought became, who the hell is this? It was not a surprising question. The person standing there was a man, not a child. Tall, slightly more so than Evard, and broad-shouldered with a rare handsomeness. He wasn't at all like the youth Evard had seen in portraits. The only similarity was the rich purple eyes which were a trademark of the violet fucker. Lord, Damien? Evard asked doubtfully. Indeed, Damien smiled. Surprised? He grinned. Evard blinked, then collected himself. Apologies, my lord. You just seem so different from the paintings. He gave a chuckle that seemed to trail off a tad awkwardly. Yes, I've had a growth spurt. As you can see, Evard felt his chest tighten. Isn't he supposed to be in his fifteenth year? The fuck kind of growth spurt is this? Don't bullshit me. You look as old as my son. Clearly, Evard didn't know what else to say. Regardless, it's a pleasure. As I was saying, I've heard such good things. Really? Damien raised a brow. Like what? <laughs> Evard, who had been about to launch into another topic, was cut off. I asked, what good things have you heard? Damien pressed. That's. Evard was at a total loss on how to reply. He hadn't expected the other to ask. No. Why would he need to? He should know very well himself what people say about him. Damien Claybrook actually had a respectable reputation among the commoners and some lower rank nobles, but the people who knew his other side only knew him as a devil who flew off the handle at the smallest of things. Evard recalled a story where a baron's son flogged his horse to death after it cost him a race during an annual three day festival. Damien, who participated in said race, saw that and went completely insane, to everyone's horror. He cut the dead horse's stomach open and forced the boy to climb inside, then dragged the carcass over to the father's tent. Using his higher status, he forced the enraged baron to unwillingly flog his own son until he pissed and shat himself under the eye of a gathered crowd. The boy was covered in blood and bile, utterly traumatized to then be beaten by his father on top of that, even soiling himself in front of so many. It's said you have a magnanimous and kind heart, the city lord made up some bullshit that all those nearby could tell was a lie. Damien, however, smiled. That sounds about right. Evard marveled at his shamelessness. He could only offer a small laugh and put out his hand. Damien looked at it blankly. Did you wash first? Evard's amicable expression turned noticeably taut. For all I know you could have jacked off with that hand before coming here. After all, Damien spoke as if that was something very reasonable to assume. Wouldn't want any white crust on me. Shock. Evard froze, completely and utterly stunned by the ridiculous words. The few closest to them who heard let out quiet laughter. He damn near passed out in rage and shame at that his cheeks reddening instantly. I assure you, I'm clean. Evard ground his teeth. I believe you, and yet Damien kept his hands at his side, leaving the man hanging. Evard felt a vein pop in his forehead as he lowered his arm. Two minutes here and Evard already wanted to kick him out. I heard you're going to give me a medal. Damien suddenly changed the topic. Yes, that's right. 
The city lord responded tightly. Well, Damien put his hand out and gestured with a patient smile. It was the universal sign of gimme. Let's leave that for later. Evard swallowed his anger. Enjoy the banquet first. Mingle. Sounds boring. By now Evard's eyes were twitching. But since you insist, lead on, cunt. The man paused, sure he misheard. Pardon? Damien raised a brow. I said lead on, cunt. Aren't you going to bring me inside? You said mingle, so let's go. Show me around. Ah, yes, he frowned. Right. Then let him deeper in. Raising his voice, the man clapped Damien's shoulder. Everyone, he started, the guest of honor. At that a round of cheers made the whole room vibrate. Ever then hailed a servant and spoke low into his ear. After a moment, he nodded and scurried away. Ever turned his attention to Damien's companions. And who might these lovely ladies be? He asked, his eyes going easy on Mary. All three acted like they hadn't heard him. Seeing their disregard, Ever composed himself and pretended as if he hadn't asked. It was bad enough Damien had ignored him, but the woman and her child didn't even seem to acknowledge his existence. No good whores. Come, my lord, have a drink and make yourself at home. What's mine is yours. A goblet was quickly passed to the city lord, then another to Damien. A toast. Evard roared with more good-naturedness than he actually felt, as one. Another cheer broke out among the crowd and they all downed the contents of their respective cups. Once that was done, Evard started to introduce him to a few men and women from among the crowd. Each one had wide smiles but empty eyes. The hostility they held was only thinly veiled by niceties they could barely be bothered to fake. Damien could guess they were also fuckers who profited from the now disbanded black market. He paid them no mind and only responded with enduring politeness. The night was young. They'd get theirs. Damien thought things would progress with equal monotony until Evard brought him to an absent looking woman. Next to her was a burly teen of perhaps seventeen and two younger children, a boy and a girl, who probably didn't surpass twelve. Finally, we have Lady Olivia and her children. Was it just him, or did the man's voice seem a touch more jovial? At her name, the woman raised her eyes. Ah, her voice sounded far away. Count. Hello, my lady. Evard nodded. I've someone I'd like you to meet. He patted Damien's shoulder. This fine young man here is Lord Claybrook. He's the special guest of tonight's banquet. Come, get acquainted. Damien was curious about the man's unexpected shift in mood but didn't bother about it. Rather, he just said the same line he dryly fed all the other women he'd been shown so far. Lady Olivia, what a rare treat it is to meet such a lovely... He got not another word out before he was met with a loud slap that attracted the attention of everyone in the room. Ah, there it is. How dare you show your face here? The woman's voice trembled. Murderer. Her entire expression crumbled into a mess of tears and running makeup. Damien already could tell what was going on. But Evard was all too happy to explain anyway. Ah, my apologies, my lord. He explained. Actually, Lady Olivia's husband, Lord Byron was unfortunately among the criminals you executed that day. I should have realized sooner and steered you away. He sighed guiltily. Alas, it must have slipped my mind. Sure you did, prick. Damien merely brushed off the apology. It's fine, Lord Evard. He was prepared to leave it at that. But Vera chose that moment to speak up. Old age comes with many failings, she said mildly. Memory and libido are always the first to go. Mary added sympathetically. Evard opened and closed his mouth several times, unable to form any kind of response to the unexpected attack. It would have simply infuriated him if Damien had been the one to insult him. But it coming from such a beautiful mother-daughter pair made him feel as if his entire being had just been dragged through a pile of mud. Damien ignored him. Instead, he faced the woman again. It was the first time in a while a woman had struck him. Looks like if they hate me enough, my glamour doesn't work. Because of the effect his biology had on females, he wasn't sure if it was still possible for normal women to dislike him. Much less hate and even strike him. To be honest he was glad. As for you. Damien rubbed his cheek thoughtfully. Evard, still searching for his missing self-esteem after the blow it had just taken, was desperate to latch onto some distraction and what was about to unfold would surely do that quite well. He hid a cold sneer. What are you waiting for? Go ahead, 
Show us how you plan to explain away killing their beloved husband and father. It wasn't just him, either. Everyone else watching also eagerly awaited the response. Drama like this didn't come around often. Whether they supported the young Lord Clay Brooks' actions that day or not was of little difference, all they knew was that no matter what excuse or platitude he attempted, it was sure to be entertaining. After just a few moments, Damien seemed to settle on something. To be perfectly honest I don't know which pro-slave piece of shit your husband was, nor do I give a fuck. But I hope you at least take comfort in the fact that no matter how gruesomely he may have been killed, he deserved it. All at once, the jaws of everyone present appeared to hit the floor. All sound seemed to vanish entirely as his words left everyone in stunned silence. But he wasn't done. If, you have doubts, look at where we are. He gestured to the room at large. Hell! They're even giving me a medal. The widow's eyes widened in shock and pain. Her lips quivered, but no matter how hard she tried there were no words able to make it out her mouth. Monster! The silence was broken by an enraged voice, a single word tearing through the quiet so thoroughly it startled people out of their disbelief. An instant later a stocky teen rushed Damien. It was one of the children at Lady Olivia's side. Needless to say, he was the eldest son of Lord Byron. But despite his vigor, the youth got easily put down by the much stronger and skillful Damien. Faster than anyone could blink. Damien already had the boy on the floor underneath his boot. Let me go, the boy shouted viciously. Murderer, demon, I'll kill you. I'll fucking kill you. Evan, his mother cried. She ran up to Damien and started shaking him, trying to push him off her son. Let go of him, you bastard. Let go. Evan. Damien rolled his eyes. Jesus Christ, just shut up. He snarled at the woman in annoyance. Faced with such an unfamiliar intensity, the woman quickly froze in fear. You too. He stepped harder on the struggling boy's back until he felt something pop. No real damage, but enough to hurt for some weeks. I get it, I killed someone you love. Boo hoo, go cry in a corner, he said mercilessly. I'm sure that's what the families of those slaves your scum husband and further bought in the past had to do, too. Damien sneered. What, you expect me to feel bad? You have no idea nor do you give a damn, about the kind of shit some of those people have to go through. I've seen slavers who'd put entire families into cages and left them to rot until they started eating each other out of starvation. Maybe if I did the same to you, you'd be just a little more understanding when I put down the cock-sucking scumbags who keep people like that in business. Damien in general hated the concept of slavery, but seeing a little girl and her brother munching on their family's corpses. Well, that's a special kind of fucked up he simply didn't approve of. Ever since then, he flew into a frenzy each time he encountered slavers. It's also the reason he had been steered clear of their path. As often as possible in the past, his further had to spend an exorbitant amount of money and pull numerous favors to get Damien out of prison that time. Apparently butchering fat pieces of garbage and feeding them their own appendages was considered inhumane. Hey. His further never quite looked at him the same, though surprisingly, he also didn't seem too startled by it. Now knowing his mother's true identity, Damien finally understood how his further could take such a thing in stride. Turns out, he was already used to depictions of gore. Putting those thoughts away for the moment, he took his foot off the brat. All right, I'm done. Take your kid home and put some ice on his back. Don't let me see you here again. No one moved. Evered, the widow, her children and all the guests gathered there, not a single one of them seemed capable of even breathing. They all just looked at Damien as if he was some alien creature. Or I could just kill him. He tried the same with me. Damien unsheathed his blade and put it to the boy's neck. Should I? He questioned, as if genuinely curious. Evard finally shook himself out of his daze. Lord Claybrook, he shouted. That's quite enough. Damien cocked a brow is it? Are you sure? Fucking dickhead. He narrowed his eyes at the man. Don't you stand there and act like you didn't bring me over to this woman and her family on purpose. He looked across the crowd. Well, have a good show, you bunch of insufferable twats. He glared hard at them all. Lord Claybrook. Evert sputtered. You go too far. Damien zeroed in on the man. Too far? Damien suddenly seemed to lose momentum. 
His previous foul-mouthed and domineering attitude disappeared and was replaced by a look of deep apology. I see. Yes, you're right. He blew out a breath, his face taking on a kind of light. Forgive me, Count. I lost myself for a moment. He returned his gaze to the widow, whose face had long since lost all color. My sincerest apologies to you, Lady Olivia, and my condolences to your husband. He bowed. No one said a thing. His change was too quick giving everyone a sense of whiplash. Is. Is this man insane? They quietly wondered. Meanwhile, Vera and Mary gave each other a look. I think I'm going to go grab a drink, settle myself. Damien continued. Would you care for one as well, Lord Evert? The man grimaced, feeling ill at ease. Yes, that sounds. Yes, you'd better go get one then, shouldn't you? And just like that, Damien wandered off and was left alone. He expected to remain that way for the remainder of the night, but only a few minutes later he was surrounded by men and women all wanting to gain his favor. Being friends with the heir of a powerful Marquis was always attractive. Unfortunately, irritated though he was, he handled them in expert fashion. Having long since become used to this, the only change was the women who all appeared eager to giggle and brush against him at any opportunity. From the corner of his eye, he saw Mary also being surrounded by throngs of men all wanting to make her acquaintance. He felt his lip curl in amusement at her distraught, and annoyed, visage, then chuckled as she struck down all attempts at conversation. Meanwhile, Vera stuck to his side by grabbing onto his sleeve. It made her look so shy and demure that several men looked at her with heated gazes. Damien made a mental note of them. It was half an hour later when he decided to make his move and whispered to Vera. She rubbed the bridge of her nose, sighed, then nodded and slipped away. It's about time we spice things up, he thought, watching Vera's retreating back with an almost malicious glint in his eye. He has some goddamn nerve. That brat, Evard growled taking another swig of wine to calm himself, trailing off into momentary silence. He was seated at a long table located at the back of the room. The raised floor allowed him to look down on the other guests, signifying his status as city lord. Only close friends or family had the right to be seated alongside him. Is he really so terrible? His daughter asked, causing him to stare at her sharply. She was in her nineteenth year and had recently returned from abroad. Ever since, she's been often in her room with her baubles, doing some type of research. In fact, she'd been consumed by it. The girl had been in collaboration with a prominent figure from Bormister, though that slowed ever since the disaster. They still kept in touch. Even tonight, she only showed just a few minutes prior. Hence, she hadn't witnessed that bastard's cruelty. He seems charming enough. She went on obliviously, casting a favorable glance towards the man in question while saying so. Her father slammed the goblet onto the table in a show of rage. Charming? Ha! Huh. Typical woman. He complained, only ever caring about looks. A shake of the head. He stomped a man's head into the ground like he was smashing melons. Still think he's charming? The daughter immediately wrinkled her nose. Point taken. Evid nodded satisfactorily. Good. At least you have some sense. Who cares about him? A new voice joined in. His third child, Thomas. I'm more interested in that green-haired woman he brought. She's. He trailed off and breathed heavily. Exquisite. His eyes burned with lust. It's like I can already feel her under me, breasts soiled and wrapped around my cock. Evid gave the young man a baleful eye. His son's love of women had always been a point of discontent. He'd rather lay with the maids and do drugs than have any interest in helping to run their territory. Not to mention, bringing up the woman caused Evid to remember their previous words to him. It drudged up all the humiliation, making his mood dark and even more. Arrogant bitches. You're disgusting. His daughter made a face. Thomas snorted. Oh please. You'll be doing the same for a man someday. Never going to happen. His sister flatly denied. I'd rather die than do something so shameful. Thomas snickered. Well I do suppose you'd have to actually find a man first, and I don't see that happening any time soon with an attitude like yours. Her face grew hot. Oh, go to hell. She threw a bun at him. Asshole. She muttered. Lanny. Evid warned. Mind yourself. We're in public. Lanny looked at him indignantly. But, father, he's the one who, he's trying to rile you up. Evard cut her off, 
Are you going to play his game? Just ignore him. Yeah, sis. Thomas chirped. Ignore me. Lanny sat there boiling quietly as he went on. Besides, what else are you going to use those uselessly large things for? He poked her breasts with a spoon. He then took a sip of wine. Tastes funny, Thomas muttered idly. Thinking no further of it, Lanny flushed hotly, covering her chest. None of your business, Thomas grunted. I don't even know what you're so embarrassed about you prude. I bet mother, as Lanny's eyes widened in disbelief. Everett had already reached over and clapped his son on the ear before he could finish his words. You talk too much, fuck. The boy hissed in pain. Lanny took in her younger brother's suffering with immense satisfaction. Idiot. What the hell, old man? Thomas complained resentfully. That hurt. Serves you right, Lanny snickered. Honestly, have you no shame? Talking about your own mother that way. I didn't even say anything yet. Technically. Technically, you're a fool. Prude. Pervert. Ever drolled his eyes as the two glared at each other like they were one another's arch nemesis. Dumb brat. As if that mother of yours would ever do something like that. His wife was a kind, giving woman and an excellent mother, but she was far from adventurous. She'd never performed such lewd acts. Well, that was fine. Everd had no complaints regarding their sex life. Linnea was an outrageous beauty. What man would be discontent? Besides, he had other women for rougher play. Speaking of, where is mother? A man to Everd's left wondered aloud. It was his oldest. Abram. Like his brother and father, he also had a thick head of reddish hair. Unlike them, however, he was quieter and more pensive. Some may even say intense. Thankfully so, in Evard's opinion. He often kept the other two in line. Evard waved a hand in dismissal. She's out back, he replied irritably. His wife, the dear woman, was sweet and well-mannered but shy. She very much disliked large groups and sometimes wandered their private gardens. You know how she gets around crowds, and because his son was supposed to know this, Everd felt prompted to ask. Why? Instead of answering the man merely pointed toward the ballroom floor. Isn't that her there? His siblings turned first. What they saw was their mother's figure standing next to tonight's special guest. Of course, it could only be Damien. The boy man was currently holding their mother's hand and bowed to kiss it. A normal enough greeting, but unlike the norm. He didn't bother to let go and simply continued to hold on to her palm, speaking words that couldn't be heard from so far away. Whatever it was, though, it made their mother's face turn soft and lush. It was such an unfamiliar expression that they were almost certain they were seeing wrong, that the woman couldn't possibly be their mother. And yet no matter how hard they looked, it could only be her. Their father Harsh's glower just then seemed to have been sensed. Turning his head, Damien caught the man's eyes, but instead of showing guilt, fright, or even surprise, he merely smiled their way. His lips moved with clear intent. What's yours is mine, right? He mouthed. Evard was absolutely livid. 7. Chapter 13. Gentlemen were everywhere. Young. Shy-looking ones in the latest fashion middle-aged balding ones who stood with drinks in hand as protruding bellies trained their waistcoats. Standing at the entrance of the assembly room Linnea below used took a deep breath. She was bad with crowds. They made her feel trapped, anxious, especially crowds like this. However, a heavenly scent had tickled her nose from afar as she was wandering her gardens and soon she found herself in the ballroom. As soon as she stepped through the door. The scent assaulted her, thick, heady, and, seductive. Her attention was instantly drawn to a broad-shouldered young man in the center of the room. He stood tall amongst a crowd of females, dark-haired and violet-eyed, like sex-given form. He almost seemed to be calling for her. Linnea found herself staring. And the more she did, the stronger the scent became. Her hands, folded tight at her waist, struggled to stay in place. Her womanhood felt moist throbbing with desire, it was all she could do to keep from touching herself, mesmerizing, isn't he, my lady, a voice suddenly broke in, startled, Linnea turned and found the fair-haired woman in a blue gown to her left, she shared a glance with Linnea for a moment before going back to openly eyeing the man, coughing a bit to hide her embarrassment, she asked, who is he, Marquis Claybrook's son, Lord Damien, the woman replied, 
The name caused Linnea's eyes to widen in surprise. The guest of honor? That Damien? But, he's only fifteen. The other woman laughed. I know. But his lineage is said to be a bit special. Maybe that has something to do with it? She speculated. Anyway, what does it matter? Look at him. Her expression turned hungry. Linnea swallowed. Damien Claybrook. There were many mixed rumors about him. Some were flattering. Others less so. There were those who painted him as a young talent with uncanny skill in music and drawing. Polite, even perhaps a touch erudite. Someone tolerant and kind. Others, popular among the upper ranks of society, called him eccentric and cruel. Quick to anger, lustful. They called him the Violet. Well, Linnea won't repeat such language. Curious, she took another look. With that lush, velvety hair that fell in careless waves just past his ears, he looked every bit a hero from fairy tales. Certainly not some villain. Linnea took in the rest of him, his thick arms and strong, surely calloused hands that looked as if made solely to cup a woman's groin. No, not a hero. Knights, princes, heroes, such things were the fantasies of young girls. They were perfect gentlemen, pure and valiant. This man before her wasn't a girl's fantasy, he was a woman's. There was something dark about him, something vulgar in the best of ways. He was so beautiful, so stunning, so. Linnea's face turned red immediately, her heart pounding in her chest. What are you getting excited for? She chided herself. You're married. With children, even your youngest is older than him. It's been ages since she and Evard married. Nearly twenty-three years now. It had been a happy marriage for the most part, and Evard was a good man who never made her want for anything. She'd never even looked another man's way until now. It made her feel wild guilt. Just then, he found her. From across the room, his gaze cut through the throngs of people between them and settled on her with an almost physical intensity. A slow smile curled at his lips. Within seconds, his eyes flashed. It was as if he had chosen her. Linnea quickly averted her gaze. Meanwhile, the woman beside her gave a nudge. It's all right, my lady. It's only looking. Here, have some. She offered Linnea a drink. I don't know the vintage, but it's divine. Ah, yes, thank you. Linnea replied softly, reaching to accept the drink, only for it to be intercepted before she could even touch the glass. I think not, a smooth, sexy timbre cut in. I like my women lucid. Damien. Linnea marveled at the sight of him. He was even larger close up, every inch of him screaming of a powerful male. And right now, all that masculine energy was directed right at her. Lord Claybrook. Linnea stuttered in surprise like some young schoolgirl. My lord. The other woman greeted as well, blushing and suddenly abashed. Perhaps he'd have responded to her at any other time. But right now, all his attention was elsewhere. I saw you staring, my lady. He towered over her, bringing with him that same heady musk that had attracted her here to begin with. Is the view better now? His voice dipped just then, becoming a low, husky whisper. Or should I get, closer? He took a step forward, their bodies mere centimeters apart. Seemingly entirely oblivious, or uncaring, towards the various glances and murmurs around them. M married, Linnea stammered out, mouth dry. A soft trumble vibrated from his chest, to Count Evard. Yes, I know. He responded coolly, catching her off guard. An arched brow came next. So? Damien asked as if it didn't matter to him in the slightest. He's no worry. Right now you only need to concern yourself over one thing. The question bubbled up unbidden. And that is? He said nothing for a moment. Instead, he leaned down and took her palm. Warm lips brushed against the back of her hand causing all kinds of delicious little shivers to run down her spine, how many orgasms you can beg from me before I give you back, he smiled, decidedly wicked, oh, Linnea's face have never burned so bright, where the fuck did they go, ever roared hysterically, he pushed through the throngs of men and women for a solid five minutes by then, utterly enraged, who saw them, out with it, you bastards, he demanded from his guests, but while they did fear ever desire, this was Marquis Claybrook's heir, not to mention, it was that Damien. No one wanted that sort of trouble. This was a matter they needn't involve themselves in. And so they all politely denied any knowledge on the direction the two had left. 
the look the young Lord Damien had given while so openly leading the Countess into the inner rooms clearly promised unfortunate ends if they dared do otherwise. Traitorous fucks, he cursed at them loudly. Father Abram jogged over with a serious air. Something's wrong. The guards stationed around the estate are knocked out. Everett stopped and rounded on the man. What? We need to shut the banquet down. His son replied. And all of a sudden, Everett's vision swam. A strange heat came to his face. Then, right before his eyes, glowing orbs seemed to come to life. Fairies. Everett muttered in awe. He stared at them in rapt attention. They were naked and beautiful, breasts plump, glowing bright like stars in every color of nature while their wings gave off silvery dust in their wake. So pretty. Father? Abram frowned. He noticed the older man's dazed, far-off eyes and grew immediately concerned. Are you okay? Father? He snapped his fingers in his face. Father? What's wrong? But Everett only stared at him blankly. Then he promptly lurched forward, shouting. No. Come back. Abram didn't panic. Instead, he held down his struggling father and felt for a pulse. It was erratic and his temperature was raised higher than normal. Abram felt suspicion grow in his heart as he looked into his father's eyes. The irises were dilated. Drugged. He cursed. Fuck. All right. Now he was starting to get anxious. Someone summon the physician. He called out, only to find his order ignored. Turning. Abram was met by a disturbing sight. All around him men and women were acting strangely. Some muttered to themselves, others pranced about in chase of something. But a majority started disrobing, claiming they were too hot. With reddened faces, they had expressions of euphoria and lust. Already, several couples had begun locking lips and grinding against one another. The change had come so fast and sudden Abram had difficulty understanding what was going on. The servants had no idea what to do. They stood back in horror, looking to Abraham for orders. Abe. The wine. Thomas came from out of nowhere, cradling his head and walking unsteadily. Thanks to years of drug abuse, he'd built a tolerance and so wasn't as affected. But he was sure. It was the wine. As soon as he felt the high, he knew someone had spiked the drinks. Abram, who abhorred alcohol, was unaffected. He quickly realized what was going on. That fucker, he thought. So that's why he came, he growled. He called for one of the servers. Carry my father to his chambers, he ordered. Then he addressed his brother. You good? Fuck. The man took a breath. No. Yes. Well, no. Shit. Whatever was in there is strong stuff. The man slurred a bit. I haven't felt this good in ages. Tom, focus. I need you to find a woman. The man grinned. My thoughts exactly, brother. Abram then watched as he, too, started to undress. His brother's swollen member stood proudly up at him within seconds. Woman? Abram remembered just then. Wait, Tom, where's Lanny? The man swept his gaze around the room. Oh, her? She ran off somewhere, probably looking for mother. Came the almost absent reply. By now, almost everyone was in the throes of either euphoric madness or passion. Fucking genius, he laughed. Enjoying every moment of this, I change my mind. I like the crazy bastard. A wild smirk came to his lips as he spread out his hands and raised them. In his mind, the entire night sky was hovering above his head. Dark, dangerous, and beautifully seductive in nature. A motherfucking surprise orgy. He cackled madly. I love it. Don't you love it, Abe? He sucked in a breath. A strange smoke started to fill the room that made Abram cover his face. I can taste the air. His brother exclaimed. I feel like I'm getting a blowjob from a fucking rainbow. As his brother descended further into his high, Abram couldn't stop the smoke from entering his lungs. He coughed violently, feeling his grip on reality loosen. Before he knew it, his vision turned, odd, like colors were brighter and shadows longer. He looked down at his hands and laughed. Were hands always so funny? Look at those fingers. So wiggly, like tadpoles. The thought caused another laugh to bubble up. He took a glance around. A few feet away, a young couple was writhing against each other. And just like that, the nonsensical thoughts were gone. Now Abram felt his chest tighten as he watched. The entire room was just filled with so much life. He could feel the subtle pulse of depravity pervading every corner, as if something had grabbed hold of them all. It was a hot, sweet, 
wholly corrupted energy that teased his cock and made it ache. He felt a hand brush his shoulder, female, something in his mind whispered, and his dick jumped eagerly, in response, my lord the woman, a slightly older lady with dark dresses cooed, a pair of hands roamed over his spectrals, sliding under his shirt, groping at him shamelessly, he could smell her arousal somehow, and his own, some mysterious force heightening his senses, his libido, like never before, it was as if he was alive for the first time in forever. Another woman, a blonde beauty with doe eyes, emerged and peered up at him with undisguised lust. It might be just the effect of the strange smoke, but they both also seemed to shine with a very faint purple hue, a violet hue, almost like, then soft, tender lips met his own and the thought vanished. His shirt was abruptly ripped and their dresses were torn. Smooth alabaster skin was exposed, faintly. He was aware some other male had come up behind one of the women. Thomas? It hardly mattered. By the time Evert came to, he felt sluggish, yet feverish, numb, but sensitive. It was a strange feeling, but he recognized it as some kind of drug effect. He stirred, eyes blurry, and found himself sitting against a wall. He recognized the hallway leading towards his chambers. Confused, he heard a nearby moan and saw a burly male servant entirely naked, thrusting into a panting noble lady. Shocked, Evard rose unsteadily to his feet and smelled something in the air. Ignoring it for now, he shouted angrily at the two. What the hell do you think you're doing? He snarled at them but neither paid him any attention at all. Being ignored so thoroughly roused his anger, prompting him to lunge toward the two and kick the servant's side with force. The male was knocked out of the woman and dropped to the floor. Ever ready to beat him but just that one move made him feel weak. He staggered, holding on to the wall for support. Just then, he inhaled and noticed the air tasted funny. Just then, the fairies returned. He instantly forgot about the couple, not seeing the violet light around their eyes or how they seemed to burn with an all-encompassing lust. Come, the pretty, ethereal creatures beckoned. No word sounded but it was as if he could hear them in his head. Such soft and attractive voices, he couldn't refuse them anything, and so he followed. Leaning against the wall, he mindlessly trudged forward until the tiny women bathed in light led him to a familiar door. It seemed somehow ominous at that moment, towering over him with malice. He didn't want to go in, but the fairies disappeared through the door and he had no choice. He pushed it open and looked in. The room was exceptionally well lit much more so than normal. A man sat upon the middle of his bed propped up by layers of luxurious pillows. He leaned back comfortably as a set of women serviced him. They sat to either side of him, breasts naked and smothering his bare cock, moving up and down in a slow, sensuous manner, kissing the head of his long, girthy penis as if completely enamored. Is this good? Are we doing it right? One of them asked. The male rubbed their hair as if braising them. It's great, keep going just like that. The familiar voices caused Evid to feel like the world was shaking beneath his feet. Lanny, his voice cracked in disbelief, startled. His daughter straightened her back in fright and looked towards the entrance in shock. Father, she exclaimed in utmost horror, moving the bedsheets to cover herself. The fairies had fled, and in their wake was a cold, sober clarity. Now that Lanny had moved. The other woman's face was now unobscured. Lin, his voice was a hoarse whisper. Lin, no. His words and entrance, which had surely been noticed by all parties by now, didn't seem to concern his wife at all. She merely continued her service. With Lanny having backed out, it was as if there was no longer any competition or need to share and so her pink little tongue roamed along the man's shaft with greed, savoring every inch. Her soft, Quiet moans told she was wholly focused on nothing but the male's cock. Damien opened one eye and noticed the intruder was Evard. It didn't worry him. Lanny, you're lagging. Panic entered Lanny's eyes at the words. What? No, that's not fair, is it? His lips curved. But your mother's so dedicated. Look, she hasn't even noticed him. He put a hand to the woman's cheek and gently tucked a loose lock of hair behind her ear. You should learn from her example. Lanny puffed her cheeks, clearly sulking. She turned back to her further and angrily threw a pillow at him. Dad, get out. You're distracting me. Go. Damien spanked her ass, 
making her yelp in a sweet voice Everd had never imagined hearing from his daughter's lips. Pain blossomed in his chest, an agony far greater than any he'd felt before. Seeing his wife and daughter performing such lewd acts together caused his entire psyche to collapse. Meanwhile, Damien gave not one fuck. Don't blame him for your lack of focus, he chided, then looked at the night sky. Well, it's about time we took things to the next level anyway he smirked. He hit the now catatonic Everd with a bright smile. Hey, come on, what's with the shattered look? Tonight's supposed to be about fun, don't tell me you're going to quit now? We have so much left to do. With that, he pushed Linnea away for a moment and jumped off the bed. He got not even a foot away before a pair of tender arms coiled around him. No, don't go, Linnea begged. He kissed her hand. I won't be gone long, sweet, he comforted. Linnea whimpered pitifully, but nodded shyly, then, summoning all her courage, asked, if I be patient, can you, do that thing with your tongue again, please? Damien turned and saw her glancing up at him, head buried in his shoulder. Finding her cute, he stroked her hair. Oh, we can do far more exciting things than that, he promised. Do you have to go? Lanny pouted. I hate it. Damien planted a hand between her thighs to quiet her. She was so sensitive and wet. Any small touch sending her into ecstasy. Why don't you two play amongst yourselves until I get back? He offered. Don't worry, I'll help you two experience the joys of womanhood all you want when I return. Kissing their foreheads, he walked towards the balcony, asking, Is it done? Mary, standing in wait to the side answered. The married women and children have been sent home successfully. She frowned. It was annoying having to filter them. Was it really necessary? Damien rolled his eyes. Of course, he replied as if it was obvious. I'm not going to start a three-day stint of debauchery with married women and children present. I have some standards. How can I just let another man's wife get fucked by random strangers? Vera emerged from the other corner of the balcony, saying, you just got done training another man's wife and daughter how to fillet you. So? He keeps mistresses and allows all kinds of corruption to flow freely within the city. I'm just the karma the gods sent to punish him. He grinned. See? Standards. Vera leered at him. Not at all because he was standing there naked and fully erect, which made her cheeks burn. Rather, because of the nonsense coming out of his mouth right now. I thought you were an atheist. I deface a few statues and people think I'm a godless heathen. He shook his head with a sigh. No, my dearest V. I wholeheartedly believe the gods exist. I just also believe they're vile cunts who need to be taught who can be touched and who cannot. His thoughts drifted to Dolly and the bad endings she experienced in the game. He hadn't forgotten that. Things just got a bit out of hand. But with his mother causing a war, things were progressing into the events of later games in the series. Well, it was a change enough to where he didn't worry about her falling into despair. She and Alex, the prince, had barely even talked since they had been sent to school. Speaking of, Alex should have attended Bormister with him. Originally, Alex attended a couple months late due to him first being sent to he dry lands for training. But he never showed, which was odd. The entire capital city was also supposed to be entirely destroyed, triggering the war. Damien knew that was supposed to happen much later, so he didn't concern himself over it. Then his mother came and did something nearly as bad, which was not part of the history he knew. And so the war came far earlier than it was supposed to. How that affected things, he didn't know. Dolly also never attended Haven, though things were very twisted. He considered certain things better than the original plotline, but he should still keep in mind the ramifications. The heroine hadn't snowed either, as long as she was alive, she and Dolly would probably bump heads eventually. Maybe they'd end up friends, though. Damien wasn't the type of person to think everything was preordained, just because they had the role of enemies in the game, didn't mean it had to still happen now. He just had to watch how things turned out and act accordingly. For now. He didn't want to be involved at all. He planned to live his life apart from that nonsense, taking Dolly when she came back from her exchange program and just living apart from their parents. Still, best to be ready to just kill the heroine and hero if they became a problem. He had enough to deal with in his own family, after all, he didn't need Dolly becoming a villain or harem member, 
so if she could avoid them both that'd be great. So, what's next? Mary asked wearily. Honestly, serving Damien was probably worse than serving his mother. At least she didn't need to slip drugs into wine glasses or place piles of burning psychedelic herbs anywhere when with Muriel. Or have a hand in orgies. Damien glanced at her. Why do you sound so tired? The night is still young. He approached with the kind of slow, stalking gait of a predator. When he finally stood before her, his cock pressed against her stomach. It was so hot she could feel it through her dress, its hardness, its heat. They beckoned to her. Mary breathed in more than the narcotic smoke. She smelled him. Such a thick, manly musk that it made her body responsible almost against her will. Even now, her nipples were so sensitive that she was soaked just from them brushing against her clothes. But she wasn't a normal woman. Even though all her acute senses made her even more susceptible to his being, she held herself back. It's okay to relax every once in a while. He spoke low. Mary felt her fingers curl tightly, trying desperately to resist his subtle offer. I can feel it. You know, he raised her head to meet him. Your arousal. His hands drifted down her sides, palms resting at her hips. His cock poked her belly, causing her womanhood to throb. She so wanted to give in, to let him have her, but her body wasn't in line with her heart. I still love him, she forced out. Damien snorted. What's the point of being loyal to someone who won't love you back? He asked, then shook his head. Whatever. Be stubborn. He stepped back. You know, I really won't wait around forever. He looked at them. Vera averted her gaze, not wanting to hear this. Matty stood unmoved, not showing a hint of emotion. Damien scoffed at them. If you guys don't want me, that's fine, he growled. But don't keep wasting my time. If you aren't interested, then just leave. I never asked either of you to put up with me. From now on, you can do whatever you want. I'm better off on my own anyway. He only held back because of Vera. He wanted to punish her for keep being dishonest with him. He thought he could wait it out however long it took. But to be honest that wasn't in his nature. He'd still accept her at any time. But he was growing tired of this shit. He didn't want to keep making her feel bad, but she refused to give in. And Mary was stuck on someone who obviously didn't give her the same consideration. Why didn't they just let him spoil them? He wouldn't be such a man whore if they did, but neither of them seemed interested. Rather, they resisted and made every excuse in the book for why they couldn't be with him. He was more than willing to be patient and work through all their hesitations, but they had to actually tell him that's what they wanted. Damien wouldn't force anything, wouldn't selfishly make them accept him. But he couldn't keep holding himself back for their sake either. Damien was not a good person. But he could act like one if given sufficient reason to. All he needed was a good wife or two. Then he could be content. Not with those like Linear, who could only fall in love with his cock. No. He needed someone who could at least care about himself as a person who could see his potential as a loving husband and father. So far, only Mary and Vera fit the bill. And he liked them. They were the first choice. Why wouldn't he want them? But if that couldn't happen, he'd be fine with just fucking every pretty woman in his path and having orgies like this everywhere he went. There was no reason not to in such a case. Vera can just fall for someone else who she doesn't need to find excuses to stay away from. Mary can keep pining. As for Damien, even if he was fated to just be a loveless male slut all his life, well, that wasn't bad either. Believing so, he started walking back into the room where another mother-daughter pair awaited him. At least they were honest with him. In his drug-addled state, such careless thoughts had blossomed. 7. Chapter 14 From now on, you can do whatever you want. I'm better off on my own anyway. The words played over and over in her head long after they left. I never asked either of you to put up with me, he'd said. Mary felt uneasy after hearing that. It was true he'd never asked them along. Vera was placed at his side by his father to keep him in line, but Damien no longer cared for his father's instructions. As for Mary, he only took her along to keep her from his vindictive mother. Honestly, he did her a favor then. Muriel might have killed her just to prove a point why she didn't. Mary had no idea. She'd never hesitated to kill before and didn't make empty threats. Well, regardless, Mary was better off with Damien. 
That's why his words hit harder than she thought they would. Damien was kind to her, both of them, far more than Muriel had ever been. Now that they were alone and didn't have to worry about station or etiquette in the eyes of others, namely Elias and Muriel, he acted much differently. Mary recalled many times when he'd surprise her with little treats whenever a wayward thought brought some unpleasant memory from the past, or be at their side to carry them off to bed the moment one of them was about to drift off into sleep after an evening meal. On top of that, Mary in particular was shown much affection. It seemed as if he always had sweet words in storage for her. At first, it all made her feel a touch awkward. However over time she gradually accepted it. It also wasn't as if he expected anything in return. It seemed as if he merely enjoyed teasing and spoiling them. But between Mary's refusals and Vera's outright denials, he must be wondering why they're still here. Any man would be annoyed, right? Being accompanied by people who constantly spurned his advances. Maybe he thought they were only still here to keep watch over him? Report to his father and mother? It'd be double stifling then. No grown man would appreciate babysitters. Even though that wasn't the case here, she couldn't blame him if that's what he thought. Is he kicking us out? Mary wondered aloud as they walked through empty halls. Vera laughed mirthlessly. Of course not, she replied. From his perspective, we were never obligated to follow him to begin with. He just never said anything because he liked being with us. Her face was pale almost sickly. She had thought about his words to them all this time, too. And the more she did, the more ill she felt. I'm sure you've noticed, that before, he still held some respect for his family and their image, so he practiced at least a modicum of restraint. Now that's gone and he's been getting worse. He only tried to keep himself tame for our sake, but there's no way he likes it. Mary nodded thoughtfully. Her daughter knew him much better than Mary did. So what changed to make him say this now? He endured before. He's more observant than you think, Vera spoke softly. You think he can't read us just because our faces are like this? Mary was silent. Now that she brought it up, he was the only person who'd been able to consistently tell how either of them felt. Even Elias and Muriel, people who knew her far longer hell. Muriel have known Mary for centuries could not do the same. He's noticed how we are around blood. Gore. Images of what he'd done to those bandits popped up in her mind just then, making her spine chill a bit. So, you're asking why he said that? Because he knows that regardless of his justification, we feel sickened by it. Not to mention all this, she gestured to the throngs of people around them now, all of whom were mid Curtis, which we also find horrid. Like I said, now that he's out on his own and doesn't care about his family's reputation, every time he encounters scum he can't stand he'll just keep killing. As long as we follow him, we'll have to see that, and he'll see our disgust. Mary finished to him it'd be like he was dragging them along, forcing them to watch and participate in such deplorable acts. Maybe he'd even think they'd start to resent him for it, when in reality, they followed him of their own will. He'd never ordered them to stay. And even when he'd told them to help in this latest endeavor he phased it more as asking for a favor. I never asked either of you to put up with me. The words echoed once more. So this is what he meant. I thought he was just irritated by our rejections, she admitted. Or that he believed us here as babysitters. Vera repeated that same hollow laugh. A short and humorless bark. Like the very idea was ridiculous. He wouldn't care about such things. If anything he just takes it as an opportunity to grow closer to us. It's surely what he's thought about this entire journey. No. Rather than dejection at our refusals, he's wondering why the hell we're still here even though he can tell we dislike what he's doing. Because he isn't going to stop. She ran her gaze across the ballroom as they passed, where the orgy bloomed in full. At least not as long as he keeps traveling and meeting people who need killing. Right then, and even earlier. Hungry eyes leered at them. By the time this is over, a lot of men here will be dead too. Vera loved the Damien who could be so overbearing with his care and concern of those important to him. No matter how they fought or cursed at him, like Vera, he would take in in stride and smother them in so much affection. But the merciless, cruel Damien did scare her. Even though she knew with an absolute fact he'd never turn that same violence her way. Watching him maim and kill as easily as biting a nail was haunting. Deep down, 
Below her supposed indifference and casual appearance, she found it utterly chilling. So did her mother, he knew that. So he tried to toe the line, but once someone tried to target either of them, he refused to show that restraint. Here, for example, he could tolerate them staring at her mother. She was a mature woman, with stunning looks and curves bountiful enough to put all others to shame, but they'd given the same ravenous looks to Vera, a young girl that, alone, signed their death warrants. She didn't pity the men. Don't get her wrong, it was only him being able to make the decision to kill so fast that frightened her. If he could be put in an environment where it, it was just him and those he loved, his cruelty would never show its face but reality wasn't so gracious. Vera recalled that sweet mirage shown to her by B. The image of his bare back soaked in sweat as he worked the fields, laughing as their children came out to mess with him. A simple life, surrounded by loved ones. That's the kind of life he wanted, needed, but there were just so many reasons it couldn't be with Vera, and he didn't seem to care about or understand that, he simply thought of them as excuses and he was getting tired of waiting for them to stop. He wasn't exactly telling them to leave, he just wanted them to choose, and if that choice wasn't him, then why stay? It'd be better if they were all just left to their own devices. At first, Damien only started sleeping around to taunt Vera, both punishment and urging. Are you really satisfied watching me fuck other women? He wanted to force her to make a move. To maybe explode and admit she wanted him to stop that she hated seeing him in a constant string of affairs with women who didn't even care about or know him, yeah, that was the original intention, but he was a sex demon, corrupting and dominating women, bringing them to the height of pleasure and reveling in their subsequent adoration, came naturally, the more he indulged, the more he found himself enjoying it, well of course, there was no reason not to, not for a woman content serving a woman she feared and maybe even hated, Watching the man she loves forgive any and all transgressions in the naive belief his wife had any real goodness in her, and certainly not for a girl who was too cowardly to even admit she loved him, who was entirely convinced it wasn't even worth trying to be with him because she couldn't bring herself to believe they had any chance at lasting happiness, maybe that he'd even find someone much better someday and leave her or a thousand other little excuses and fears she used to deny him. That was the other side to it. He was indeed tired of their rejections, but only so far as he was starting to resign himself to the life of a man who already, their continued presence, however, kept him hoping he had a chance at more, something real. All the women he'd met since his incubus powers kicked in only wanted him inside them. And even if he got them fully under control, he'd always wonder, do they really know? or care, about me, or are they just enamored by my aura? Sure, he'd been abnormally attractive since forever, but this time there was something more than pure physical blessings at play. Now there was a magical, supernatural pull. Vera and Mary were among those who'd known him far before that became a factor. If even they couldn't love him, what chance did these other women have? Worse, Vera did love him. He knew that, she just wasn't willing to fight to have him. He knew that, too. It frustrated her so much, her weakness. If she was someone stronger, more confident, she wouldn't need to fear his mother, wouldn't care about making those excuses. She wished she was more like B. That woman didn't seem to fear anything. Even though Muriel had utterly ruined her, before that she was the type of person who wouldn't have bothered to tiptoe around the woman at all just because she was so wildly outclassed. Her first words to Muriel were probably, mother-in-law Tilda, though that was probably how she ended up turned into a horror, now that Vera thought of it. I'm sorry, Mary said quietly, for what? Not being someone important. Mary couldn't look at her daughter, walking with her face forward. If, you had been born to a mother more powerful, of higher status, you wouldn't need to experience something like this. Vera scoffed at that. You think that woman would care how highborn a female is? I could be the daughter of the Phoenix Emperor himself and she'd still have problems with me. No one was good enough for her son. Besides, he was Dolly's in truth. Only a daughter of Okinos was worthy of a son of Okinos. Well, that's because they hate each other. Mary made a pitiful attempt at humor. Vera ignored it. At the end of the day, I'm not sure if the young master is destined for the kind of happiness he imagines for himself. I hope he can find it with someone, 
someday, but I think he'll just have to settle for something a bit lesser, she muttered, by taking on concubines, you mean, concubines, women meant solely to bear his children and therefore increase the dragon population, of course, Dolly would be chief among them all, his true mate and likely his only wife, she simply wasn't sure if Damien could ever actually accept Dolly as a lover, at least in his heart, because his mother would surely find ways for him to accept her body. He'll love his children, and he'll attempt to love their mothers, too. Even if they can't really love him back the same way, Mary said dryly. She'd all but read the thoughts running through her daughter's head a few moments ago. They weren't wrong. How could anyone in his situation not wonder if what they had with someone was real or just a fabrication brought about by supernatural charm? It's just that most in that situation didn't care. Muriel certainly spared it no thought. Perhaps he can pick one he especially likes and choose to believe she does love him. All of this was, obviously, the worst case scenario, but it was also the most realistic the one most likely to actually play out. Tragic though that is. After all, a lesser happiness is better than none at all. Vera wasn't sure if she meant that solely for him, or for her as well. She supposed it didn't matter. Mary shifted uneasily, folding her arms. And where will you be? Vera paused for a moment near the veranda. The moon was a small sliver in the sky, stars blacked out by clouds. Even so, it was beautiful. I've already resolved myself to staying nearby. Be content helping to raise his offspring. It was probably the first time she'd told this to her mother. It was so similar to her own history that they both turned silent. The current situation was already identical, but the future as well? It was too much. For the second time now, the image played out in her mind. The future. They'd be cute and mischievous. His kids, eyes violent and hair dark among them all for she could not or maybe didn't want to imagine what traits their mothers may give them. No, to her they were all little copies of their father, boys and girls alike. Auntie Vera told her, they chirp. She could already tell that even though she'd probably make them cry more often than not with her face being like this, she'd still spoil them as often as she could, giving all the love and affection she couldn't give their father. And just like that, the faces of her own little saplings faded away, replaced tears all of sudden stung at her eyes, can you survive that, Mary asked, blessedly intruding upon her thoughts, it was a cruel question, one that needn't, or shouldn't, have been asked, but she knew the answer, and it was one Vera latched onto with everything she had whenever she asked it herself, you did, without a word more, she continued on her way, she'd go back to the room they'd rented in the city, away from all of this, maybe cuddle with Rex and try to not be haunted by memories of Muriel's hand around her throat, to not hear the whispers of, he isn't for you, with that same cold venom she hissed at Vera all those months ago, as if Vera didn't already repeat those exact words on her own every day since, desperate to accept the truth of them, meanwhile Mary, not for the first time, watched Vera's small, lonely back getting further and further away, she felt like an utter failure as a mother. She'd never wanted her Vera to survive through something like this. All there was is sadness, heartache, and dead hope. She should have sent her away the moment she'd noticed the feelings Vera was growing for him. Should have done something, anything, to keep her safe from loving him. But duty bound her, as did the very blood in their veins. They could never truly escape that family even if they wanted to. What hurt the most was that she can already see something in her daughter starting to wilt. It was the same something that had been burned out of Mary herself so long ago. The woman could only turn, as if peering through the walls, in the direction of the brightly lit room off in the distance. Grow strong fast, young master. Strong enough to overthrow your mother, and fast enough to do so before you put her through more pain than even you could bear. If that meant she had to drag all the world's most prided daughters of heaven and deliver them onto his lap, then so be it. 4. Chapter 15 Way to go, crackhead me, Damien thought as he took a swig of water the next day and recalled what he'd said. Now I'm gonna have to go talk to them and explain so they don't start thinking something stupid. He somehow knew Vera was already coming up with all kinds of misunderstandings. Well, not misunderstandings per se but taking things far too seriously. Vera loves him, 
and her sense of self-esteem when it came to him was abysmal so it's understandable if she overanalyzed every little negative thing he said just in general, though, he did admit his words were pretty dickish, but in any case, you can't put much stock in the words of a dude who's high as balls anyway. Still, it's odd, he is a major dick sometimes, but not like that, he was stoned out of his fucking mind, sure but he could handle his drugs. So why'd he get so pissy? That, dear Watson, was pretty goddamn obvious, and it's because he'd been feeling that way ever since he started fucking around, to his knowledge, sex demons as depicted in a whole bunch of novels he'd read thrived off of the emotional aspect of humanity, fed off their energy, and humans are pretty dang mean, can't deny, easily jealous, petty, prone to anger, Damien, he's like Buddha, he's chill, yo, most of the time, unless you put olives or pickles in his potato salad, then he gets real nasty, seriously, those things just don't go together, the textures, the tastes, Ark ruins the whole thing, but back to the point, it just ain't in him to say something so arsehole white to his favorite trees without due cause, like if they didn't immediately run away from an oncoming fire when he told them to, for example, so he can only surmise he delved a bit too deep into the orgy, can't be helped, he was feeling a whole plethora of wild, orgasmic energies coming from the sex party he'd cooked up, it was entirely impure, laden with dark, violent desires, that's what made it so damn euphoric, sadly, he's pretty sure it's starting to mess with his head a bit, note to self, tape my mouth shut next time, thinking so, he finished his glass and extracted himself from Lanny and Linnea, then carefully tiptoed over the naked bodies of over a dozen young women scattered across the floor, his memories were blurry as hell for the most part, he only recalled feeling their presence outside the room, the women, virgins all, had been attracted to him from far away and came to serve, he had fun deflowering them, chuckling at the memory, he made his way down the hall where even more naked women were scattered, only these ones weren't alone, men accompanied then, he was feeling peckish, so took off in the direction of the kitchen, making himself a BLT, Damien munched out until he passed by the ballroom and noticed something slick under his feet coming from the open doorway, it was dark, sticky, like a spilled wine, he nearly ignored it, but copper finally hit his nose, looking in, his entire face froze, what the fuck, he muttered, across the entire room was an array of severed cocks, that wasn't what confused him, however, rather, it's because he was damn sure this was a different ballroom than what he'd seen the other night, what the cinnamon toast fuck is going on, what do you mean? It's been a full week. Damien met up with Vera at the inn they had set up camp previously only to be met with shocking news. It was only supposed to last a few days. Vera rubbed her eyes drowsily, looking simply adorable. That's what you're focused on? She yawned. Not the fact you publicly executed a third of the local nobility and led the entire city to rob, then burn. Their estates, she frowned. Or that the small, tasteful orgy you were going on about turned into a full blow hundred mile fuck fest? Damien paused. Wow, he said, stunned. I did that? His tone was colored with hints of both surprise and pride. A hundred miles, he whistled, clearly impressed with himself. Vera threw a candle at him. I haven't been able to sleep well in forever thanks to you. I mean it's a hundred mile orgy, V, he emphasized, like, damn. That's amazing right? Amazing? She stared at him as if he'd just said the dumbest thing she'd ever heard. He felt his face drop. He wished B was awake. She'd understand. He glanced up at V. Did anyone bother you? She massaged her temples. Most were too preoccupied with having sex. I holed up in my room and survived off cheese. A thought occurred to him. He cursed. What about the other children in the city? Vera knit her brows. The entire area was under the effect of your power, so the color drained from his face, you just started hunting every pedophile you saw, basically, everyone in the city was under your control by that point, all the drugs plus your weird sex demon powers made quite a combination, so you rallied a third of the orgy goers to hunt them down, cut their cocks up and stuff it into their mouths before rounding them up and executing them, too, she shivered, the scream still haunted her, Damien grunted, but that still means, he shook his head, no, well, 
sick fucks like that would have done it anyway soon or later. At least now they're all dead. How many were there? I'm not sure, I was holed up, remember? I only know this much because you were pretty loud with announcing things. I think there must have been a few hundred thousand? I lost count around there. You kept count? The sound of a guillotine chopping down onto their necks was my lullaby one of the nights. Vera felt a night twitch. Damien didn't notice. Well done, crackhead me. You've redeemed yourself. So, the married women and children? How am I supposed to know? Maybe the women hold up and just masturbated? It's not like people broke indoors. Everyone on the street just started fornicating. I assume couples indoors did, too? Do you, like? think I caused any incest? Almost definitely. I take it back, crackhead me. You done goofed. No what? Not my problem. Damien chose to ignore it. In fact, he blamed the people themselves. If they didn't want to fuck their family members, they'd leave and fuck someone else. Damien didn't fuck his mum when she used her sex demon mojo on him. Why can't other people just say no, too? He nodded to himself. Yep. I'm a dick. I'm going to have to start a support group, aren't I? He sighed. By the way, where's your mother? I don't know, she replied, biting into a fluffy pancake and stuffing it into her mouth with relish. Damien had made it for her before coming up as an apology for being a nerd when he was stoned out of his mind. He noticed a bit of syrup dripping down her mouth and took a handkerchief from a breast pocket to wipe her clean. Vera leaned forward for him, then felt her ears redden and hurriedly backed away wiping her mouth on her own with a napkin. I'm getting too used to this, she thought morosely. It was just so easy to be caught up in his care, but she had to deny it. Damien saw that and flicked her on the forehead. Silly shrub, he chided. What kind of nonsense are you thinking now? Vera felt the sweetness in her mouth turn bitter. She swallowed and gently placed down her fork. I'm the maid here, or I'm supposed to be, and yet here I am letting you fawn over me. I hate it. Damien rolled his eyes. Why? Because it's unprofessional. He smirked. Or because you love it too much and think it's wrong because my crazy bitch of a mother says you're not worthy of her precious baby? As her heart pounded, she stayed silent for a moment. You keep on saying things like that, treating it like a joke. I hate that, too. I hate it so much. For once, his eyes lost all humor. They were flat and dull. You wouldn't have to hate it if you could just have some faith in my ability to not give a fuck what that bitch says. You're scared of her. I'm not. And as long as I'm with you, you don't have to be either. You're only saying that because you still don't realize how evil your mother is. She only ever shows a cute, kind side to you and Dolly. The rest of us don't have such luxury. Damien rubbed the bridge of his nose. I know full well how bad she is, he responded. That's irrelevant. The problem here is you think she'll somehow force me into leaving you even if we did get together. That she'd break us up and make me marry someone else. He laughed. Yeah. You think that because she's so powerful, right? Vera pursed her lips. Young master, you'll be more powerful than her someday. And on that day, you'll have the freedom to be with and do anything you want. But that's far off. So please, stop making this harder for me. He shrugged. Nope. He grinned. That woman isn't a danger to us. Me and Dolly are her weaknesses. She can't stand us hating her. You see, V. We're important to her. You aren't. He stated simply. That means she'd never find you worth killing if it means forever antagonizing me. She might believe I'd get over it in a few years, maybe a few centuries, but I think our stare down that day told her that I can and will carry a grudge for an eternity. He leaned in close. Which means I'm your shield. All you have to do is stay by my side and you'll be safe. Vera looked down. She seemed even smaller just then, like a skittish little mouse. I thought you were getting tired of having to hold back for us, though. His face went blank. Hold back? He felt a tug at his lips. When do I ever really hold back? I've got a tolerance for bullshit, sure, but it's low. What? You thought I was feeling some type of way just because you guys have weak stomachs. He snorted, trying to hold back laughter. See? I knew you'd think too much about it. Look, V, I don't care if you guys don't like blood. I'll keep it to a minimum when I can, but I don't usually just maim and kill when it's unwarranted anyway. If you guys hate it that much, look away. Or throw up. Either way, 
I'll do what I think I should regardless of anyone. I'm not at all resentful of any judgment or feel restrained just because you two dislike me butchering people sometimes. Damien held her gaze. Yes, you can leave me if you really hate it so much, but no matter why you stay with me, as long as you two are under my supervision I won't ever feel you're a burden. I'm stupid. Vera chastised herself, wanting to hide in a hole. I should have known not to think of you as a normal person. Damien let out a full, bellowing laugh at that. So hard his sides hurt. Oh, gods. The fact you did, though. V, when have you ever known me to take things like that to heart? If I did, I'd never have survived all your tongue lashings up to now. Vera felt utterly foolish. Dummy, you actually thought... Why did you ever think about it from the perspective of someone sane? I even told mother all those things, too, acting as if I knew everything. Ah, you idiot. She brought the blanket up over her head. I should have never left that jungle. Coco, you were right. She agonized. Who's that? And what jungle? He thought to himself, utterly unaware of Vera's short stint as a hermit. No one, Vera shouted. Coco was a very nice coconut she'd saved from a gang of giant, mean-looking crabs. They bonded fast, becoming friends immediately. Even though Vera almost hurt her, she was very forgiving and consoled her. Instead, they ate the crabs and cannibalized the other coconuts. Those coconuts bullied Coco, calling her small and ugly so they deserved it. Damien watched her with amusement. So, ready to marry me yet? Vera stopped her shaking and instead turned completely still. She dropped the blanket and looked down at herself, her small, new bar body. Dot even if I let myself believe in you, look at me. The words came heavy, you don't know my kind, we grow normal the first few years, but that's all, I could be stuck like this for decades or longer. You're a sex demon. Depriving you of intercourse for so long would be like killing you. Damien got a headache. Holy fuck you're stubborn. All these little problems, he cursed. Will it actually kill me, then? Well, you aren't a full one, so probably not. So what's the big deal? I don't want to ask you to go through that just for me. She admitted. I give fuck all about that, he stated bluntly. Would it hurt? Yes, very. I can handle it he said confidently. But I hate seeing you in pain. Damien threw up his hands. For fuck's sake, V, he shouted. No what, forget it. I'm just going to keep being a man whore for the rest of my life. Then, she threw him a hateful glance. Why does it have to be that way? Can't you just be happy with someone else? If you really think you can protect them, then find someone who you can love and have children with now. What, and have you on the side watching? Yes she roared. That's what I was planning to do all along anyway. I'm fine with taking care of your children. I'm fine with never being able to have you. What the hell? He glared. V, that's fucked up on so many levels. So? She asked. You want things I can't give you right now. So where does that leave us? Damien flew into a rage. I'm willing to wait for you, but you aren't willing to make me wait. He wanted to pull out his hair at such nonsense. Son of a bitch. What kind of bullshit is this? He needed a drink. Something hard, taking a breath. He calmed himself. Then, he left the room. Vera watched him leave with reddened eyes. She felt sick to her stomach. She thought that was the end of it. That he'd had enough of her. But he came in a few minutes later with a pen and paper. He held it up to a wall, writing furiously. Then he walked over and shoved it into her hands. Sign. He hissed. Vera blinked, looking down. W.H. What is this? A binding contract entitling you to legal status as my first wife. It also gives you the exclusive right to birth my first child. He stood there with obvious impatience, his words coming fast and hot. As for me, it grants the right to freely have sex with other women until you reach physical maturity. After that, I'm yours. So sign it already. Vera looked at him, stunned. What would this even solve? Nothing. He tapped his foot irritably. It just gives me peace of mind. I came to the conclusion that I'm fine with you being unhappy that I'm not happy so what if I'm a slut for a while? So what if you hate that? All I care about is our future. You can stay miserable too, but at the end of the day we're marrying and that's final. Now either you sign that fucker of I'm putting my head in that guillotine myself and hope I reincarnate into a life where my next love interest is a bit more reasonable. 
You're really going to use your life as leverage here? Her mouth fell in disbelief. I told you. I have a low tolerance for bullshit. She looked into his eyes, looking for she didn't know what, but she saw the absolute conviction in them. He meant what he said, without a shadow of a doubt. What about Dolly? She asked quietly. You're going to just leave her? I'm a selfish prick. I never claimed otherwise. She can cry a little and get over it. He hit her with another harsh stare. Are you going to sign? Vera felt trapped. Do I even have a choice? Of course you do. There's just consequences for them. Such is life. She wanted to hit him. You're so unreasonable. We're a match, then. He was entirely unrepentant. You forced my hand. I don't know what else to tell you. Aggrieved, Vera slowly picked up the pen. It was just a bit of paper and ink, but he's willing to go so far for me. Vera, the coward she is, had never been able to get over her insecurities of her position. Her fear of his mother. Her jealousy over Dolly, who could so easily have everything Vera couldn't. Namely, him. Her knuckles were bloodless. Do you even know what I am to you? I'm your blood, too. I'm your sister, too. Just not the right one. But she couldn't bring herself to say any of it. Again, fear clutched at her heart. Damien looked at her curiously. My better half? He answered with a grin. Vera couldn't speak. I really am an idiot. All my fantasies about a life together. And I conveniently ignored what I am. Our relation. It'd sicken him if we did this and he found out later. Would he hate me? Abhor me? Such a disgusting desire, but I still want him. She couldn't hide it forever. She knew that. His mother, at least, would use it against him. The hypocrite. Even though she'd force him to accept Dolly. Vera could sign this now and knew for certainty he'd honor the agreement. All she had to do was write down her name. It was tempting. But I'm your sister. She couldn't do it to him. Come again? Damien froze. Sure he'd misheard. Vera saw that expression on his face and felt something break. Me and Baz. Our mother used samples of your father to make us. Her lips felt numb. Her words barely above a whisper. They had a long history, and she eventually fell for him. But he met your mother, and there was no point competing with her. So when you were born, it almost destroyed her. She knew she had to give birth to another. Someone to serve you. The words spilled from her mouth unceasingly. She could have done it on her own, without anyone, but she chose to include your father. She wanted at least that to bear his child even if it meant going against his and her back. That's how Baz was born, and then, with Dolly's birth, came me. Damien felt his blood run cold. For the first time in his life, he was speechless. Vera felt the tears run hot down her cheeks. I'd always known who I was to you, you know. My mother passed down those memories to me. All of them. Her whole life. It's why I was more mature than other children my age. She chose me for that. But I was still so young. I couldn't make sense of it all. It hurt sometimes. As an infant, it was hell. But you grew fast, enough to hold and soothe me. You made all the pain and heartache go away. Then Dolly grew attached to you and stole all your attention. I couldn't even complain because it wasn't my right. Then you started trusting me to do things because you knew I could do them. You didn't treat me like a child anymore, like someone who needed you. She bit her lip painfully, the only thing keeping her from breaking down into sobs. So I started a acting up. I thought it'd make you and notice me again. She clenched her teeth, and it worked. But then you began to look at me like I was annoying and troublesome. But even that was better than nothing. So Damien hugged her tightly, warmly, like he never wanted to let her go, and she stopped, Vera broke down, I was your sister, too, she cried, I wanted you, T2, but she didn't let you, Damien finished, there's no way his mother didn't know, no way she, with her personality, would tolerate Vera acting like a sister to him, it made her hate the woman even more, Damien stayed like that for a long time, holding her, comforting her, until her tears and snot ran dry and she just stayed quiet in his arms, sniffling occasionally, better? he asked after a while, she nodded against his chest, good, then, sign, Vera shook her head, N no, Vera, he sighed, no, she refused. You're only saying that to prove a point. Act like it doesn't matter to you. But Damien kissed her. A soft, light meeting of the lips, but deep, like she were precious. Because she was. Vera melted for him. But as soon as it was finished, 
She looked away. You can't mean that. Don't tell me what I mean. Damien ran a hand through his hair. Fuck. Even I'm not sure what I mean by that right now. All I know is that you love me, and I'm not ready to give that up. Damien looked at her. She seemed more innocent and vulnerable than he'd ever seen her. He knew that whatever he said next, after all he already had, could save or destroy her. He viciously kicked all doubts into the ether. Fuck it, he growled. You're only my half-sister anyway. And took her lips. She was so soft and warm, like flower petals. He wanted to savor her deep. To ravish every inch of her sweet mouth. But though their biological and mental ages paired well, their physical ages were so different. His body matched his real, mental age. But hers didn't. So he held back. Much as he wanted to make her forget about all this pain she held inside, he couldn't, not now. Sign, he whispered into her ear, not taking no for an answer. Now, Vera shivered, that low, sexy voice, for the first time, she understood what the women around him felt. Although her youthful body wasn't under his spell, she still could recognize his attraction. He carried such power and comfort in his arms. It was hard to deny him anything. She didn't want to, either. Wordlessly, she wrote her name on the paper before her with mixed, complicated feelings. Damien folded it carefully and put it away. He wasn't sure how to confront her anymore with the knowledge he currently held. But it was too late to back down now. And he didn't care to, thinking about it more. This isn't even my body. I'm just the guy who's taking it for a ride. I won't regret this. He assured her cupping her cheek affectionately. Vera felt heat prick at her eyes yet again. For the first time, she was honest with her feelings. Even if you do, please don't stop loving me. He could only smile wryly, as if that was even a possibility at this point. He suddenly remembered something. Wait, what did you say about your mother? Ah, Vera exclaimed. Well, she left. He stood bolt upright. The fuck you mean? She left. Six. Chapter 16 Damien sat upon a simple throne set within the former city lord's mansion. He let out to yawn. Having just gotten done with audiences with newly appointed ministers and other officers who replaced the executed nobles who previously held positions of power within Valon. Originally, it should be Linnea taking care of this as the wife of the city lord. Of course, officially that was also the case, but it was just pretense and everyone went to him for orders as did all the paperwork, it was the least he could do, right? Take responsibility for his chaos, at least for a while. Anyway, first, he'd taken all the surplus wealth the city lord had gained from his years of corruption and directed it towards Valen's infrastructure. For example, several schools had fallen into disrepair under Evid's rule in favor of funding military power, which would have been fine in more recent months, but this had gone on for the last decade or so maybe longer, during times of peace. He should have been building up the quality of his city's inhabitants. In time, he'd be paid back for it as a new generation of competent citizens came into play. Poverty would have gone down as higher education gave more options to the young citizens both within and without the city. There'd have been a better sense of discipline and virtue, too. Overall, the quality of life would improve with a more educated populace. A failing school system was the first sign of a falling society. The fact those who lead nations seem to so often forget that fact always baffled Damien. So he took the time to fix that here while he had the opportunity. Next, he took the pillaged valuables taken from the other corrupt nobles and started having the roads fixed. There were way too many potholes for his liking in this damn place. He wasn't about to have people break a damn leg just because Evard couldn't be bothered to fill in a fucking hole. Thirdly, Damien started building public bathhouses. A lot of people in Valen didn't have things like a shower or a proper bath. They just used buckets of water and pieces of cloth with some soap. They wiped themselves down, then threw in the gutters outside. Not all cities had indoor plumbing and Valen was one that went without. Damien had Linnea, who was now the highest ranking authority since he deposed her husband, sign off on the construction of pipes to bring water to the citizens' homes. But there were other things going on right now and such a task would take several years to complete anyway so that was going to start sometime later. For now, the bathhouses would be a quicker alternative. 
they would hollow out some of the mansions owned by the previously executed nobles and use the plumbing they held. The baths would be enlarged and there's be showers installed too. Damien, of course, would allow some profit to be made by charging a small fee and a higher fee if one wanted to bath in separate rooms where brass tubs would be placed. Of course, they provide food and drink at an additional cost. Well, in any case it was a good thing. Luxuries would come at a cost but it did improve hygiene regardless and would be a nice way for the city to earn a profit since they'd be made from converted nobler states. The cost would also be minimal compared to building them from scratch. Finally, he had a few support groups set up. Incest really had become a problem in the wake of his orgy. The families holed up in their homes had, well, Let's just say love that transcended familial bonds had bloomed. Other people who get reincarnated into fantasy worlds wind up as heroes and have fun adventures with happy-go-lucky teammates. Even the ones who become villainesses or mob characters from some story or game just end up overturning flags and building harems. So why the fuck am I sitting here having to deal with affairs of state? He quietly simmered with annoyance feeling the whole situation was entirely unfair. Honestly, what had he done to deserve this? And I don't even have a single goddamn cheat. He sighed yet again, lamenting his misfortune. I miss B. She gave the best head for whenever I was feeling down. Damien idly fingered the crystalline object in his hand. It was something he'd taken from that cast as woman, Hannah, some time ago. Apparently, it was an egg of some sort something her father and others searched for with great interest, but Damien had no idea why. Well, neither did he care. All he knew was that it had been something B's ring had reacted to once, which is why he took it. He thought it the key to waking her, but he didn't know how. Looking into its depths, there was a vague figure. The shell encased around it was a soft, semi-translucent white when he'd first found it. Now it was starting to turn black on one side, with bits of red. Meanwhile, the other half started growing beads of blue. He wasn't sure what that meant. As he lost himself in his thoughts staring into it, Vera, who stood at his side, took a curious glance. Where on earth did you find a devil embryo? She blinked. Startled, he asked. You know what this is? The girl nodded. I've never seen one, but mother has. I have her memories, remember? That's definitely a devil embryo. Damien gaped at her. Fucking hell. I forgot all about that. Damien had been pretty lazy in asking Mary about the thing when she was with him. It just slipped his mind. It wasn't surprising considering they were being chased. Then he got busy planning the orgy. So when Mary suddenly left, he thought he'd missed his chance. It was only now that he realized he could have asked Vera instead. Things had been so emotional that day, though. He forgot all about that little tidbit of information. Too focused trying to wrap his head around the fact she was his half-sister, he supposed. Speaking of, Damien had given up the idea of searching for Mary pretty quick. He had no idea where she'd gone. For one, and even if he did know she had a wide head start, not that it would have stopped him, but he figured she had her reasons. And besides, he trusted she'd be safe. He didn't know what combat skills she had but at the very least she had the ability to escape at the first sign of danger. The only one with the power to restrict the woman was his mother, and she was nowhere around. What's it do? He asked excitedly. I heard it being called an egg. Does it hatch a devil? Vera was caught off guard by his fervor, wondering why he was so animated all of a sudden. Well, she responded after a beat, yes, it's usually something they use to revive themselves in cases of death, though. They're very rare since only higher devils can form them and the process is incredibly difficult, not to mention draining. They could end up losing half their vitality and power, maybe more, so few are willing to do it. And even if a devil creates one as insurance thinking they were going to die somehow, they'd need immense levels of power to hatch. So it's really a gamble. The presence of devils here isn't great either. Hence there's not really anyone to even attempt hatching the embryo for whichever devil this belongs to. She shrugged, then paused, thinking aloud, if there's any devil with a fair chance of having their embryo hatched in a world like this, it'd be. Vera trailed off with a frown. She stared at the embryo intently for a moment, then shook her head. No, it wouldn't be him. Damien rolled his eyes, 
Don't start with the pronoun game, V. Who are you thinking of? The young girl seemed troubled as she spoke the name. Balthazar. Damien gave a blank look. The fuck kinda goofy ass name is that? He scoffed. Sounds like some try-hard D&D character. Vera glared. It's the name of an ancient devil god who once nearly conquered all the thousand world. Never heard of him, Damien replied. Yes, well, he was far before even your mother's time so it's not surprising. Plus, only glimmers of his influence exist here in the form of cultists. Ha, huh, Damien grunted, unimpressed. So, why do you think it wouldn't be his? It just doesn't make sense for it to be. That's why, it must belong to some other devil who was passing through and met their end. Maybe they pissed off your mother one day. Who knows? And in any case, this isn't a pure devil embryo either. There are other energies mixed in. Otherwise, it'd be a solid black. Damien rubbed his chin in consideration. Dot B was a human. It shouldn't have anything to do with her. He looked up at Vera. Could a human learn how to create one themselves? Vera folded her arms, thinking, maybe. I couldn't really say, mother never encountered a situation where they have, but there's a few similar methods that result in essentially the same thing, why, did B react to it, yeah, it's why I took it to begin with, found it in that auction house, the Carstairs woman and her posse were sent after it, I see, at least that establishes there's a connection between it and B, but how is another question, she pondered, did she ever say anything about her human life, A? Not really, we mainly just fucked. She was he stopped. She was what? Damien cleared his throat. Well, there's a reason we got along so easily. I suppose given all the talk about other worlds, this won't surprise you much, but actually, B originally came from a different world herself. A long time ago, she fell into a portal that brought her here. Yes, okay. And what's that have to do with your easy relationship? Vera looked at him with growing suspicion. Ah, it's that we coincidentally came from the same world, her and I. So, he gave an awkward smile. Vera's mind blanked. I'm sorry, what? I mean, you had to think it was strange how I'd sometimes make weird references or inside jokes with her, right? He led on patiently. Yes, but she stopped. And all at once. Things fell into place. Oh. Her lips felt numb. For the first time in forever, she looked at him as if at a stranger. Not because this changed anything between them, but because she realized, now, that what she knew about him was probably only a fraction of what she thought she did. So you were. The girl trailed off. Damien cocked his head, feeling something off with her demeanor just now. Vera was silent for a moment. She closed her eyes for a moment, asking, which one were you? Her voice was quiet, almost too quiet, with an odd tone mixed in, almost as if in trepidation. Which what? He frowned, not understanding her question. I mean, which god were you? She gulped, fearing the mere utterance of the words. Damien rolled his eyes. The fuck? V. I'm not a god. The hell are you talking about? I was just a regular dude. What nonsense are you spouting? He promptly flicked her forehead. Ah, she cried softly, cradling her new wound tenderly. What was that for? Being dumb, he replied with a snort. Why are you saying such idiotic things? If I were a god, trust me, I wouldn't be hiding it. But, you were birthed from Muriel's womb, a natural born. You'd need to have passed through the under for that, and the only beings who can do that without their memories being wiped are gods. So, Damien laughed in her face. V, come on. That makes literally zero sense. I'd have already beat my mother's ass if that were the case. What would I even be the god of? Amazing orgasms. Drugs? I don't have any memories of being one, either. Or what? You think I'm gonna lie about that? I suppose not, she admitted. Damien wasn't the kind of person to lie about something like that. But then how? Damien's played his hands helplessly. Hell if I know, but where I come from. There's all kinds of fictions with premises like these and it's almost never explained in those stories either, does it matter? At that, a thought occurred to her, did you have a family in your past life, too? He grinned, yup. I had quite a few brothers and a sister, but I was a pretty useless bastard towards the end and got ran over by a, well, I guess you could call it a metal carriage. A shame, I was just starting to get off my ass, 
too. Ah well, I doubt I was missed much. Vera took in his casual, unconcerned air with horror. How can you say something like that with a straight face? Damien raised a brow. Well, what else am I supposed to do? Cry. Maddox men don't do that. We drown our sorrows in alcohol and women, he said, as if reciting some line. But you do that every day. So? He blanked again. What's your point? Sometimes it's just for fun, alright? Every day? I don't have a problem, he deadpanned. You do? Vera grit her teeth. There you go again. Why can't you just be serious for once? V, before I got here I remember entering purgatory, having my soul literally torn to shreds, and then being scattered into the ether, with every single piece fully aware and screaming out in agony. He drolled. I'm not sane enough to give a fuck about such small things like losing everyone and everything I'd ever loved anymore. Damien calmly folded his arms. I've wandered the fields of fuckery. V, it's barren. I have looked high. I have looked low, I have looked here, I have looked there, but I couldn't find a fuck to give anywhere. Bastardizing a certain Dr. Seuss quote, he made it clear that he really couldn't care less. Or maybe that he simply wasn't able to attach any emotion to that personal trauma anymore. Vera felt her throat tighten at the thought. Everything he'd just said to her left a feeling of deep unease. He talked about such unimaginable horrors like they were nothing. A person's soul was the rawest most sensitive part of themselves, anything capable of harming it would be pain unlike anything physical torture could even come close to, much less, something like having it ripped apart, she was scared about what that might mean for his psyche, to even think about it was utterly terrifying, young master, her words were deathly quiet as if spoken from far away, something like that, it's not something any being other than a god would be able to come out of hole. Hole is a strong word. Damien rubbed the bridge of his nose. But okay. Yeah, sure, whatever. Let's call me the god of lollipops and sunshine, then. He chuckled. Happy now? Jesus Christ. This is just some shitty game world from that dumb love orgy series anyway. He thought so what if my entrance was a bit hairier than other protagonists of my ilk? Damien furrowed his brows at the thought. Actually, yeah, why the fuck was it so damn hard? See, it's not fair, one of these godly cunts owes me an explanation. I mean what kind of bias is this? Honestly, he gestured vaguely. Anyway, forget it, why did you ask that about B? Vera opened her mouth, not wanting to just gloss over the bombs he'd just dropped but she could tell he'd had enough and wouldn't bother to continue even if she kept asking. It's just that sometimes there's people who encounter certain events. The human body is very adaptable, you know, though not naturally powerful. In very rare cases they can absorb certain traits of other races. The beastkin were similar in ages past. They were human too, but during a terrible war, Mages performed cruel experiments to create a race of powerful battle slaves to use against their enemies. B might have been one of the more lucky ones. It's not impossible for her to have become a chimera of some sort after coming into contact with the blood of another race. For example, a devil. The odds of her not dying were a billion to one, but it was still a possibility. Damien grasped her meaning immediately. You think maybe she had formed her own embryo sometime in the past? She nodded. It's not probably, but certainly possible. But she didn't seem like a devil. Devils don't become what she had after death. Even V isn't sure what happens to them once they die, but B had become a kind of evil spirit. She must have suffered greatly in her last moments and then left to fester until she had become a tainted soul. That's how she would have stayed, too, if Damien didn't cleanse her. In any case, Vera wasn't sure exactly what kind of being B had been while alive. A chimera with the blood of a high-class devil was the closest she could figure. One who'd formed an embryo but had never gotten revived. But then why hadn't she mentioned it to Damien at all? Surely she'd grasp at the chance, even if the power acquired was so astronomical. Did she not want to bother him to look for it? Or think he'd never be able to gather the power needed even if he did somehow track the embryo down? Or perhaps it didn't matter to her. After all, Damien was able to physically touch her to the extent they were even able to have sex. Maybe she just preferred being a spirit. So many questions. They made her head ache. Together with Damien's reveal regarding his past life, she couldn't bring herself to think too deeply about anything just yet. 
She needed time to process. Damien eyed the embryo with renewed interest. Do you think if we hatch this, she'd come back? Vera wasn't sure. Possibly. Her soul is in that ring, and it's not like reincarnation so she wouldn't lose her memories from passing through the under. It's just that devils aren't like other beings. It could mess with her head, change her. You don't know how much influence a physical body has over your personality. Some are just prone towards malice, though this isn't a pure umbrip. It's birth a pure devil. Maybe she'd be even more unbinged due to its impurity, too. You mean, she might come back a sadist? He shuddered, then considered once more. Actually, that sounds kinda hot. I'm not against chains and whips. Cock and bull torture was out of the question. Cues that shit's just weird. But other than that he was fine. Esteeth and Shigo were pretty sexy. He can't deny. Your first thought is how she'd change in bed. Of course it is. Vera's head throbbed painfully. I swear he's a walking migraine. But, yes. I guess she could end up being crueler than she was. To what extent? It's anyone's guess. What are we looking at here? Paint me a picture. She could either steal candy from children for fun or come back thinking gauging out someone's eyes for looking at her funny is perfectly alright and just. My mother. Then. He cursed. Dix. Damien sunk down in the throne. Do you think she'd still joke around with me and stuff? He looked at Vera hopefully. Dot yes. Vera glanced away. That gaze. It was too innocent. She didn't have the heart to tell him the truth. Did devils even have a sense of humor? All right, then. He broke out into a smile. So, how do we hatch her? Oh, it's nothing too hard since it's you. Just eat it. Damien's smile froze. What? Eat it? She repeated. You're a dragon who hasn't condensed his second core yet. Eat it, and the embryo will take its place for now. It'll devour all your surplus energy until it's time to hatch. What do you mean, surplus energy? The Okinos family are the origin of all mana throughout the known universe. Your body creates it constantly and releases it into the air. It's nothing too amazing right now since your second core is what's supposed to house and further refine that leaking energy. But once you form it after condensing your dragon essence, you'll be a lot more powerful. My dragon what now? He demanded. Why didn't I know about this sooner? You would have known if you'd let your mother teach you, she said. And what would be the point of me telling you? I don't know how to do it. Only another dragon could teach you. Ah, whatever. I don't really care, to be honest. I'm getting along fine so far anyway. I don't need her, he sniffed. Eat it, you said? Confirming her words, Damien wasted no time in popping it into the air and catching it in his mouth. It went down hard, but he gave a mighty gulp and swallowed it whole. <clears throat> Spicy. Damien rose from his seat. How long do you think it'd take? Don't know. Helpful, that. He snorted. Come on. Then, let's go. I'm done being responsible. Time to get going. Rex. Damien called. A few beats later, the newest member of his family waddled over from a corner in the room. In his mouth was a piece of hemlock that was being munched on. Damien's eyes glittered. Holy hell. You've become such a chonky bastard, Damien exclaimed after picking him up had been feeding the animal all kinds of poisonous plants. In turn, it's gained about 10 pounds or near enough. Not just that, but its hair became even more soft and glossy as well. In response, the little fatty gave a lazy, half-hearted hiss to show his discontent, as if to say, this whole operation was your idea. And he'd be right. Damien loved fat cats. So large and round, like the world's most comfortable pillow. And they came with a built-in lullaby. Damien sat the purple furred chunk of lard on the ground and started rubbing under his chin. His other hand rubbing its wide belly. In response, Rex let out a series of loud, soothing purrs and began to playfully bite at his fingers. This is better than cocaine, Damien thought with joy. Meanwhile, Vera stared pointedly at his goofy little grin. Cute. They both continued to lose themselves in each's target of attention for a full five minutes before Damien finally picked Rex up by his armpits and placed him on his shoulder. The big ball of fur hung there all stretched out as if hanging off the edge of a comfortable bed. To Reykjavik, to her surprise, he shook his head. Actually, we're making a little detour. I can't be the only one having fun, now can I? It's time to bring in the boys. 6. Chapter 17. 
I can't believe you took them. Vera shook her head in disbelief. The mother-daughter pair hung on Damien's arms in quiet delight. Vera felt a night twitch in annoyance just seeing them. I can't believe you thought I'd leave them, Damien replied. You don't find such exceptional women so often, you know. She's married, Vera reminded dryly. Already fucked her, Damien shrugged, as if to say the rice had already been cooked. And her husband is a cunt anyway. She's also got responsibilities to the city. Vera reminded, especially since her husband was forcibly deposed. Someone else can step in. Her sons. Most likely. She eyed the younger woman of the two and cocked a brow. Don't even the daughter? I couldn't bring myself to separate a mother and child, but you can separate father and daughter, husband and wife, mother and sons. Damien helped them onto the vehicle. Refer back to my previous statement of the man being a cunt. And grown men should learn to live without their mothers anyway. Vera could only sigh. Do you two understand what you're about to do? She saw the futility in the conversation and switched tactics, finally addressing the women in question. Linnea smiled. It's irresponsible and reckless, she admitted, but I've lived all my life adhering to duties I never asked for and married a man who I now know allowed all manner of crookedness to infest the city in which we raised our children. She looked at her new lover. I've no desire to deal with his mess, as for my children, I will miss them terribly but they hadn't needed me in years if I'm truthful. So I think I'll do as I please for the time being. Her eyes sparkled like jewels. Vera knew that look by now. She was utterly smitten by the young master, wasn't she? Well, it's not as if girls ever needed the influence of supernatural sex demon energy to want him. The young master's body matured very fast recently, but he was a rather persuasive bastard since long ago. A face like his. Women softened. Humans were weak to beauty, and who could possess more than a dragon with succubus royalty in his veins? But still, Linnea has an excuse. Yet what of the ones before her? Perverts, every one. She was suddenly reminded of Lord Avery's wife, Lady Bridget. Now that was a woman with no shame if ever there was one. As for me, I want to study him, Lanny cut in cheerfully. Whenever I'm with him, all I want to do is bury his face between my legs. It's fascinating. Her eyes glowed. Even now, my undergarments are moist with anticipation. Is that not unnatural? I've met many handsome men before but I'd never been so overcome with a desire to breed. Something about him simply makes women want to become naughty. It's worth a thorough study. Vera cast a baleful eye at her. Such a noble cause would be more convincing if you weren't running your hand along his crotch. She snorted. Aren't you just a bitch in heat? Lanny looked down in surprise and caught herself. She quickly removed her hand and bowed her head. I didn't even realize. A moment later the glow returned. In heat that may be a thought worth pursuing. She stroked her chin thoughtfully. The woman cast a sideways glance. Mother, have you experienced any loss of appetite lately? Before the woman could respond, Damien rolled his eyes and spoke up. I know what you're thinking, but humans don't experience stress. Yes, but that's not what I'm getting at. I simply want to know if you're affecting our menstrual cycle. It varies between women, but there are times during our cycles where we experience increased sexual arousal. You think I'm putting you in a constant state of ovulation? He asked. Well, perhaps. Sex drive and ovulation do have a connection but they aren't mutually exclusive. It's more likely you're affecting our hormones. Whether or not you are making us more fertile, though, I won't know without further study. But well, mother is still very youthful so using her as a test subject wouldn't be ideal. Test subject? Her mother wrecked out. She's still quite fertile, you see. Lanny plowed on. Since they were still sexually active, father might have simply had weak seed. He isn't too old, so you think he would have been able to foster another child or two? No? Unless he got some mistresses pregnant we don't know of, she rambled. Regardless, we should look for a group of women of 40 to 50 and see how long it takes you to him. All of a sudden Lanny had her mouth invaded. Tongue met tongue in a hot, slick mess. She tasted hints of vanilla. Sweet and sensual. A minute late, when she was finally released, she blinked. I, I just lost my train of thought. 
she looked devastated by the fact. What was I saying again? Damien ignored the question. Why the hell did she sound so similar to a certain other woman he knew? All this talk of research. I'm only going to say this once. He stared at her sternly. Stay away from my bone marrow. Lanny, whose eyes were previously muddled with confusion and regret, gained new radiance yet again. That actually, no. But, so help me, I will turn this damn carriage around. His nostrils flared. The woman had the nerve to click her tongue at him. Fine, she replied sulkily. A steady supply of your semen should be sufficient. She'll win him over slowly, Lanny decided. See? Compromises are fun. Damien smiled and rubbed her head. Good girl. Vera used the armrest and propped her head up, turning her gaze to the window. Careful with that one, she warned mildly. Lanny HMPH'd in displeasure at her words, refusing to comment. Then something caught her ear, causing her to open the back window. Who? She muttered, looking at a lone horseman steadily catching up to them. She strained her ears and a faint sound of galloping reached her. Stop the carriage. Damien didn't ask, simply ordering the driver to pull off to the side. A few moments later, they all heard what had caused her to react as she did. From behind, a familiar face atop horseback came into view. He stopped a dozen paces away. For a moment, he simply stared at them. Then, he climbed down and began to approach. Damien was the first of them to move. He opened the carriage door and stepped out. Son, he greeted warmly. He opened his arms wide, ready to embrace the man. Damien thought he'd come to join them. In which case, he'd be like a stepson to him. Naturally. Damien would treat him well. Abram didn't even stop to pause as he threw out a solid punch to the younger man's chin. Damien magnanimously allowed the hit to connect, taking the blossoming pain with grace. He was then forgotten as Linnea and Lanny stepped out. They closed in awkwardly, unsure of how to face him. Ever since that first night, they'd rarely seen him. He hadn't taken Damien's sudden rise to influence well. Not that they blamed him but overall. The results spoke for themselves. Damien had uprooted decades worth of corruption from top to bottom. It was a cleansing of their city that no other in its history had the boldness to implement. The way it came about and his collateral damages aside, a great many evils had been righted and the policies he introduced would not just stabilize, but strengthen, Valen for years to come. But that didn't matter to him. To his eyes, Damien had turned his entire family on their heads. And that, was indeed the case. Linnea was not blind to the situation. She'd fallen at the first sign of temptation, had forgotten her vows in the first minute of Damien's appearance. Much worse was that she'd shared a man with her own daughter, one of the gravest of sins she, as a mother, could commit. It was shameful and vile. Who in their right mind would be unaffected seeing their mother and sister in an entanglement over the same man? She couldn't imagine what everyone must think of her. Much less Abram. Among all her children, he was the one who cared for and cherished her the most. Yet now, he looked at her with none of the affection and respect she had come to know. It made her throat close up just seeing it. Mother, he greeted. His gaze flickered to his sister, Lanny. The words were clipped and his voice was distant, lukewarm, almost as if talking to a pair of strangers. He stood there rigidly like a stone statue. A hand rested on the rounded pommel of the sword at his side, clutching it tight. Thomas sends his regards, again, that cool tone. If you even give a fuck anymore. And that was it. Despite the man's outward appearance, those short few words were filled with such raw resentment. Neither his mother nor his sister had ever heard him speak with so much emotion, so much vindication. Abe Lanny started, reaching out her arm. Unlike her and Thomas, she and Abe had always been close. Never had there been a time where he had anything but pride in his voice when speaking of her, or love in his eyes upon seeing her. Even when she was young and mischievous, annoying and angering him at some prank gone wrong, it had only ever taken a pout and a hug to earn forgiveness. Now, he stepped back, avoiding her touch. Son, I don't. He cut her off. I didn't come to hear anything you two have to say. He spoke with cold viciousness. I only want to make one thing clear. He started, his voice going low and harsh. If you leave with him now, don't expect to be welcomed back. Ever the word was spat with a wicked edge. The force of such a statement left Linnea standing there in shock. Her scalp tingled, 
dread running a cold finger down her spine. Finally, you can't mean that, her lips felt numb. We're your family. We words deserted her. Abram didn't care for any of her turmoil. Family? He let out a hollow laugh. Are you joking? The mother and sister I knew wouldn't just abandon their loved ones to be with some bastard who barged into our lives and bring absolute anarchy. He shook his head, wouldn't have let some boy have his way with them like a couple of lowly lust driven wh all of a sudden his eyes rolled back into his and he started to collapse. Yeah, enough of that. Damien caught the man and quickly put him over his shoulder. Abe. Lanny spluttered in concern as he started walking off. What are you doing? Linnea cried out. He answered while placing the unconscious male into the carriage. I'm kidnapping him, obviously, thinking he'd probably resist upon waking. He also grabbed some rope. I can't separate a mother and child after all. On second thought, he continued. If he's going to make some bullshit ultimatum like that, it's better to bring him along so you guys can work this out. I mean, you two looked like you were about to burst out in tears and I can't stand to see my women sad. So, he comes with. He walked back out of the carriage and headed towards Abe's vacant horse. We're going to need another carriage and extra rations. Driver, turn her around, he called out in order. I hope that Thomas fellow will come along without a fuss. He seemed all right, he thought aloud. With that, he trotted back up the road. Linnea looked from her unconscious son to the retreating back of her lover. Her mouth opened and closed a few times, clearly at a loss. Eventually, she turned a pair of slightly dazed eyes toward Vera and asked, Wah, what just happened? Vera gave her one little pat on the back. What happened? She replied lightly, Is you just met the young master, your majesty? How have you been? Lucius couldn't read the first sentence without a wave of annoyance sprouting to life. After the disdain he showed me the last time, he has the nerve to speak so flippantly. Lucius shook his head. Dang brat. Lucius nearly wanted to rip the paper up, but knew it must be important after so the kid had gone dark for so long. As such, he read on. So, I have a favor to ask. Annoying. So annoying. Now he wants a favor, after calling me a coward last time we met. Ah, hell, he felt a headache coming. He pressed on. You're probably going to be getting a report on it soon, so I won't bore you with too many details, but it'd be great if you could send a new city lord to Valen as soon as you read this. Anyway, say hi to Charlotte and Alex for me. Sincerely, Damien. The contents of the letter made utterly no sense. Valen? Why is he bringing that place up for? And a new city lord? Ridiculous. He stared at the piece of parchment for several long minutes, trying to understand. He ran the letter over a candle, expecting more words to appear. It didn't. A cipher? He scanned it again and again, looking for any abnormality at all. Turning it over, reading it backwards, up down, down up, diagonal. Casting every decryption spell in his repertoire. Nothing. Now completely sure there was no more to the letter, he was even more confused. Slumping down on his chair after a good two hours of effort, he had to admit defeat. A hint of unease coiled around his stomach. What the hell did that kid do? A few days later, he knew. Lucius quietly put down a thick stack of papers that had arrived by courier the night before. Standing, he opened the doors to the balcony and breathed in the cold, crisp morning air. A serene smile was plastered across his face. Fuck my life. They're trying to drive me insane. 2. Chapter 18 Next. I always knew you were a few cards short of a deck. Claybrook will wipe the mead from his lips. But you know what? That's your best feature. For the last hour, Damien had regaled the youth with stories of his adventures during their time apart. From the time he was sent to Bormister, his meeting of Bee the Sexy Ghost, his mother turning her into an eldritch horror beyond his understanding that could have laid waste to the entire kingdom, how he disowned his parents and started a citywide orgy by using too many drugs and letting his latent sex demon powers run amok and how he was planning to settle down in Reykjavik for a while and wanted Will to tag along because he missed having male friends around to do dumb shit with. So fuck it. I'm in. He downed the last of his drink. Better than staying here waiting to get drafted. Right, Phil. He nudged the boy next to him. As one of Damien's few friends, he had been picked up by Will on their way here. 
he didn't even have time to change out of his work outfit, a dark colored uniform with a Claybrook family crest stitched into the collar. The boy gave a shaky laugh. Really wouldn't like that. Yeah. Damien grinned. Right? A pretty boy like you, you'd never make it in the war. Might chip a nail. Got some nerve calling him the pretty boy, Will snorted, then looked his friend up and down. Though maybe it holds true now. He shook his head in wonder. Seriously? How did you change so much? You're like a full head taller than me or more. The fuck you been eating? Pussy. Damien responded mildly. It does wonders really kicks the hormones into overdrive, I was due for a growth spurt anyway, growth spurt, my ass, you know, you're the one who should be worried about getting drafted, your prime recruitment material now, and your prime rent boy material, you get drafted, your ass is going straight to the brothels, in times of war, the militaries of numerous nations would send units of prostitutes that followed the army and provided stress relief to the battle-weary soldiers. Being a war prostitute was undoubtedly the worst occupation a woman hell, even a man could be sent to. In spite of that some whores volunteered in a misguided sense of patriotism, others for the high pay, and then the rest were criminals who got sent to serve out their sentence under the cocks of men at war. There were tears. Too. Some of the younger, more beautiful or skilled whores were reserved for officers and didn't experience much change in their daily lives. The lower tiered hoories, however, had it pretty rough. Depending on the size of the brothel sent with the army, each prostitute would have to serve 200 to 600 men a month or they wouldn't receive their pay. They often died of disease and were left on the side of the road unless some kind soul paid for them to be returned home, if they had won, or buried or put on a pyre at the least. But anyway let's do the calculations, to put into perspective what 600 men a month is, that's 20 men a day, or, on average, 714 inches of cock a week. Friends, that is over 2000 inches of cock per month. Even in the best scenario, it's still over 800 inches of cock a month. Damien informed the other two as much and the boys visibly shook trying to shake the disturbing images that popped into their heads at the unasked for information. I really didn't need to know that, Phil looked sick. I think I'm going to throw up, well we'd best get going before that happens. Then, Will moved a bit away from him, giving him a warning stare. Damien smiled and rose from his seat. He stared down at his old friend's handsome face and offered him his hand. Run away with me, he said voice rich and husky. Why the fuck do you have to say it like that? Will groaned, ignoring the hand and standing on his own. Come on, creep. Let's hit the road before Phil spills his guts all over my new boots. With that, the three departed and wandered the streets a bit until they came nearer the southern side of the city where a small port made its home. As they walked, Philip suddenly called out in a hushed tone. Hey, Will, is it just me, or? No. I noticed too, he replied before the boy could finish. Did we? Do something? They keep staring at us. Phil pulled at his collar nervously. Will glanced about, taking note of the strange gazes coming their way, specifically from women. After a moment, he slowly opened his mouth. I don't think us is the word to use here. Seeing Will's slightly grim set face, Phil went quiet. He never interacted much with Will but he knew the boy wasn't easily shaken. Feelings mildly disturbed, he looked ahead at young Master Damien and then to the surrounding women. Recalling Will's words just now, he realized what he meant. It isn't they, as a group, the women were focused on. It was him, Damien, specifically. Now, Phil was used to girls giving his young master second looks. This, this was different. Like, every woman they passed was utterly transfixed, and as they walked, he saw that things only grew stranger. Even if they were locked in the arms of their partners, the women would stop and stare with open desire upon their faces, they'd take opportunities to brush against him whenever possible, or if he stopped to look at some bauble that had caught his eye there would be a lady who would lean in and take a whiff of him as if he was something tasty. Will, for his part, spotted several who had even slightly closed their legs and folded their hands near their crotches. This wasn't just about being blessed with abnormal good looks, this was something else entirely and neither of the two were sure what, exactly, that meant. It was unsettling. With their teeth on edge, 
They soon saw a pretty green-haired young girl come into view. More than pretty. Actually, Vera was among the most attractive people Will had ever met even as young as she is. In fact, among the women Will had seen in his life, the four most beautiful were all related to Damien in some fashion. His mother, Muriel, Mary, their head maid, Dolly, his sister, and right in front of him, Vera, his sister's personal assistant. Other girls and women just paled in comparison, to be honest. Wilfred, Philo, Vera acknowledged. Will, the young man corrected as he took in the fishy river scent drift over. The port nearby meant it was a prime location for a market, where Vera was sent to purchase new supplies, whichever, she replied indifferently. Here, carry these. The girl handed them several heavy bags. Either make yourselves useful or kindly stop forcing some poor treat to keep making up for the air you waste. Phil nodded silently. Will, however, blinked. Oh, well, okay, that was just hurtful. He was feeling his self-esteem hit rock bottom and digging. Coming from such a gorgeous little lady, even common insults were devastating. But Vera, she could be creative. Go to sleep and dream about someone who cares. She responded carelessly before wandering off to a stall next to them. Will watched her a moment then turned to Damien. What did you do? She's never been a ray of sunshine but she is at least usually not quite so prickly, which means you did something. Why are you just assuming it was me? So it isn't. No, it is. But why are you assuming it's something I did specifically? He grumbled. Because the only person I've ever seen that can ruffle that girl's feathers like that is you. Sometimes Baz, but he's been with your sister, Will explained. So what didn't you tell me? Many things a mystery to you, yet are, young Padawan. Learn, you will, when ready. Will, long since used to Damien's nonsense, just went with it. So you aren't going to tell me. Then, the other shrugged. If I told you now, you geese might not want to come. I already don't, I think. Too bad. I need some male company. He glanced at the various women shooting him flirtatious looks from all around them. I mean, the attention from women is nice but a good bromance is needed sometimes, too. Will followed his gaze and frowned. Yeah, you might not have been bullshitting about that part. I noticed. But isn't this kind of extreme? I'm part sex demon. William. Damien rolled his eyes. This is very tame compared to a few months ago. I woke up one day and found a strange woman trying to suck my soul through my cock. The fuck you did? Damien grunted. Fine. It was three women. You are such a lying asshole. Okay. But they definitely would have had V not shooed them off. Damien lied. He wasn't so unaware that such a thing wouldn't wake him. Still. The fact they tried. Will thought of something just then. Speaking of. Did V? Damien smacked him. Don't even think about it. V would never try something so bold as that. She is pure of mind and body, unblemished by mortal desire. Vera, being not far away and with excellent senses, picked up on that and felt her ears burn. She recalled that morning she found him asleep and crawled into the bed as he slept. Ha, huh, Will expressed. Maybe she's too young for that sex demon thing to work. No, like I said. You seem pretty defensive of her all of a sudden, eh? Will cut him off. His smile was irritating. I remember you finding her pretty infuriating at one point. Time together has opened my eyes to her charms. Oh? Will's lips curved. The mother hunting demon, charmed by a young lass barely getting into her teens? She's adorable. What else can I say? Phil, who had remained quiet for some time, nearly stumbled as he heard that. Adorable? Vera was certainly very pretty, sure, but adorable was not a word he would use to describe her. More like, volatile, or caustic. Like a flowering vine covered in long, sharp thorns that cut at the barest touch. What part of her was adorable? Oh yeah, very. Damien grinned widely, then turned serious. But don't be getting any ideas. She's mine. I'll kill you. Ah, uh, yeah, no worries. I'm not, nor will I ever be interested. Why? Damien got close enough to breathe down the other's face. You think she ain't good enough for you or something, huh? I just don't have the strength of mind to date someone like her. It's not good for my health. Damien snorted. Your ass couldn't even handle dating someone like honey. So yeah, V is way out of your comfort zone. Will groaned. You just had to bring her up. 
didn't you? Honey was his ex-girlfriend whom he'd cheated some time back. She was a beauty, with long locks of hair the color of her name and smelling just as sweet, not quite so soft, as she did have a temper, but enough that she was a good balance. A woman who could comfort you as much as set you straight with a good talking to when needed, but Will was a youth in his prime and Honey's refusal to partake in any kind of uncouth activities was killer, he couldn't take it. In hindsight, it was the biggest mistake of his life yet, but he still sorta of blamed Damien for his shit advice when Will asked him how to handle it after getting caught red-handed. I can't believe you want to hold that over me when you're the one who told me to lie to her. Will had talked big about coming clean and begging for forgiveness but ended up doing the exact opposite as per Damien's counsel. So? Anyone with a brain could tell I was fucking around with you. Have you no mind of your own? You should have gotten on your knees and begged her to give you another chance. Is that what you would have done? Vera came back all of a sudden, questioning him. Of course not. He replied immediately. After the fact, it's already too late to beg. And to begin with, I won't regret a single thing when it comes to me having an affair. I would have made my choice. Regret is useless. Taking responsibility whatever the consequence is more my style. Will should have had the same resolution. To Damien, the worst a person can do is expect to get off scot-free after a fuck-up. If you make a choice, stick with it and work through the consequences later. Will, he wasn't the same. He obviously regrets cheating on Honey but made no move to show that. He knew that Damien's advice was dumb fuckery at its finest and still chose to try and make it work. Well, in the end both of them were scummy people. Damien was just not ashamed to admit it. Such a thing could go a long way. Will looked like he'd swallowed a sour grape. I hate to say it, like, really hate it. But that does sound almost noble in a fucked up way. Cheating is a sin. Damien rolled his shoulders. Regardless of circumstance, best you can do is try and make everyone involved happy with the outcome, Will set a pair of wide eyes at the man. I didn't know you could be so wise, Day. Vera took that opportunity to speak up. Wisdom and nonsense sometimes sound similar. She turned to Will. You shouldn't listen to him. Look what happened last time. True, Will gave a hollow chuckle. Anyway, you needn't worry. I'll behave. Even if you don't. Do you think I'm so easy as to actually fall for your amateur little tricks? Vera raised a brow. Will cleared his throat. You heard all that? Indeed. Will smiled awkwardly and didn't know what else to say. So? He changed the subject. You done here? Vera nodded. I've restocked properly. We didn't need much anyway. Shall we continue on our way to wreck Javik, young master? Damien shook his head. We have to meet up with someone first. Who? Vera asked. You have those two. Who else is there? What? You really thought I decided to make the trip down here just for these guys? Damien replied with a scoff. Please. I enjoy having some guy friends around, but there's a far more important reason I needed to come. Phil should have an idea, eh? He said before walking off. At that, the two looked at the boy in question. He could only give a shallow little laugh. Honestly. He didn't even know how to explain it. They had made way towards the Claybrook estate, where they were greeted with a peculiar sight. A sizable retinue of armed mercenaries. Perhaps a company of fifty men and women camping out near the edge of the forest. Past them, the road continued onto the gate leading into the estate itself. When they got out of the carriage and walked straight into the encampment, Will had gripped the dagger sheathed at his side in caution. Phil noted the instant hostility in the eyes of the surrounding mercs and swallowed hard. They'd been camped here for some time now. These mercenaries. Usually, they never would have been allowed so near the estate's grounds, but a messenger a day before their arrival had come to Lord Claybrook himself bearing a letter from Damien. Once the mercenaries came later on, Phil knew that this had something to do with the young master. It was the only reason such a large company of Silzords would be tolerated so close to the estate. As they walked, no one barred their path but the intense, silent gazes made Phil's balls shrivel up into his throat in fear. In contrast, Damien and Vera seemed utterly undisturbed. Instead they made idle conversation until they came towards the largest of the erected tents. Outside of it, sitting near a fire, was a man. He had a short salt and pepper stubble along his jaw with a small but solid build. By no means the most outstanding physique among this band of men, 
yet somehow the dull look in eyes and cold, hawkish features was far more imposing than a being just a mass of muscle, you're late, his voice, gruff and stern, greeted them as they neared, it'll cost you extra, Damien wasn't amused and was about to retort when a woman sauntered out of the tent and spoke to his defense, he supplied us with top quality weaponry, armor, horses, and enough gold to pay a king's ransom, she drawled, I think we can forgive a bit of tardiness, brother, the newcomer was younger than the man or seemed so, she stood tall and proud, wearing a purple gambson with steel pauldrons covering the entire shoulder and collarbone, a pair of black, padded chaucers accentuated long, sensuous legs, her hair, a luxurious black, was tied into an intricate tail that fell down towards her buttocks, it drew attention to high cheekbones and sharp, bright A's, I'm Marin, she introduced almost jovially, and that stick in the mud over there is my brother, Jason, we lead the black company, the merry band of incorrigible cells ords hired by Lord Damien here to ensure the safety of certain precious cargo, her easy smile and confidence were magnetic, even Vera raised a brow at it, she had an air of quiet grace like a cat, Lanny and Linnea, who had been silently walking a step behind Damien and Vero up till then, saw the heroic looking beauty and threaded their arms through Damien's, the woman, noticing that, chuckled, so you picked up a cute pair of kittens since last we met, eh, my lord, they seem quite territorial, she teased, Damien, however, was all business, bring it to me, the woman didn't take any offense at the curt tone and instead whistled, a few moments later, two men who were standing guard at the tent's entrance went inside and came out with a large, heavy-looking rectangular box, it had handles attached to the sides for ease of transport and but apart from that had no discernible way to open it, more notable, though, was the fact that it a white color and had a similar luster to marble, strangely, beautifully, it shone with a subtle radiance even beneath a cloudy sky like this, Will, Phil, Lanny and Linnea all looked unexpectantly at what was brought out, the men laid it gently next to the woman before returning to their post, Meron walked forward and ran her hand along box almost lovingly, Carpathian sun pearl, she sighed, such a waste, irritated by the remark, Damien slapped her hand off, just open it, having been chided, the woman did as she was told, she spoke a single word that, as it was spoken, silenced the world for a brief second, after that, the walls of the rectangular box glowed with a series of strange runes and popped out, the front wall slid to the left, causing soft rays of warm light to spill out and, moments later, reveal what had been housed within, Will cursed, are you fucking kidding me, he spat out, the far more important reason is a goddamn plant, Damien ignored him, he was too focused on the cute little sapling in front of him, R, there you are, my cute little baby, have you missed papa, papa missed you, yes he did, yes he did he cooed, grabbing the willow sapling by its pot and rubbing his face along its bark, Vera who had long since sensed the sapling's presence, felt insufferable embarrassment at his actions, but she played ignorant, saying, you dragged us all the way here just for that, really, Damien rounded on her, what do you mean, just for that, he sounded almost offended, this is the first gift you've ever given me in my life, of course I'm going to bring it with me, at that, the mercenary woman chimed in, a single square foot of sun pearl can fund an army a thousand strong for a year, and you use it to transport a plant, she muttered, isn't that all, it's good for anyway, Damien huffed, it's a material that provides warmth and vitality to anyone who holds it, it literally exudes life-saving properties and can heal fatal wounds within a day of contact before running out of energy, usually, only royals can get their hands on even a chunk of the stuff, Meron's mouth twitched as she spoke, seemingly unable to comprehend the logic of a person willing to waste such precious material on some random plant, it wasn't even a rare and valuable plant, either, but a regular willow sapling, what's more, from that exchange just now it seemed like a mere housewarming gift, yeah, well, that's why I'm poor now, Damien's personal wealth had been unimaginable for regular nobles, unlike others, he rarely bought things and quietly amassed a fortune via several lucrative businesses co-owned by him and his father, 
not to mention the numerous gifts he received from young ladies trying to earn his favor and the many, many winnings he had earned through gambling. To the extent that he was barred from every gambling den in the kingdom due to his inability to lose a game, but his assets had been frozen by his mother, so he was now a pauper. Well, for now, money was easily gained, so he didn't worry about it much. He had spent what he needed to at the start of their journey, thinking ahead. Like Merrin and Jason, for example, he'd had them commissioned within days of leaving Bormister. To be honest, to him even the thousands of gold coins he spent on the mercenaries and hundreds of thousands he'd spent on the carrier for Vera's gift had been nothing much, not that it didn't drain his bank, but that he didn't care about money much when it came to things like this, how could he risk his gift dying? He had to provide it and its transporters with the best of everything to ensure its safety. V would probably never give him anything ever again. He had to take good care of this cute little sapling and help it grow in the most majestic tree it could be. Thinking so, he kissed one of the leaves tenderly. Brave girl, you must have been so lonely. Don't worry, Papa will plant you into the richest, most luxurious soil so you can grow healthy and strong. Panicking. Vera smacked him, don't kiss it, it's mine, you gave it to me, I'll sleep with it if I want to, he stated. Vera was mortified. Pervert, she hissed, pivoting on her heel and walking back to the carriage before he noticed her reddened ears. Meanwhile, the mother-daughter pair gave each other a look. Who knew a day would come when they would feel jealous of a plant? Damien placed the sapling back in position where it was resealed inside the sun pearl box for safekeeping. All right. Good job, he nodded in satisfaction as he looked between Marin and her brother. Tell your men to pack up and get ready to escort us. At this command, Jason, who had been staring into the fire and biting into a strip of dried beef, spoke. No, he replied simply. Damien paused. No, he asked, confused. The fuck you mean? No, we defended your cargo against eight bandit attacks while on our way here. A box that size made of sun pearl is big news. It leaked quickly. Good men died protecting that fucking plant of yours. He settled a blank, steely gaze upon Damien. We are done. Their eyes clashed for a moment or two. Damien nodded. I understand. He replied solemnly. Jason grunted, not bothering to pay him attention any longer. But Damien wasn't done with him. In that case. Strip. Everyone stood still. Silence seemed to reign, the only sound being the crack of firewood. William and Phil, intimately familiar with Damien, had a bad premonition. Will stepped up and grabbed Damien's shoulder. They, don't. Let's just go. No, let the boy talk. Justin stood, walking up to Damien. He was tall, the two standing nearly equal in height. What was it you said, my lord? The words were low, dangerous. I said. Damien began calmly, strip. He raised his voice. All of you. His words took on a harsh tone. Take off my fucking armor and weapons. Then you can leave. Merrin felt the air change. The band of mercenaries did not take kindly to the obvious disrespect. Watch your tone. Boy, Jason ground out, barely holding himself back. Our contract is over. Hearing this, Vera felt a headache. She grabbed a worried Lanny and Linnea and whispered for them to stay close if things escalated. Meanwhile, Will once again gripped his dagger and eyed the surrounding mercenaries. They, too, had reached for their swords. I hired you to deliver my cargo to wreck Javik, Damien replied. However many times you're attacked by bandits along the way, however many men you lose, is inconsequential. If you want to end the contract prematurely due to all the trouble, I understand. I'll allow it without complaint, but you'll be leaving naked. Of course. This includes the horses, which I also paid for. Justin smiled. Slowly, he drew steel and let it hand in his hand menacingly. You play a dangerous game here, Claybrook. I might not be willing to kill you, but I doubt your family will raise too much of a fuss with a company like ours if you lose a finger or two. Damien just laughed. Try it. I'll separate your head from your torso and fuck your sister over your corpse. Merrin, at that point, had enough. All right. This is ridiculous. Put your cocks away. She grabbed her brother by his collar and dragged him back. You, behave. Her tone broke no argument. He's right. 
we haven't completed our contract and I'm not willing to make an enemy of the Clay Brooks just because we lost a few men, we're mercenaries, we all know the risks, more importantly, if we let it get out that we reneged on a contract just for that no one will hire us again. The siblings locked eyes for several long seconds. Jason ended up sheathing his blade and returned to his seat wordlessly. That said, she went on, the men we lost were skilled warriors not easily replaced. I trust the young lord will compensate us appropriately for their deaths. Damien backed down and shrugged. You can break off a piece of sun pearl. I'm sure it'll more than make up for your loss. Marin smiled. All is settled then. She raised her voice. Clean up men. Be ready to depart within the hour. We leave for wreck Javik. I do hear it's lovely this time of year. 1. 